Good morning, I'm Dan DeRose and welcome to day four of deadly delivery. The Summit County murder trial taking place. Uh, there is the defendant. That is Erica Stefanko. She is being charged with her role in the murder of Ashley Biggs back in 2012. Ashley Biggs was a pizza delivery uh, woman who uh, was going through a nasty custody dispute with Chad Cobb over a little girl named Grace. Uh, it is alleged that Erica placed a phone call to have Ashley deliver a pizza to the back of a closed dark business. And that's where Erica Stefanko, according to Chad Cobb, who took the stand, Erica dropped him off in that parking lot so that he would be there when Ashley arrived. That's when a fight broke out. Uh, Chad Cobb on the stand testified uh, that it was a brutal and vicious fight, uh, but he claims he did not kill Ashley Biggs. He said that was Erica Stefanko who placed the zip tie around Ashley Biggs' neck and that that's how she died. Chad does admit he loaded up the body into Ashley's own car, the car she came to deliver the pizza in, drove it out to Wayne County, dumped the car in a cornfield in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and Ashley, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Erica followed him out there uh, to then give him a ride back to their home. Keep in mind, their four children were in the car that Erica was driving the entire time uh, back and forth from the crime scene to home. Uh, Chad then uh, took off his clothes when he got to uh, their home. Uh, here are pictures of the evidence at their house when BCI arrived the next day. Uh, you're going to see that table in the background there by the chicken coop. Uh, that's where Chad took off the backpack. You can see the zip ties. There is a knife, a stun gun, his muddy boots from being in that field. And those long gray pieces that you see by number eight right there, those long pieces, those are the zip ties that uh, they have shown the pictures of Ashley Biggs dead in the back of her car. And they do seem to match the zip ties that were brought out uh, yesterday in court as evidence. It was a tough moment. We know that uh, Ashley Biggs's mother is in the courtroom uh, and this is the stun gun uh, that was found amongst Chad's backpack that uh, he claimed uh, when they got to their home, he stripped it all off because he had to go take a shower. There was so much blood. It was from there that they left the house and went back to uh, the crime scene uh, to be able to uh, clean up the crime scene of the blood. Uh, this was approximately four hours after the crime. Of course, when they got there, police were already there. And uh, that's when they went and hid at Chad's grandmother's house. She lived just a few blocks away from the crime scene. That's where uh, Erica and Chad Cobb were arrested. They were found hiding in that uh, Chad was hiding in the woods near where the SUV was running. Uh, Erica was still in the car. The four children were still in the car. Uh, where we expect testimony to pick up today is Cindy Cobb. That is the mother of Chad. And she testified yesterday that as Chad was sitting in jail on these charges, that Erica had made a comment to her. Uh, saying that she was the one who made that phone call to the pizza place. And uh, Cindy Cobb was asked, why didn't you tell that to authorities? And she said, because I'm Chad's mom. She had to elaborate and she said that she didn't think anyone be would believe her that Erica said that. And so she didn't tell authorities uh, because she thought uh, that everyone would look at her as biased and that she's trying to get uh, her son out of prison. Cindy will be back on the stand today, and we know that it was because of that phone call and thinking that no one would believe her that she needed to start recording phone calls between her and Erica. Uh, keep in mind that uh, Erica, in the background of all of this, was having an affair with Chad's best friend, Mike Stefanko. That's why Erica's name right now is not Erica Cobb, it's Erica Stefanko. In fact, 
uh, at Chad's sentencing, she was pregnant with Mike Stefanko's baby. The first time Chad Cobb finds out about this is when Erica goes to visit him in prison for the first time after he's sentenced and he finds out she's pregnant. Of course, then a divorce ensued, uh, but that is Chad's contention is that he was set up for all of this, that uh, there may have been something in the background going on uh, more than just an affair that led him into that parking lot that night. Now he is still waiting to have his plea overturned. He pleaded guilty very early on in this process that took the death penalty off the case uh, by pleading guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole. He's still trying to get that plea overturned as we get our first all rise. The jury being led into the courtroom. Let's take you live now into Summit County Court for day four of deadly delivery. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Wonderful, thank you. Go ahead and take a seat. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we'll go back on the record for State of Ohio versus Erica Stefanko. It's 848. Today is Thursday, January 25th, 2024. Is the state ready to bring their witness back? Yes. And it's my understanding she still does not want to be recorded or videotaped or photographed? Correct. Okay, perfect. I've got the cameras for the witness box off. And do you have the, are you going to be using the recording? Is that ready to go? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Dan DeRose with 19 News here, just waiting a quick second as we get Cindy Cobb back on the stand. This is Chad's mother. Now keep in mind, this has been pretty contentious all the way through. There is what uh, the prosecution has called Team Cobb. Uh, the family members that are working on Chad's behalf to try and get his uh, trial or get his plea thrown out and get him a trial. Uh, and again, Cindy recorded these phone calls but did not turn them over. Keep in mind, Chad was sentenced in 2013. It wasn't until 2019 that Erica was finally charged. This is a retrial, which means Erica was found guilty by a jury. She was sentenced to life in prison, but it was overturned because Chad testified via video from prison during COVID, and the appellate judge said that was a no-no. A recorded converse, uh, conversation with the defendant, Erica Stefanko? Yes, I did. Who initiated that conversation or how did it come about? Um, Erica wanted to meet with me. Um, she was upset, I think, about um, divorce things and that. But whenever she would get upset, she would want to meet and talk things out because we couldn't see uh, the kids until we did so. Okay. Where did that uh, conversation take place? It took place on our property at our barn. Okay. Approximately when did that conversation take place? Uh, March of 2014, I think. Who all was present for that conversation? Just Erica and myself. Did you tell her or did you let her know it was being recorded? No, ma'am. What went into your decision to record the conversation? I'm sorry? What? Why did you record the conversation? Just tired of always having the children held over our head and being withheld from us. And you said the conversation took place at your house? Yes, ma'am. Where specifically? Up uh, our barn. Was there anything going on with your barn at that point in time? There was a lot going on with our barn. Um, we had just come back from vacation and it had flooded. So everything was kind of picked up off the floor and we was in the process of getting it dried out. Okay. Can you describe the conversation? What was the tone of it? 
I guess I don't know exactly know what you're asking. Was it um, interview type setting? Was it just casual conversation? No, just casual conversation. Okay. And when Erica got there, did you all have anything to drink? Yes, I asked her if she wanted something to drink, if she wanted pop, and I believe she said she would like something a little stronger. Okay. And a little stronger, what did that entail? Um, vodka. Okay. Did you offer the vodka or did she ask for the vodka? I believe she stated vodka. When she came over, what was her demeanor? How was, what was her appearance and demeanor? I mean, just, I mean, she was fine. She was friendly. And during the conversation, the questions asked and answered, it was a normal conversation? Yes. Okay. Did you have anything to drink during that conversation? Yes, I had a drink also. Approximately how many drinks did you and Erica have? One each. And when was that drink during the conversation? Probably towards the beginning, I believe. Okay. And I'm going to play one second to find my paper. Do you need to grab Tristan? Nope. Well, ho no, I, I hope not, Your Honor. Okay, just let me know. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to play portions of that tape for you, and I may have questions just a few after I play it, okay? Um, the main thing is after I play it, I want you to tell me the portions that I play, if they're accurate and fair and, and recordings of what ha occurred that day, okay? Okay. Your Honor, the state is going to play portions of Exhibit 4. Is that correct? State stipulated Exhibit 4, if I'm not mistaken. The yeah. first. Your Honor, may we approach just on that stipulation briefly? Okay. There needs to be a sidebar already uh, about the stipulation. Let's explain what a stipulation is. It's generally when both sides agree on something. Uh, for example, the other day, an officer was going to testify. Uh, I believe he was actually a sheriff's deputy. And uh, as is normally the case, they ask that uh, individual to go through their training, their education, uh, and their licensing. And if both sides agree, he's an officer, he's been through the police academy, uh, you can get uh, one side or the other and say, Judge, we stipulate uh, to his, his uh, education, his training, uh, his certifications, uh, so that you don't have to go through all of that. Now, in, the, in question here, and we heard yesterday from the judge, uh, this is a three-hour conversation. And um, the judge told the jury yesterday that both sides stipulated that they don't have to play the whole three hours, that each, both the defense and the state, uh, will be able to pick and choose the parts that they want to play. Now, the jury will be afforded the opportunity uh, to listen or watch. We're not exactly sure what form, if this is video, if this is just audio, uh, and they've yet to ask how she recorded it. I'm assuming it's on a phone, we'll see. Uh, but um, the jury will have the chance to if they want to go through all three hours of this conversation. Interesting that they had to talk about the fact that, uh, you know, uh, you offer, she offered her a drink, uh, offered her a pop, but she said she wanted something stronger. Uh, so vodka, alcohol comes into play here. Uh, but according to Cindy Cobb, they each had just one drink over a three hour period. Uh, if you're the jury, you have to ask yourself, is one drink uh, going to inhibit or um, make someone say things that weren't true or that they didn't mean. Uh, I guess it depends on how strong that drink is, uh, but uh, that gives at least uh, the idea that, and the, and the state has to do that. If, if the state didn't ask that question and the defense knew that there was alcohol involved here, uh, the state has introduced it, they've talked about it, it was one drink, uh, because if the defense got up there and said, wasn't it true that you were drinking uh, at this entire time? That looks bad on the state. Looks like we are back on the record. Yesterday, the entirety of the recording is going to go back with you. 
but you're just going to hear portions today, okay? Go ahead, Attorney Easter. All right. Ms. Cobb, had you ha have you had a chance to listen uh, to this recording since it was made? Yes, uh, one time before I turned it over. Okay. And during this conversation, um, did it fairly and accurately represent the conversation you had on that day? Yes. Okay. And after you made it, what was the recording made on? A uh, little digital recorder. Okay. And after you made the recording, what did you do with the little digital recorder? I put it in our gun safe. Your what safe? Our gun safe. Okay. And that was made in 2014? Um, yes, ma'am. And how long did it stay in that gun safe? Till 2018 when we upgraded and switched safes, I came across the tape. Okay. And that... When you came across the tape, what did you do with it at that point? Um, I listened to it, heard what was on it, and um, got a hold of Detective Pitchings. Okay. And at any time, did you alter, change that tape? No. Okay. I'm gonna play an excerpt from that recording it begins at minute, one minute, 15 seconds, and it goes to two minutes and 12 seconds. Is there anything on your part, Your Honor? I can't, there's nothing else that I can do over here. Let me see. Adam, could you send Tristan in, please? That should be on. Tristan. Oh, well, there he is. All right, before I get into the conversation, I wanna talk about this barn. Was this, what type of barn was this? It, at one time, it was our horse, horse barn. Um, when I got out of showing horses, we remodeled it. So Thank it's you, a Justin. finished barn. Um, there's our motorcycles in there, TVs. We do have a bar type set up in there, back porch. Okay. So it, it's for having gatherings or whatever you want, not animals. That's what I was getting. Correct. Oh, okay. Okay, now, same clip for the record, one, 15, one minute, 15 seconds to two minute, 12 seconds.
And that portion of the recording, does that accurately reflect the conversation you had with the defendant in March of 2014? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And for the sake of going forward, the voice that we heard um, saying, I have pop or something, is that your voice? Yes, ma'am. And the voice we heard, I would like something stronger, was that the defendant's voice? Yes, ma'am. Okay. There was no talking at the beginning of that recording. Was that the, be was that the beginning of the recording? Yes, it, okay. it was um, because I had hit record and was out of the barn okay. and came back in. The next segment is at four minutes, 50 seconds to six minutes, six seconds. So anyway, so he called me and the conversation starts off really normally and we're talking about Kai. of the recording accurately reflect the conversation you had in March 14, March of 2014? Yes, ma'am. Okay. One of the last lines in that conversation, uh, the defendant stated, uh, is that, and I have to give him all his tools immediately or he's going to, how do I phrase it? How did he phrase it? Tell them more about my involvement with Ashley. What was your impression or understanding of what the defendant was saying at that point in time in the conversation? Objection, leading. You want to rephrase? She, she left the transcript to the judge, so she's leading. Mm. It was just a method instead of replaying the tape, Your Honor, to make things go quicker and smoother. Overall, I'll hear the answer. Oh. Go ahead. Okay, what was the question? Of the question was... At the end of that recording, the defendant stated, and I have to give him all his tools immediately, or he's going to, how did he phrase it, tell them more about my involvement with Ashley. Okay, that was the first part. My question was, what was your understanding, based on the conversation you two were having, what the defendant was saying, or what did she mean by that? That she was worried if she didn't comply with what Chad asked. Um, he would give over information about her involvement with Ashley. Okay. The next segment I'm going to play is 8 minutes, 13 seconds to 10 minutes and 5 seconds. Like that's all he has 
basis of, I've already told him the majority of why it is, but ultimately I want to be able to bring the kids up. I went over that with him. What I didn't explain to him is clearly, and especially from our conversation, clearly what he's doing is he is, I mean, I think you know there are certain things about me that are not very desirable, and there are other things, you know, that's just what it is. Yeah. Um, but he's turning it into that that's all of it. Uh, I don't, that makes me very uncomfortable. Um, like that I'm, I'm just, I'm just a complete another piece of shit. He's looking at the situation with Grace, and it's like, okay, you know, I, I'll give you that. Grace should not have taken the, the, you know, my pet outrage toward him. That's not fair. Um, but then he's not, it's like, well, okay, I did that. Which I don't think that I don't get is why is that why is it okay for him to do it, but then I'm a horrible person because I did. Miss Cobb, is that a fair and accurate reflection of the conversation you had on March 2014? Yes. Okay. During that conversation, um, the defendant talked about Grace should not have taken the brunt. Um, and when she did it, it was okay, but when he did it, it wasn't. What was your understanding she was talking about when she referenced Grace? Um, I would imagine disciplining of the children. Um, she didn't exaggerate at that point. Okay. <clears throat> The next section that's going to be played is 12 minutes, 9 seconds to 18 minutes, 35 seconds. He 
came up with how to do it. He executed almost all of it. The part that he executed went totally awry. I mean, he, he would talk about, I tried, I couldn't really, there's no way for me to say it over the phone, and I didn't want to make it, make a problem for him or make him angry um, for his appeal. But he was so, like, he would get this look on his face and be like, I, yeah, I'm going to, if I if this goes through and I can do this, I'm going to keep her skull as a trophy. And, like, he can say stuff like that, but then I'm all responsible and it's all my, I mean, it's just, it's not, it's not inclusive and it's not fair. I know that he, and he, he may have asked me, because he's all the time, he's like, oh yeah, well, you, I, I told you I wanted to go home. And I'm like, when did you ever say that? Because I remember the conversation that we had under the tree, and he's like, under the tree, because we really were literally under a tree having a conversation. Well, why he refers to it that way, like the time at the tree, that's what, that's what he's always talking about. And he's like, you know, if I do this, there's no turning back, blah, 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 blah. And went forward from that. I could see him having said prior to that, I don't want to be here right now. I don't even want to do this. And going forward from there. So in that instance, if he had just said, if he put it that way, I could have seen that he really said that. But he looks at it as though, if, as if he said to me, I don't want to be here. I don't want to do this. As if he was asking me, please, can I just go home? And that's not what happened. Not that it, not that it matters from your perspective because you weren't there and, and so on. But but it really, that's one of the reasons I want to be able to sit down in front of him and be like, I know you don't want, I just like, I know you don't want to see me right now. And I understand that. But you're not going to turn me into something that I'm not. You're gonna, not going to turn the situation into something that's not. And and then make your decisions based on that. That's that's my issue. That's why I'm not, that's why I'm being so impatient about it. For him to be like, well, you know, he said, he's like, I don't even understand you. You're, you're, like, you've spiraled so much since this happened. And it's like, that portion of the recording accurately reflect the conversation you and the defendant had in March 2014? Yes. Okay. There are um, two sections in that I have a question about. Um, you had stated, I am, I mean, I don't think it took two of you I do think it took two of you to get where you, where he is today. Yeah. What did you mean by that? Um, him being in jail. That it took both him and, and Erica to get in this situation. Okay. And what did you mean by that? How? Just the consequences that, that Ashley paid. Okay. You were referring to what happened to Ashley? Yes. There is another section where the defendant says, if everything had been told exactly as it happened, then we'd both be in prison right now. I don't disagree with that. That's tro totally true. Um, based on the conversation you had with her, what was your understanding of what the defendant was saying at that point in time? That if everything was known, that she would also be in prison. Okay. <clears throat> 
The next segment the state is playing is at 39 minutes, 22 seconds to 41 minutes and 10 seconds. Does that segment accurately and fairly represent the conversation you had on in March of 2014? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The next segment is at 46 minutes and 22 seconds to 46 minutes and 28 seconds. Does that fairly and accurately represent what was stated that day? Yes. Okay. Um, in that section or that conversation, the defendant stated, we all know why he pled and the circumstances and so forth, but he can't use those. Uh, what was your understanding of the conversation, uh, what the defendant was talking about at that time? Objection. Basis? I'm trying to get in the state of mind of the defendant. No. Okay, sustained. Let's move to the next one. The next one, Your Honor, is... 48 minutes, 56 seconds to 49 minutes and 24 seconds. <clears throat> Right. But if he didn't know 
trying to do with that. But what he really did was he totally flipped my switch. I, my first thought was, you know, well, obviously now I'm going to prison, so fuck everybody. And you guys are not seeing the kids, and he's not seeing the kids. I'm just going to spend as much, much time with him as I can until it happens. <clears throat> so I calmed down just a little bit, and I was like, okay, let's have a conversation. Does that portion fairly and accurately represent the conversation you had in March of 2014? Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is from one minute, five seconds, 38, one minute, one hour, five minutes, 38 seconds, one hour, nine minutes, in 50 seconds, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, like example, we went on vacation. And now he's frantic because he can't get a hold of us. Did we make it back? Did we make it back? Well, I mean, I know we're kind of his lifeline here. And now, but he's like, you know, did, did you guys change your mind? Do you guys think I'm a piece of shit and Mike's the better person? And I mean, this is exactly his wording on some of this. You know, do you feel like everybody else and now you don't want anything to do with me? And I, I never said that I don't want to have anything to do with them. I and mean, maybe I can try to write some of this stuff down and tell him so that you're not trying to repeat it to but him. But he's just constantly... No, I, I know that and I, I do get that. But for him to come and to me then and say, this is what's going to happen or I'm going to have you go to prison. And it's like, well, that's not going to go well, because if you're going to tell the whole truth, I'm going to help tell the whole truth, and that's going to be a big problem. Um, if I could go back in time and change things, I would change a lot of things, but that's not a possibility. So we are where we are now, and I, I want him to be able to come out and have a life. If there's any way that I can facilitate that, I want that to happen. I, if there is any justice in this game, <clears throat> He will be out to raise Kai. And I, and I, I want him to be able to do that. Uh, I want him to be able to do it more than you do. I raised him. It's only fair. <laughs> it is only fair. And that's exactly what I tell him. I'm like, or by the time the other one's in her teenage years and dating. Uh-huh. Like, that's you. <laughs> but, I mean, I, mean I, I sincerely want that for him. I don't think he belongs where he is. No. If, if, I could, if I could change it and go back and, and change what I said to him, then I would. But I don't think it's fair for him to put it all on me. No. And that I really mean, upsets me, but, not just in practical sense, but in just in terms of how he's thinking about me. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not a piece of shit. I'm not, you know, this disloyal, whatever it is that he's looking at. I know that I did what I did, but it's not because I'm just like complete trash. And I mean, I know he whacks and wanes, I mean, with us when even... You know, he, he talks about you and stuff. And I mean, I just know he's he's all over the all over the place with stuff. Well, he can't. I mean, if I, I really need to know, like, what is? I, is I, it, need, I, I, don't, I don't know that he knows what his. I need him to are. not call me and make those types of statements. <laughs> Was that a fair and accurate recording of the conversation you had? Yes, ma'am. This is at one hour, 20 minutes, 21 seconds, to one hour, 20 minutes, 37 seconds.
Was that a fair and accurate reporting of the conversation you had? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, what was your understanding um, of that portion of the conversation Just about the ultimatums? Objection. Sustained. You're having a conversation with the defendant. What do you, Cindy Cobb, think you're talking about at that time during that portion of the conversation? Objection. Basis. The same reason, Judge. Well, she's inquiring into her thoughts. Speculating into the defendant's. Nope. I just want to know what she thinks. It's two people in a conversation, Your Honor. I want to know what she thinks the conversation is about. Yeah, overruled. I'll hear the answer. Um, it's about Chad having evidently ultimatums in Erica's part <clears throat> in it, and she's not wanting that held over her head, but I mean, she's also stating that she had a part in Ashley's death. The next portion, Your Honor, or ladies and gentlemen, is one hour, 43 minutes, 36 seconds, to one hour, 45 minutes, and 24 seconds. recording of the conversation you had yes ma'am thank you the next portion is one minute 43 one hour 43 seconds 36 minutes to one hour 45 minutes 24 seconds your honor isn't that what we just heard? Number nine. Oh. Okay. One hour, 50 minutes, seven seconds. One hour, 54 minutes, 43 seconds. Okay. Thank you. My, my intention is not to make things harder for him. I'm trying to work with him. The worst thing he could do is try to put something like that over my head because it's already over my head already. And do I feel bad about what happened to her? Not really. Do I have? Do I feel bad about what happened to everybody else? Absolutely. Could would I take it back if I could? Yes, I would. Well, I yeah, so would he. Well, I mean, I don't think there's any question about that. But, you know, because he asked me that. It's like you don't even feel bad about what happened to her, and like I'm not gonna lie, I don't. Like I, I don't. Especially having. I just, I just, I think. And we keep telling him, you need to write a book, you need to write a book. And I mean, I know multiple attorneys, 
counselors, whatever, through the course of years. And mom, this wasn't the way it was supposed to be. This wasn't right. This was wrong. This is way off base. But it still didn't change anything. I still went through the way it went through. If you really want to point blame, it was the court system. Why a court would give temporary or whatever other kind of custody to a stranger. Yeah. I can't even, when I had to go through that stuff to look to look for the things that you needed, it got me so upset. I don't know why. I still have it because if he ever needs it, I want him to have it. But, um, wait a minute. Well, I don't, what, whatever you needed, whatever you needed for the workers' comp, I had to go through all of our great stuff. Oh, okay. And just even just glancing at it was so upsetting to me to remind me all the crap that we went through and all the bullshit and just like hitting up against a wall and like, why is this happening? This is not the way it's supposed to go. Um, she never should have yanked her. Why did that hearing get continued for three months? And it was just like, what are we supposed to do? The court system is not going to work with us. Ashley is going to get custody of this child, especially after the guardian ad litem came in and was like, oh, I don't know who's telling the truth. I think that was one of the real tipping points for him. I was already there. I was there from the beginning. I, I knew what the situation was. I was like, given that this has happened, this is, this is, these are the courses of actions that, that can't happen. And granted, one of them I should have left out, but he was at the point where he was getting ready to be like, I can't help her. I'm just, I'm, I'll terminate my rights. Yeah. Yeah. And whatever, whatever he thinks about, you know, me and what my relationship with Grace, you know, that could, I couldn't, I couldn't any more than he could say that that was okay. Not because he thinks I had this big thing with Ashley, like it's a big battle between who, who, you know, and granted we hated each other and there was definitely a rivalry, but it, it was, it was just knowing what she would become if they had her and what her life would be like. I can't stand there and be okay with it and say, this is my daughter. Um, my boss, her husband has well, one biological child who the mother has raised because he was in the Navy. And the mother is a piece of crap. She's just an absolute piece. She actually is very much like what Ashley would have been at that age. And now the daughter has picked up, at 15 years old, has picked up on all those habits in this the exact same way. And he, they tried to get custody of her over this past summer, which was a lot of fun for me at work while she was doing nothing but trying to work on that. And um, then she turned around and just totally backstabbed them because she didn't like the fact that there were rules. Had her mom come out after they had spent all this money and so forth, and it's like she's just like her mom. There's nothing you can do for her at this point, and that would have been Grace. Now Grace has a chance at life. She had a chance at being a person with a life. And with Ashley, she would have. I don't see a chance for her to have been anything like but what Ashley was, because she was already picking up all the shit. Yeah. So I couldn't sit there and be like, oh, that's okay, especially since. I was the one like, we cannot continue to go through this because we had finally gotten, the thing that really makes it hard for me about Chad and I is we, granted, I didn't like the way that the situation was. It was still hard for me, but at least we got to a point where we could coexist. We had gotten to that point. And then when Ashley came and took Grace, it all fell apart. Like, Was that a fair and accurate representation of the conversation you had in March of 2014? Yes. Thank you. The next segment, Your Honor, is at one minute, 59 seconds. I'm sorry, one hour, 59 seconds, 59 minutes and 32 seconds. So one hour, 59 minutes and 44 seconds. Thank you. Presentation of the recording? Yes. Were you able to hear it? Yeah, I, I couldn't really understand what they were saying. I think something about Brittany, but I can in the news. On. Somehow I just can't feel bad for her. And then, you know, 
breaking all the news. We were so scared this would happen. I bet you fucking were. This is at two hours, seven minutes, 46 seconds, to two hours, 14 minutes, 29 seconds. Thank you. Like, that, that was what I was trying to say to him. Like, I would never have, you know, made a choice between the two of them and chose Mike. Right. And yeah, because, and I mean, and, and uh, yeah, we do. Because, I mean, it, it took both of you to, to get where you guys are today and where he is. And it's not unreasonable to be like, well, okay, you get, you get to go scot-free. Why does he have to not bear this burden? Right. I don't, it's not that I don't understand that. It's that it was not a place. It was not knowing that that had to be your perspective was not a place I wanted to be. And I mean, I, if you were knowing how we're doing this, I, I don't think you would have. No, if I, and it's it's very it's very true. And and from the like, if he had said the thing that he and I really like butt heads against is bullshit that we did that we shouldn't have or we could have gotten in trouble I, there was always something that I would say to him which I said to him repeatedly whether he remembers or not with the Ashley situation you know what you can do and what you can if this is something that you think you can do then I'm okay with it and I agree with it if you can't do it then obviously you shouldn't do it and I always threw the ball back in his court I don't think those are the exact words that I used that night because we already have been over that so many times. Like, I, you know, we would we would fight about it. Like, I'm like, this this is the only way the situation is going to go away. And I feel like he really felt, I didn't know that at the time, but he really felt pressured by me to do something about it. Because I felt like he was the only person that could potentially do something about it. And he didn't tell me, I can't do it. If he had said, I can't do it, then it never would have proceeded. If he had said, I can't do this, this is something that I can't do, there's no way in hell I would have been like, go forward with it. I, I foolishly threw the ball in his court, let him make the determination as to whether he was capable to do something that we should, I should have had the good sense to know you just don't ever try to do. So that's when I'm like, I will admit to my fault in that. It's like, yeah, I should, I should have at that point said, this is, this is too risky. That, that point, whatever percent is too much. Because I just see him get away with so much crazy shit that I thought he could get away with anything. I mean, he's, he's got some crazy stories. The way he got that van right down from the police station and just got it out of the, like, that's hilarious. Like, I wish I had a video of that. So that kind of tainted my idea. Of, and then I thought he would always know what he could and could not do. It's like, you always got And I, I don't know if because of showing horses or what, but it's like, I always learned there's always someone better or knows more or however you want to well and it wasn't that it was that I mean if, he's in, in, there, there's, if he had gone if what had what was supposed to happen that night had happened then it was he had a perfect plan but it didn't go the way it was supposed to go at all and why that is I don't know because he's told it to me two different ways it doesn't matter now yeah But yeah, again, that's why, I mean, I was, you know, you can't, like, really function in everyday life if you're looking over your shoulder every second. Every time I hear a siren, I think they're coming for me. And that's, that's something that I'm going to live with, but I don't need him to contribute to it. And if his goal is really to do that, then I need to know it. If his goal is really to do what he needs to do for himself without sacrificing everyone else, because whether he, how, regardless of how he feels about me, and I'm not trying to say this in a manipulative kind of, manipulative kind of a way, it's just the fact of the matter. Kids and I are part and parcel. And, I mean, unless you guys think you have some way that you can take care of them, for him to see the kids, I have to still not be in prison. Um, that was part of the reason because before, when he took that plea, granted, I didn't know I was pregnant when he took that plea. But I, at that point, I wasn't even planning on keeping her. I was, I didn't, I totally 
do not agree with abortion. Um, not for the same reasons as him, because I've been through so many miscarriages. It's like, that's not a person. I don't care what you say, it's not a person, but I, it could become a person. I don't agree with cutting that off and making that choice to have that not be a person. And um, we, at that point, we made that choice, me still thinking that he would be the person that I would be with, because it was what was best for the kids. I know that's why he sat there. My understanding is he sat there on that and wrote a legal pad. Will this help my kids? Yes. And that was his whole basis for taking that plea. That is my understanding. The saying, "Will this?" I thought, "Will this get my kids home soon?" Or something. But will this get my kids back or whatever? Yeah. That's my understanding. I mean, if that really is still the mindset. I know he needs to get. He's away. He's like, I need to get myself right without all of your nonsense. Well, okay. You know, if that's the way you need to put it, but don't, then, you know, don't, I don't want him to make an enemy out of me. We're on the same side. And if he, if he does decide that that's something that he's willing to sacrifice to me and therefore the kids, um, again, I'm not trying to say that in a manipulative kind of a way, because I know it comes off sounding like that, but that's what it is. If the kids could grow up with other people, and then it would have been a totally scenario, different scenario. If other there were, if there were other people that we knew we could come back to them with, I might have made a different choice in terms of when I was asked, "What do you want to do?" Okay, well, let's, you know, this is gonna suck. Um, yeah, <laughs> let's let's do this, and then we'll get back to where we were because we fucked up. I, I fucked up by not recognizing that what I should have and not having, because I could have had control. Very few times, and you know, Mike was like, well, Chad does what he wants to do. I'm like, no, Chad would have listened to me. Chad would have done what I had asked him to do. Chad was doing what I had asked him to do. Was that a fair and accurate recording on yes. March? In March of 14? Yes, ma'am. Okay. During that conversation, you talked about that night the defendant talked about that night. What were you referring to in that conversation that night? It would have been the night that Ashley died. Okay. <clears throat> the next portion is two hours, seven, oh, that's the one we just did, two hours, seven minutes to two hours, 14 minutes and 29 <coughs> seconds. Is that correct? Yes. That's what I thought. Two hours and 19 minutes, 58 seconds, to two hours, 22 minutes, and 28 seconds. I would like it if Ben and Mary would give me a call. I would feel a lot more comfortable. It sounds like they didn't really have anything to do with that, but I would feel a lot more comfortable if they would at least give me a call and we could have a conversation. Okay. I know, uh, apparently, obviously, Chad was really still pushing for Kai to get baptized. I don't have a problem with that. And I honestly, if really they had nothing to do with that, I don't have any problem making them adopt parents. It is my understanding. But I want to have that conversation with them, okay. you know, person to person. And, um, you know, I've always trusted them. I think that they're good people. I was crazy, crazy I was good. Yeah, they're a little nutsy in the religious department. They go a little farther than I ever would. Yeah. Um, but, you know, not in a totally bad kind of a way, just, you know, things like what, you know, the whole birth control thing, and yeah. then, sorry, no, um, because I, I did ask him about that Christmas time or something, I forget, it, it, it's been within the last couple of months, mm -hmm. whenever Chad asked about the, the baptism stuff and that, yeah, no, and I, I, if, if we could have an upfront conversation, then I don't, I don't have any problem with that. I'm not trying to be crazy or vindictive or controlling. I just I want I want to be able to trust that everyone is on the same page. I want to be I want to be able to trust Chad. Like I don't trust Chad right now. Maybe he doesn't have trust for me either. I, we at least need to rebuild that in the regard that's important. Um, but yeah, that was not the right way to go. Because if I if I hadn't been able to catch myself and calm down, I really would have caused a ruckus which would have made things so much worse, so. So that's what I want to talk to you about. <laughs> yeah, so I know I got the text when it's like. Yeah, that was. Then I got hackled up. Well, then Jay gets hackled up because he sees 
Was that a fair and accurate <clears throat> representation of the recording that was made? Yes, ma'am. Okay. During that portion of the recording, there were two names mentioned, a Ben and Mary Brinkman. Yes. Okay. Are those the two individuals uh, that we talked about earlier in your testimony? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next portion that is being played is two hours 26 minutes and three seconds to two hours, 26 minutes and 13 seconds. was talking in that conversation that was Erica's voice okay um, is that fair representation of the conversation that day yes that snippet that you heard <clears throat> and the last one your honor is two hours 26 minutes three seconds to two hours, 26 minutes, and 15 seconds. So it's the same one, just two seconds longer? Oh, I must have wrote something down incorrectly. Give me a minute, Your Honor. Okay, no problem. Do you mind, for sake of timing, I can play it while I... Get yeah, yeah, go ahead. It was the same thing, two seconds more. Okay. Was that a fair and accurate represent representation of the conversation you had in March of 2014? Yes, ma'am.
Dan DeRose with 19 News. Uh, we are in a little bit of a pause here as we've been listening to recorded phone conversations between Cindy Cobb. Cindy Cobb is Chad's mother. Chad serving life in prison for his role uh, in the murder of Ashley. Looks like we might be back on the record here. What's the end time on that location? One hour, nine minutes and 50 seconds. Okay. 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 <clears throat> this is still exhibit four, Your Honor. Thank you. Honor, the state is going to play one hour, five minutes, 38 seconds to one hour, nine minutes, 50 seconds. Okay. That was the previous, uh, believe, oh, yeah, that was played number later. seven, but I think my recording cut some of it off, so I apologize. Okay. Go ahead. <clears throat> If he 
is your part of it, and I carried out my part of it. I did exactly what he told me to do. And it wasn't because he was forcing me to do it, or like he had a gun to my head. It was because he said, this is your part, and this is what you're going to do, which is how it always was when we did something we were supposed to do. Um, you know, and I did everything he told me to do, and I fucking gave it up. Is that a fair and accurate representation of the recording on March 2014? Yes, ma'am. Okay, during that portion of the recording, you stated at one time you told me face to face that you made the phone call and that you set up the meeting. The meeting? Um, I mean, and that you had told me, um, and Ms. Lyons said, the defendant, there's no lie in that. Um, what were you talking about at that point in time? What was your conversation about? What phone call and what meeting? The phone call to order the pizza and have it delivered. And the, you testified earlier that she had told you that. Is that what you was referencing here? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, did the defense have a cross? We do. <clears throat> we need to set up our technology. Okay, why don't we take... Yes, I, mean, I, just, I know he was upset because of... There we go. How do you... 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Yeah, 10 minutes. Maybe take the morning break. Okay, sure. We'll do our morning break. Um, just a reminder to all our jurors not to discuss the case, do any research, and uh, not to talk to each other about it. We will come back in at 10.15 with the cross by the state. Thank you, everyone. All right. Dan DeRose with 19 News. Uh, we're going to stay right here and continue our gavel to gavel coverage uh, as they take their morning recess. This is the first time I'm hearing these recordings. I'm sure for most of you, it's the first time you're hearing these recordings. And my initial reaction is, wow. Uh, let's first of all go over why Cindy has these recordings. Uh, she made a statement yesterday and they touched on it right there at the end. Uh, Cindy made the statement yesterday that uh, in court on the stand that she had a conversation once shortly after the incident with Erica Stefanko. She was Erica Cobb at the time talking about that night and Erica admitted to her that she was the one that placed the call. Uh, place the call, meaning she's the one who called the pizza place uh, to get Ashley Biggs to that location, which eventually led to her death. Uh, we now, uh, and that's why she recorded this conversation. This is in 2014. It's a digital recorder. Uh, Ashley, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Erica came over to the home of Cindy Cobb. This is Chad's mom. Uh, to talk about uh, the kids and I think throughout the phone call, it was, or throughout that uh, co taped conversation, it was fairly easy to get what Erica was trying to do. Uh, Erica had clearly been hearing from Chad in prison, uh, and she made the statement several times about him holding this over her head. Uh, and by that, uh, he meant her role in all of this. Uh, she even made a statement, if the truth ever came out, we'd both be in prison. Um, when I say my initial reaction is, wow, uh, it's, it's maybe even uh, stronger than that. Uh, is this what is ultimately going to hang Erica Stefanko uh, and get her convicted for a second time? Remember, this is a retrial. A jury has already convicted her once, and you have this major piece of uh, evidence. Uh, Cindy makes the recording on a digital recorder. Uh, she claims that she put it in their gun safe in 2014, and she never thought about it until 2018 when they moved the gun safe or got a new gun safe. She saw the record of the digital recorder 
and thought maybe I better give this to detectives and that's what she did and that's what's led us to here. So uh, there were several statements and we're going to work on this over the next hour or two before they take lunch uh, to be able to play this back for you. Uh, there were so many statements that she made in this. Uh, Chad, would do, Chad would do what I asked him to do. Uh, he did what I told him to do. Uh, there are other comments about, and she stops short about, uh, she says, you know what you can do. And this is Erica explaining to Chad's mom what she said to Chad. You know what you can do and what you can't do. We've been over it so many times as far as what are the what are the ways that they can keep they can get grace back from ashley remember ashley had come back in the picture ashley had been in and out of the akron area uh, ever since she had grace keep in mind grace is seven years old at the time of her murder uh, ashley had been in and out she would be away for weeks at a time in akron she'd come back she would want to see um, see grace uh, and then she'd leave again but ultimately chad had custody so then there's this instance in 2012 when ashley comes back and Ashley filed some paperwork with Child and Family Services saying that Chad was a bad dad, didn't have any proof of that, and she was instantly awarded temporary custody. So Ashley Biggs goes to the school uh, where Grace is attending, and she takes her out of school. Chad goes to pick up Grace that day, and she's gone. And so you hear about this plan. Erica keeps talking about what they can do and what they can't do as far as getting Grace back. But ultimately, what their master plan is in this, uh, she, again, that statement is so powerful. Uh, she's telling Chad, you know what you can do and what you can't. We've been over it so many times. This is the only way the problem goes away. She tells Chad that. That shows prior calculation. That shows planning. That shows she knew about it. Um, uh, and at one point she said, yeah, this is too risky. Uh, so that shows that she was cognizant of the role in this. Uh, she said he had the perfect plan in this conversation. Uh, she goes on to say, I fear sirens. Every time I hear sirens, I think they're coming to take me away to prison. And so ultimately, I think what this whole conversation was is I think Erica was getting scared by the things Chad was saying in prison. Chad was saying, uh, was getting very angry and was saying, maybe I'll just tell both sides of this, tell the whole story and we'll both be in prison. So this appears to me to be Erica going to Chad's mom and trying to use Chad's mom saying, boy, if you could just talk to him, uh, if you could just reason with him, uh, that because uh, if, if the truth comes out, we'll both be in prison and neither of us will be raising the children. And she makes these statements and it's awfully incriminating to her case, but it's in my opinion, listening to it, this is clearly a woman who's nervous because of her role and what Chad is now saying from prison. And so she's trying to use Cindy to maybe smooth things over. Go in and talk to Chad, smooth this out. Let him know that I'm willing to work on this. Uh, but uh, the fear uh, from Erica that she repeats several times uh, and that, that cold hearted, do I feel bad for what happened to her? She said, I don't. And Chad even asked me, you don't feel bad for what happened to Ashley? And she said, I don't at all. Uh, wow. Uh, just, uh, you want to talk about some really damning evidence, uh, to have, uh, out there. She's saying, I can't function like that with Chad making these threats to tell police everything. Um, I'm just looking at my nose here. She said, if it really is his intention, oh, this was uh, another portion of the conversation where talking about Chad was gonna go tell the authorities everything. She said, if it really is his intention, I need to know, I need to make plans before I go to prison. I need somebody to be able to take care of my children. That doesn't sound like somebody saying, I didn't have anything to do with this. Uh, you would think that that's what an innocent person would say. An innocent person would be going to Chad's mom saying, I don't know what he's talking about. I didn't play any role in this. Uh, why would he be saying this? Uh, I don't have anything to do with it. I got it. Got it. Um, we're going to continue to be on recess here for 
Uh, I believe they said until 1015. We've got about five minutes, uh, so we'll keep an eye uh, on the courtroom here uh, as uh, we'll wait for this. But uh, it'll once we come back, it'll be time for the defense. Now the defense is going to play their portions of this phone call. I mean, that was pretty damning evidence. They're going to have to find some portion, and I keep saying phone call. I apologize for that. It, we originally thought it was a phone call. It was a digital recording. They need to find some portion of this conversation that contradicts uh, her role in this. And there may be uh, portions of this conversation where she says, just like I said, an innocent person would, I don't know what he's talking about. I didn't have anything to do with this. I, I didn't plan this. I didn't put the zip tie around her neck. Uh, you know, maybe there are portions of this conversation, but of course the state's only going to play what they want the jury to hear. The defense will play what they want them to hear. Uh, and then she says uh, several times in this, I can't have him calling me and giving me these ultimatums. Uh, the other statement, if everything came out, we'd both be in prison. Uh, she said, I think he snapped from their original plan. And, and then she talks, she seems to be very well versed uh, when she got into that section about uh, what's murder, what's manslaughter. Uh, she clearly had looked things up and she said the thing that killed him, and she's like, I'm not trying to be funny, uh, uh, it looked premeditated. He wasn't trying to kill her uh, if he could have just gotten his attorneys to explain. He just used the zip tie to keep her quiet that that way maybe he could have gotten uh, in a manslaughter charge. Uh, just, um, you know, and then there was that, uh, that portion of the conversation where uh, Chad's mom is trying to get her to admit her involvement. Um, and, sh and the mom said, do I think it took the two of you? And Erica interrupts and says, yeah, but don't put it all on me. I mean, she admits it right there. Do I think it took two of you? Uh, that's, that's Chad's mom saying, do I think it took the two of you to murder Ashley or to make this situation happen? She said, do I think the two, it took the two of you? And Eric interrupts her and says, yeah, but don't put it all on me. Uh, I don't know as uh, I'm not a defense attorney and unfortunately I think our defense attorneys are busy today uh, but uh, I don't think you have to be a defense attorney to realize how damaging uh, that statement is. Uh, if somebody says, do I think it took the two of you and you are completely innocent, you would say, two of us, nothing. I had nothing to do with this. Uh, it wasn't me. Uh, I didn't do any of the planning. I wasn't there. Uh, and you never hear that from Erica. Again, this was a three-hour conversation, and we've just heard what the state wants you to hear. And I want to talk about, uh, I want to play a clip as to exactly why Chad's mom started recording this conversation in the first place. It's because of something Erica had said to Chad's mom way before this. And Chad's mom knew that she couldn't go to authorities just on something that was said between the two of them. The police would never believe her. Take a listen to this. This was yesterday late afternoon when uh, they're talking about setting this up, why she decided to start recording uh, uh, her conversations with Erica. Take a listen. What efforts have you made to try to help Chad get out of prison? <clears throat> collecting paperwork. Okay. How are you going about collecting that paperwork? Public records, I mean, you know, whatever I can get from the courts and that, that deal with the case. Okay. Have you hired any attorneys or consulted with any attorneys? I mean, we've consulted with some, um, because it's difficult to get paperwork into um, an inmate, um, but a family member hired him an attorney. Okay. And and you said you would hope he would come home. Are you, is it fair to say you are, are you here saying that Chad did not have any involvement in the death of Ashley Biggs? No, it took two for the situation, I believe. 
Okay, and you're acknowledging that Chad Cobb played a part in that situation? Correct. Okay, and who is the other person that played a part in that situation? Erica. During that time, not that time, but the time Chad um, was in the Summit County Jail, at any given time, did you and the defendant talk about what happened that night? Did she make any statements to you regarding that night? Um, at one point, she did say she made the phone call. Okay, and was that before Chad was sentenced or before he was pled or after? I think it was in February when she first mentioned it. I don't know if it was, I don't remember the exact date. Okay, that and that was February of was. Go ahead. I, I don't remember what date his court date was that he pled. Okay, and that would have been February of 2013? Yes. Okay, so um, you have this information. Um, what did you do with it at that time? I did nothing with it because I'm Chad's mom. There was just she and I there, and it's just Erica saying something to me. What does that mean? I mean, it would be her word against my word. Oh, and you're his mom. Well, yeah, I said I'm Chad's mom, and it coming from me. Did you think anyone would believe you? No. Because you're his mom. You're biased. You're his mom. You're supposed to. Correct. Oh, okay, I get it. Okay. So you had that information in 2013. Um, did you tell any law enforcement or anyone? No. Okay. Do you remember where you were when the statement was made? No, I do not. Okay. Was it just you and Erica at the time? Yes. Okay, so now we're coming up to Chad's sentencing. And when would that have been? I think you said he pled sometime in February of 2013. And so now we're coming up to his sentencing? Yes. Do you remember when he was sentenced? I think the beginning of March, maybe March 5th. Okay. And that's the same year? Yes. Okay. And you said you attended his sentencing. Is that a fair statement? Yes. When you attend, do you remember if the defendant attended that sentencing? Yes. During this time frame, were you in contact with Mike Stefanko? No, I don't believe so, no. Did you ever see Mike Stefanko come to any of the court proceedings or the court hearings or the sentencing? Um, I don't know about the other court hearings, but not the sentencing, no. Okay, at that time, was Mike working for Chad? Yes. Okay. When Chad was sentenced, were you aware that the defendant was pregnant? I think we found out afterwards. I, I don't, I didn't know at that time, I don't believe. Okay. Are you aware of who the father of that child is? At the time that she knew she was pregnant, no, I did not. Okay. Are you aware now? Yes. And who's the father? Mike Stefanko. Mike Stefanko, there comes that name yet again. Just going to show you folks, we're still uh, on recess. I do see the judge is back uh, on the bench, but we'll wait for uh, the all rise for the jury to be back. Mike Stefanko, let's remember who Mike is in all of this. Mike was Chad's best friend since they were little kids. Uh, best friend, uh, was there for the birth of some of his children, had keys to his apartment, his house, everything. Well, Mike Stefanko and Erica were having an affair. She was Erica Cobb uh, at the time all of this is going on. They were clearly having an affair because uh, it's as Chad is being sentenced, we now know that Erica was pregnant with Mike Stefanko's child. Uh, so that's why when Chad was on the stand, uh, he kept saying things like, well, if everything came out, if we could get everybody to be truthful, uh, he might be able to with remove his plea 
that he entered into and get a fair trial. He's implying that there was something nefarious going on uh, between his then wife and his best friend and that uh, this may have all been a ploy to get him to carry out this murder and get him sentenced. Totally normal. If I ask you a question, you answered, I'm going to assume you understood it. Fair enough? Fair. Okay. Um, Chad is your only child, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, you didn't, you, neither you nor your husband Jay came into the marriage with other children, correct? No, sir. Okay. So he's, he's your only boy. He's your only child, right? Yes. Okay. Is it fair to say that, that you are quite close with your son? Yeah, fairly close, yes. Okay. Um, you'd, you'd visit with him and talk to him on the phone and were involved in his children's lives? Is that Correct. fair to say? Okay. Do you feel like you knew Chad pretty well? Yes. Okay. If you know, do you know what Chad was planning the night he killed Ashley? No, I do not. Okay. So you're quite close to him, and you didn't know what he was planning. Fair enough? Correct. Okay. What kind of child was Chad growing up? He had his issues with learning disability and attention deficiency. Okay. Was he in special classes or anything like that? Um, he was in junior, junior high, I believe. Okay. Um, just like an IEP or something like that? Yes. Okay. Um, but he managed to overcome that and graduate? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what kind of activities was he involved in, in when, like in grade school? Like sports or whatever? Mm -hmm. um, he didn't do any sports. He didn't? No. Okay. Do you know why? Just didn't like it or? Um, he didn't like confrontation, okay. being competitive. He didn't like confrontation. Correct. Okay. Um, we heard testimony that he was involved in martial arts, though, correct? Yes, that was later on. Yeah. Okay. It, wouldn't that be kind of confrontational? I guess it would be. Um, I don't know that he was in school when he did martial arts. Okay. So he was quite young, or, or he just did it outside of school? I believe he did it outside of school, if okay. I remember correctly. So maybe, maybe what you're getting at is that it was it was more private than the public setting of a baseball game or a football game or a basketball game. Yeah, I guess that would be fair. Okay. Um, when he graduated from <clears throat> high school, what what was his plan at that point? Um, he went into the Marines. Okay. I think he had signed up before he graduated. Okay. So that was, you, you mentioned that your husband's a veteran, correct, Jay? Yes. Okay. And so was that, if you know, was that kind of the plan through high school, go to the Marines and then maybe see what happens? No, I don't believe so. Really? Yeah. Okay. Do you know what the plan was? I don't know if he had one. Okay. Fair enough. I don't, I don't know that I did. <laughs> um, so when he went to the Marines, I mean, did that make you proud? Yeah. Were you, were you happy with that decision or would you have preferred that he went to college or something else? Probably would have preferred he went to college. Really? Yeah. Probably safer for your, for your baby, right? Yes. Okay. Um, in, in high school, did Chad have girlfriends? Yeah, he had a few. And would he would he bring them around? I don't remember him bringing a whole bunch around. He didn't date a whole lot. Okay. Um, so you you don't know that he brought any any girls back to the house to have mm -hmm. dinner or meet you guys. Not that I can really recall. Okay. Um, did you what did you think of the girls that he was dating? Did you like them, or did you like what you knew about them? They were fine. It's his choice. They were fine. It's his choice? Yes. Okay. What happened with his stint in the Marines? He graduated boot camp and then decided that was not for him. Okay. Do you know why? Uh, yes. Why? Um, he stated they wanted to turn him into a killing machine, and he did not want to be that. So he had... Moral objections. 
Yes, sir. He didn't want to kill. Correct. Are you aware he ended up killing? I'm aware of the situation. Are you aware that he killed Ashley Biggs? Objection, Your Honor. sustain that. We'll move to the next question. So your his his moral objections, did you learn those I mean did I'm not asking you to say what he said, but 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 he he expressed that to you. Correct. That that but for the 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 potential to have to kill someone, um, he would have continued. Objection this whole line is hearsay. Let's do a sidebar. Dan DeRose with 19 News. Another sidebar here at odds are is this question that Chad himself on the stand posed uh, that he's not the one that killed Ashley Biggs. And what he meant by that is while he did play a role in this, he claims it's Erica Stefanko or Erica Cobb at the time that put the zip tie around Ashley Biggs' neck. Uh, and we know that's ultimately how Ashley Biggs died. She uh, was strangled to death. Uh, but so to ask his mother, did, did Chad kill Ashley Biggs? Well, how's his mom supposed to answer that? And, uh, you know, that's, that's what they're getting at, and that's what they're arguing here. Uh, this idea that he had to get out of the Marines because he didn't want to be a killing machine. Uh, you just heard his own mom say that. Uh, and then that, well, that's interesting because didn't he kill Ashley Biggs? Well, she's aware of the situation and there is question of who did actually kill Ashley Biggs. What role did Erica Stefanko play in all of this? And that's exactly what she's on trial for. Uh, we've just heard perhaps one of the most damning piece of information or uh, evidence uh, conversation between Erica and Chad's mother. Uh, basically saying, look, we had a plan. We talked about it several times. I had told him the only way out of this custody battle, uh, the only way out of this and, and told him how to do it. She even said, uh, she explained to him, uh, I want to go back to that just so I get it right. I want to make sure I get this section right. Oh, uh, she says to Chad's mom at one point uh, that she told Chad, these are the options. And then she says to Chad's mom, I should have left one of them out. Meaning she should have left killing Ashley out. She was giving Chad's, uh, Chad options of how they could get through this nasty custody battle, how they could get Grace back. And you have Erica on tape saying, I guess I should have left one of them out. Uh, meaning let's get rid of the problem. Uh, she then goes on later in that conversation to say, uh, she told Chad, you know what you can do and what you can't do, can't do. We've been over it so many times. This is the only way that the problem goes away. She was basically saying, can you kill her or not? And if you can't kill her, uh, then let's not go through with this. Uh, and uh, but she said that's the only way to make this problem go away. Uh, so to make the mom get on stand, get on the stand and say, did you know Chad was going to kill Ashley Biggs? Well, uh, of course not. And it looks like and there is Ashley Biggs's mother. We've seen her a couple of times now, and it looks like we're done with the Reese, uh, the sidebar. Ma'am, I, I, I asked you a question about your son and, and Ashley Biggs, and, and you stated that you are aware of the situation. Is that correct? Correct. And I'm not just, these are technical rules here. And I'm not asking you to tell me who told you what or, or where you found information, but what are you aware of? I'm aware of the situation and what he is charged with. Okay. Um, he's, he's not charged with anything right now, correct? Chad? Yes. Yeah, he's in prison. But he's not charged with anything. His case is over, correct? Yes. Okay. So he, he has pled to charges, all of the charges in the indictment, including aggravated murder, correct? Yes. 
And so those, are, those have gone from charges to convictions. Is that correct? Okay. And I, under, I understand you're not an attorney, and I'm not, that's not what I'm getting at. But I just want to make it clear that, that you understand that his case is not pending. Correct? Yes, I, yes, I understand. OK, that. OK. Um, were you at his plea when he, when he entered this plea? When his, he said guilty? At his sentencing, yes. The sentencing? OK. I think, could you clarify? You asked if she was at the plea, and she said the sentencing. This, I think, were you at the plea or the sentencing, or both? So he would have, he would have pled guilty. He said the judge would have asked him a, a lot of questions about whether it's a knowing, voluntary, intelligent plea, he would say guilty, and then about a month or two later, then he would be sentenced. I think it was just his sentencing. Just we his sentence. only at one. Okay. <clears throat> and at that point, he's convicted of those charges and is serving life without parole, correct? Correct. Okay. I know this kind of goes without saying, but but you've you've because you raised him, but you've helped your son out a, a lot in his life. Is that fair to say? I think somewhat, yeah. Somewhat. Why do you say somewhat? Just, I mean, you're not there all the time, but you sure. help him when you can. At some point, he he left the nest and went to the Marines, and he's got his own life, Correct. right? Okay. Um, have you been helping him recently? Yes, with paperwork, yes. Okay. Describe what you mean by that getting court documentation. Okay. And do you know what the purpose is of that? Uh, he has paperwork. I, I don't know if it's listed as an appeal. So he, he, he needs help furthering his appeal, correct? Yeah, the paperwork, yes. Okay. How often do you go see him, Ms. Cobb? We go about every other week. So a couple times a month? Yes. OK. Do you, um, I know they have like iPads they can text and communicate. Do you do that with them too? Yes. You do? Yes. Um, so you, you didn't have any issues with the technology there? Somewhat. OK. But you figured it out? Had help to figure it out, yes. Who, who helped you, Grace? Sometimes, yes. Yeah. You go with you go visit with Grace sometimes. Yes. Okay. And do you put do you put money on his commissary account? Yes. Can you explain to the jury what that is? Commissary account is where if he needs to buy toiletries, um, food, clothes, um, phone calls, he has the means to do so. Um. Is it safe to say that since Chad's an only child, um, Grace um, and uh, FC and AC are your only grandchildren? I might have gotten some of those. Yeah, you got initials. some of the initials. Well, I guess if you can tell us, aside from Grace, you can give initials. Who are your grandchildren? FC and KC. FC and KC, I'm sorry. That's all right. OK. Um, and you don't have any other grandchildren, correct? No, sir. OK. Um, there was some, some talk of the, of the Susan Wingrove. Uh, I don't really even want to get into it, but that's a question there, right? Correct. OK, and Chad's talked to you about that? Yes. OK. Um, of your grandchildren, I know it's hard to choose. I mean, who, who, are, who do you spend the most time with? Uh, Grace, because we had custody of her. Okay, so is it fair to say you're closest with Grace? Yes, we haven't been able to see our other two grandkids for a couple of years. Okay, and is it fair to say that you and Grace have similar interests, the vet, vet tech thing and, and horses and things like that? Is that fair? Yes. How does that make you feel that she's pursuing a, possibly a career in that? Surprised. Really? Why is that? Just surprised that she went into the animal field. Okay, why is that? I just didn't think she was that interested in him. Okay. Does it make you feel proud now, though, that you got somebody to kind of talk about these things with? Yes. Okay. So 
going back to prior to 2012, um, how did you feel when you found out that Ashley Biggs had come back into the picture and filed the CPO against Chad? I got shocked. Okay, why? Just because she hadn't been um, in the picture for probably three years. Okay. Um, you, you, didn't, you never saw her for about three years? Correct. Um, if you know, do, do you know if, if there were attempts made by her to see Grace at all in that three years? I have, not that I'm aware of. Not that you're aware of. Is it, do you know if for part of that time, Ashley Biggs was in the military, possibly? Um, she was for, for boot camp, but I believe she did not finish boot camp. Okay. You, you don't think she finished boot camp? No. Like your son did? Correct. And I'm not saying that it excuses it being in boot camp, but she could still have contact with Grace even if she was in boot camp or in the military, right? Correct. There'd be opportunities for phone calls at least, right? Right. Okay. So, so it, as you understand it, how was she able to get Grace from school that day? She got a temporary order from Magistrate Stoner. And she needed to allege some sort of misconduct or something on the part of Chad to get that, correct? I would assume so. Okay. And if she had a CPO against a temporary, even a temporary CPO against Chad, then that would extend to Grace. Is that your understanding? Yes. Okay. On the day that you know, Chad testified he went to pick her up and she wasn't there. On that day, do you remember getting a call from him? I don't remember exactly how we found out. Okay, that's fair. But, but you found out right, right after it was discovered that Grace wasn't at school. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah I don't know how quickly, but... Okay, yes. but that day? I would believe so. Okay. Um, did you do anything after hearing that information? I don't, I don't believe so. I mean, I know we went to Brittany's house, but I don't know that it was that. I don't think it was that day. Okay. And, and you say Brittany, you mean Brittany Dunson, correct? Yeah, her parents' home. And it would be Brittany Dunson's mother's house, right? Yes. And you testified that we, we went there. Who's we? I believe it was myself, my husband, my mother, and I think Erica went with us. That okay. Day. If we heard your son say that it was just you and your mother, do you, do you think he's mistaken in that? He could be. Okay. So you're pretty certain that it was that whole crew? I know my mom and my husband and I was there. Okay, but you're not sure about Erica? No. Okay, but, but you know that you and your mother and your husband went, correct? Correct. And what happened there? Just um, my husband and my mom talked to Brittany's mom and that, because my mom was, she was older, was very concerned with Grace because she had a very close relationship with Grace. Okay, your mother was close with Grace as well? Yes. Okay. Did that get heated at Miss Dunson's mother's house? Miss um, Dunson got, I think, a little upset, and it asked us to, to leave, and we did. Okay. How'd you get her address? I do not remember. Okay. Because it wasn't Brittany's house. It was her, her apartment. It was her mother's, right? Correct. Okay. Let's go back a little bit. When's the first time that you met Ashley Bix? Um, I think Chad started dating her in 04. Okay. And did he bring her over for dinner, or how did you meet her? I mean, he brought her to the house at one point, but I don't remember the, the circumstances. Okay, he brought her over to, was, was he living with you guys at that point?
It's not important. That's not, I don't I'll, remember. I'll, that's okay. I'll strike that. Um, what were what were your impressions of Ashley when you met her? Nice, quiet young girl. Nice and quiet. Um, do you know what she was doing for work at that time? No, I don't remember. Do you remember uh, like anything about what kind of family she came from? Um, didn't know much about her. Okay. Did you know where she went to high school or if she was in college or anything like that? Don't remember. Did you think she was good enough for your son? It's his choosing. Sure, ultimately, but, but what did you feel? I mean, it, like I said, it's his choosing. Um, nice girl. Don't know what her work ethics were. Okay. Is it fair to say you thought maybe he could do better? Objection, question asked and answered. Sustained. We'll move to the next question. Okay. You said that you weren't sure about Miss Biggs' work ethic. What do you mean by that? Just that, I mean, does she hold a job? Does she work every day? Did you have concerns about that? I don't, I can't answer because I don't remember what she was doing at that time. Okay, fair enough. What um, what did you think of Erica when she entered the picture? She seemed nice as well when he brought her around. Okay, did you like her? She was fine. Okay, was she working? I don't remember. Okay, did you know anything about her background or education, anything like that? No. You didn't? Okay. I didn't know. Did you find out? I mean, later on, I mean, I think she had some college courses in that. Okay. Um, did you think she was a good person? She seemed to be, yes. Okay. Did you feel like she was good enough for your boy? Yeah, I mean, Work ethic again. I mean, we're a working family and we work hard. Okay. So you kind of like that to carry on. I understand. So, so hard work and, and a strong work ethic is, is important in the Cobb family. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. And you testified yesterday that while your son had some faults, you believed him to be a hard worker. Is that correct? Correct. And your husband, Jay, <clears throat> spent several years at MITCO and was kind of a do-everything kind of guy there, right? Correct. Okay. And so when asked about Erica, you politely hesitated. Is that fair? Fair. Okay. Um, you wanted, is it fair to say that you wanted somebody for your boy that you thought shared the same work ethic and family ideals as the cops, correct? Correct. Okay. Calling your attention to the, this recording that you made, what kind of device did you use? A little digital. Okay, and do you have that? Do you still have that? Do I still, no, the police have it. You gave it to the police? Yes. Okay, and when did you get that device? I don't remember. Okay, what kind of device is it? Just a little digital recorder. Do you know the brand? No, I don't remember what it was. Okay, did you buy it? Yes. When did you buy it? I mean, I don't remember. Do you, do you know like a approximation of a year? No. Okay. Um, how did it? How did it record? Like, what, what was it? Digital? Was it tape? Like, how? How would it? Digital. Record? It was digital. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what does that mean? You push a button and it records. There's like no cassette to it. Okay. Um, does it upload somewhere? Does it? Can you? Can you like download something onto the computer? How? How do you? I don't, I don't know. 
Well, how, how did you know how to use it? I read the instructions. Okay. So for what purpose did you buy this? Had bought it because back then, I don't know if they still have Build-A-Bears, and wanted to record Chad's voice to put on the... Um, you could record into the bear a voice. Okay, what was was he already in prison? Yes. Okay, okay. Sorry, I didn't I'm, know. I'm sorry. It was just a bear that you could record a message on. Gotcha. So, so he's already in prison. He goes to prison about 2013, right? Yes. Okay. So, is it fair to say you purchased this in about 2013? Could be. Okay. Is it also fair to say that Chad had undertaken an appeal already at that point in 2013? Possibly. Well, let's just go back. So, so he, he pled guilty and got sentenced to life without parole, correct? Correct. Pretty quickly thereafter, he, he started trying to undo that. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I don't remember exactly how soon stuff took place there. Okay. Um, do you know if that first appeal was successful or unsuccessful? I believe unsuccessful. Okay. And again, this was... This was shortly after he arrived at the prison that he undertook this, correct? I believe so. Okay. So when you purchased this recorder, had his appeal been denied yet? I don't remember. Okay. But is it fair to say he had started that process at the very least? I don't remember. How much, how much space, like recording space, is available on this recorder? I don't know. Did it have to be plugged in or did you have batteries? I think it's battery. Okay. Where did you buy it? I, it's been a while ago. I don't remember. Did you end up doing that Build-A-Bear thing? Yes. Okay. And who'd you give that to? Uh, KC. Okay. And then did you have to erase over that for this scheme? Probably. Okay. And Objection you knew how to do it? Basis? The terminology. For this recording, I'll retract it. For okay. this recording. So you, sa you said probably you had to erase it over? Yeah, I mean, I don't remember. Okay. And you knew how to do that? Yeah, there's a new race button on there, I believe. Okay. Um, before Erica got over that night, and what, what was the date again of that? <clears throat> if I told you March 4th, 2014, does that sound right? Sounds about right. Okay, 2014 now, right? I believe so, yes. So at that point, Chad's, Chad's already had an appeal denied, right? I would believe so. Okay. Where did you put this recorder before she got there? It was just, there was just stuff piled up on top of the table and I set it there. Like in the bar? Yes. What kind of alcohol do you have in the bar? There was vodka and rum, some other ones. Okay. But like bottles? Not like little bottles, yes. big bottles? Yes. Okay. Did you, were, were you aware that after Chad went to prison, Erica started to drink more than she normally would? No. You didn't notice that? No. Okay. Before she got over there that night, do you know where Erica was? No, I do not. Do you know who she was with? No. You don't know what she was doing? No. Um, do you know if she had anything, any alcohol to drink prior to showing up? I would have no way of knowing. You'd have no way of knowing? And when you, when she arrived, you offered her a pop or something, correct? Correct. And she didn't want that, right? Correct. Something stronger. Yes. I can relate to that. 
Did you have something stronger? Yes, I did. Okay. And this is, we heard a little bit of reference to this. This was a, this was a long conversation, correct? Correct. Over three hours, right? Roughly, yeah, I believe. And it's, and we heard bits and pieces, but there's a whole three, out, three plus hours of conversation here, correct? Correct. And is it fair to say that this is kind of a freewheeling conversation? There's a, strike that. There's a lot of topics discussed over the course of three plus hours, right? Yes. Okay. I mean, do you, you guys get into a, a lot of different topics, you know, the, the Chad and the kids and Mike Stefanko, right? Yeah. And the tools and abortion and birth control, like a lot of topics, right? Okay. Yeah. okay. And they, they played you some small bits and pieces of that longer conversation. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Taking you back to June 21st, 2012. So let's go back before the secret recording. Um, did you receive a call? So the 21st would have been, you know, from midnight. So the, the actions of, of Ashley Biggs' death were the 20th and the 21st. So did you receive a call on the 21st? Yes. Okay, who is that call from? Chad. Okay. Um, how did he sound? I mean, okay, maybe a little nervous. What do you mean when you say okay, maybe a little nervous? I mean, it was very hard. Like I stated before, there was not a good connection. There was static. It would cut in and out. Um, you know, like you'd be talking, there'd be nothing there. Do you know if he was in a car or not when he made that call? Um, I don't recall him okay. saying. Do you, do you know if he was indoors or outdoors? I don't, I don't really recall. Okay, and did you hear anybody else with him? No, I did not. Okay. How many times did he call you? It was a couple. Okay. And, I mean, did, I'm not asking you to say what he say, but did, 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 he, did he want you to do, did he need something from you? He was trying to contact Mike. Okay. And, and you say, when you say Mike, you mean Mike Stefanko, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And if you know, do you know why? No, he just wanted to talk to Mike. Okay. Do you know anything about any medication that Erica was taking around that time? Um, I don't know if she was maybe on some seizure medication, maybe. You, you, you think you remember something about her being on anti-seizure medication? I think something about before, yeah. Was there any talk of that that night? I don't recall. Okay, I understand it's a long time ago. Um, he wanted you to wake Mike up, so what did you do? We went and told Mike that he was, Chad wanted to talk to him. Okay. I could be mistaken on this, but I thought that yesterday you said that you just went back to bed. I did go back to bed afterwards, yes. After you woke Mike up? Yes. Oh, okay, okay, fair enough. All right, so let's just clear this up then. So after Chad asked you to go wake Mike up, what, you, you went, he lived across the street? No, uh, he lived over in, um, he lived in Ritman too. Oh, uh, not across the street. I thought, no. I thought it was really close. How far away did Mike live? Um, maybe a couple miles. Okay. Who went, who went to go to Mike's? My husband and I drove over. You and Jay? Yes. Is it fair to say that from when you left to go wake Mike up to when you have a conversation with Mike and before you get to go back to bed, that there's nobody at your house? Yeah, there's nobody at our house. 
Is it possible Chad could have stopped by and you would not know it? Anything's possible. But is that possible? I have no idea. Okay. But you weren't there and Jay wasn't there, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, if you know, what, what, did, what did Mike do when you, when you answered the door? Just said, okay. I, I don't know what he did afterwards. Do you know what time this was? No, I don't remember. Was it after midnight? It was after midnight, yes. Okay. Would you agree? That's a big ask, even of your baby boy. <laughs> Get out of bed and go wake Mike Stefanko up. Is that a big ask of him? I mean, he asked and we just, you know, he wanted to talk to Mike. Okay. Um, are you used to doing things to help your son? I mean, is that why you did it? Well, occasionally. Okay. I'm asking you because I don't know that I, <laughs> I would for my son. But so, did you, did you, did, were you wondering why in the middle of the night you needed to go over there? I mean, yeah, you kind of wonder, but there was no forthcoming information, so. Okay, you weren't getting any, any information. No. Is it fair to say that your quickest way back into bed would to go, go and wake Mike up? Right? Well, I just figured if Chad needed something and he wanted Mike. Okay. Do you know what Mike did? No, sir. Okay. Let's talk about Mike Stefanko for a little bit. What, what are your thoughts on him? Um, he grew up across the street from us. Okay. Nice kid growing up? Yeah. Okay. I correct me if I'm wrong. I felt a little bit of hesitation there. What? Just different lifestyle. Okay. Just explain what you mean by that. Um, they do a lot of pot. They do a lot of pot. Yeah. Okay. Marijuana. Yes. Okay. Um, when when Chad and Mike met, how old were they? Would have had to been elementary school, early elementary school. Okay, and he was a little bit younger than your son, correct? Yeah, I think he's a couple of years. Okay. He wasn't doing any pot, doing pot then, right? I mean, what were your impressions as a kid of Mike? Just typical kids, boys. Okay. You, you and Erica talk about Mike Stefanko on that tape. Is that correct? Yeah, I believe his name came up. Okay. And it sounded like it came up in the context of, of Chad's state of mind um, related to him calling and calling when, <clears throat> excuse me, when you didn't get back from vacation. Is that correct? I believe so. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? I think. And you made reference that, that, you know, there was a comment made, you all like Mike more than me. Do you remember that? Yes. What does that mean? I, at that time, then Mike and Erica were, were together in that. Okay. What did you take that to, to mean? I'm not understanding. Okay, fair enough. It sounds like there's an implication that, that, that people were taking Mike's side. Is that true? Objection. Over chat. Right. Objection. Calls for speculation. I don't, I don't know who the people are. I don't. <laughs> Sustained. We'll go to the next one. Okay. Is it fair to say, though, that there was a lot of conversation on that tape, on that purported tape that about Mike and the kids, correct? I would say there was a lot about the kids. Okay. And, and at that point, Mike was a part of that, right? In the kids' lives, yes. Yes, okay, all right. Um, 
you said that you were um, at ch your son's sentencing, correct? Correct. Um, before he was given a sentence of life without parole, what was your understanding of what sentence he would get? Ask again. <laughs> Sorry. What did you think, did, did you know that he could only get life without parole as a result of this plea? I don't remember. Did you ever think that maybe he could get a sentence, a life sentence that would make him eligible for parole at some point? Probably. You did? Okay. You said that you met with his attorneys, is that correct? I think we met with Malarsic one time. Don Malarsic? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you're saying that you thought that maybe there was a possibility he could get 25 to life or 30 to life or something less than life without parole, correct? Yes. How did you feel when you heard Judge Corrigal Jones say, Mr. Cobb, I'm sentencing you to life without the possibility of parole? Like the rugs pulled out from under you. Okay. You felt, by that saying, you, are you saying that you felt tricked or deceived? Objection. Overruled. We'll hear the answer. She can answer. Um, I mean, like I said, you just, I don't know. To, to your recollection, you don't, you don't remember it being kind of a, a negotiated plea that that was what he was going to get. Is that what you're saying? I mean, we wasn't in with the attorney when they were talking back and forth, so. Chad was. Obviously. Correct, Chad, yeah. Okay. So it's fair to say, aside from the rug being pulled out, you, that you were upset by that. That goes without saying, right? Yes. Okay. Did you feel like you were never going to see your son again outside of prison? Yes. You hesitated there. Did, did you think that maybe you would? I think as a parent, you always hope for something better. Okay. Is it fair to say that you, you have hope that Chad will one day get out of prison? I'd like to hope so. Okay. Is it fair to say you do everything in your power legally to assist him in that? Legally, yes. Okay. You would do anything for him within the constraints of the law. Fair? Yes. Okay. Now, yesterday on, on um, direct examination, he talked a little bit about um, Grace and some of the counseling that she did. Do you recall that? Yes. Okay. Are you aware that Grace told her counselor they were at Grandma's Objection, by Your the Honor. barn? Oh. Here, that, Basis. Hearsay. Do you want to respond? I mean, we can go to sidebar, okay. or I can respond here. You can respond here. Oh, here, we'll go to sidebar. Dana Rose with 19 News. As uh, this cross-examination of Chad Cobb's mother continues, um, you have to realize that uh, in the when you, if you're the attorney trying to defend Erica Stefanko here, you've just had what is probably the most damning piece of evidence played, and that was the conversation uh, between Cindy, Chad's mom, and Erica. So the defense has to get up there and do something. They have to try and poke holes uh, in this story, and you could see where he was going with the, the digital device. Uh, did somebody purchase that for you? Where did you purchase it? Why did you purchase it? Uh, again, this narrative that the defense has is that there's Team Cobb, uh, people who are willing to do anything to try and get Chad out and Erica in. Uh, that has been their argument from the beginning, that that's what Chad's family and Chad are trying to do here, trying to make Erica look guilty uh, by doing any with any means necessary. 
uh, that recording does a very good job of making Erica look guilty. What I think is interesting is the defense, uh, as I said, heading into the cross-examination, they could have chosen any of the other three hours of that conversation. If there was something Erica said in that three hours where she would have said, uh, but I didn't do this and I didn't plan this and, and I'm totally innocent, notice they're not playing any portion of the recording that we haven't already heard. So that tells me there is no portion that makes Erica look innocent in that three hour phone call. And that's why they didn't go right to it. If, if you were going to make your client look innocent uh, after you had just heard all those damning statements that she'd made, I would follow that right up with, oh yeah, but she also said this and take a listen to this and take a listen to this, but we haven't seen any of that. Now the cross-examination isn't over. It potentially could happen. We heard that they did need time to set up, this could be a strategy thing. Uh, get away from that long conversation, all those statements uh, that she made, uh, get the jury away from that by questioning the mom for a while and then playing your statements. Very possible that that could happen, uh, but we will wait and see uh, because, and in this line of questioning, when they get into uh, what Grace told uh, her counselors, her therapist. Uh, we know that yesterday Grace testified that Erica, the stepmother, they had good times and bad times. Among the bad times was the uh, time that Erica made her eat dog feces that she put into blueberry yogurt. Uh, you heard in the recording, Erica herself brought that up and she said, well, that wasn't really dog feces, but are you really going to tell the grandmother? Yeah, I did actually put dog poop in the, in the, uh, the blueberry uh, yogurt. Uh, you're probably going to steer clear for that. You're probably going to try and get the grandmother on your side by saying, but it wasn't really, uh, you heard Grace herself say it looked like it, it smelled like it, uh, even though she had never tasted it before, she was forced to eat it. Uh, but then we also heard about uh, Grace saying that uh, she was physically abused at the hands of Erica and uh, that it left bruises. She can remember a time specifically that she was pinned to the ground. Erica had her hand around her throat, one on her mouth, uh, and that Erica had told her on several occasions, if you tell your dad about this, I'm going to abuse you even worse. The, the beatings are going to be even worse. Uh, so that's where we're, we're at here. They're just about to talk about what Grace had told the, her grandmother about the therapy sessions and whether or not that's hearsay. If Grace is telling the grandmother and now the grandmother's trying to recite uh, what Grace said, that's, that's hearsay. And that's even a step away. That's Grace telling grandmother about a conversation that happened between her and another person uh, as to why this may not be admissible and that's uh, why there was this objection. Uh, w there were only a couple of times uh, I was busy, uh, really, really trying to concentrate. Those recordings weren't the best, uh, but there were a couple of times I looked up uh, during those recordings to see the look on Erica's face, and she was pretty stoic. She looked down for most of it because they are so, um, uh, they are some powerful statements and do not make her look good in any way, shape, or form. Uh, this sidebar taking a little bit longer that should have been keeping track of how many sidebars we've had throughout this trial. Uh, again, it's a little bit different because it's a retrial. Uh, you cannot let the jury know that this is the second time this has been tried. Uh, so you've got to be careful how you word things. You have to be careful how you object. Uh, when you object, uh, it could be for a reason that, well, in the first trial, we agreed that this would not be discussed, so you can't say that out loud. You have to have a sidebar so that the uh, jury doesn't hear it. We had Jared Klebenow, our defense analyst, uh, on yesterday, and I asked him uh, if he thought uh, the jury, or when you have retrials, does the jury know? Can the jury pick up on things? Uh, Jared said that he thought because there had been so many sidebars that the jury has to have an idea that, that something is up, uh, that something here is different. Uh, I myself, if, if you think about this, uh, Chad was sentenced in 2013. We know there was the delay and the big delay in getting Erica charged was that uh, Cindy had that digital recording in a safe 
from 2014 to 2018. It was only in 2018 that she turned it over to detectives and it's just a year later in 2019 that Erica is charged. Uh, now, if I was sitting on this jury, I'd be like, well, wait a second, she was charged in 2019 and we're, we're just now getting to her trial. Uh, granted, there, it's a complicated trial, uh, but that, that would tell me that, that something was odd about what was going on and uh, would make me question. But here we go, uh, heading back into court. And just a heads up, the judge has forgotten to turn the microphones on. This is not our uh, issue here. Uh, we need the judge to get the microphones back on. We are missing testimony. Hopefully someone in the courtroom will be getting to the judge here. I can show you this. I have an alternate view of the judge. Let me see, make sure there's no. Be familiar with there records some audio related here. to that counseling. Yes. You would? Yes. Did you review those? Yes. You did? Why? Just it involved our granddaughter. You wanted to stay involved? <clears throat> Ma'am, do you know how, if you know, do you know how your son killed Ashley that night? Just what I've read previously. Okay. Are you vaguely aware though? Yes. Okay. Do you know um, what your son was wearing that night? Just what was reported. Okay. Um, do you know if he was in all head to toe camouflage? Um, I don't know. Okay. We're going to need that on Mars for a second. <clears throat> is, is it possible to do that on Mars and go back to the Mars? Okay. Actually, I'll, we'll, let, let's do the recording first okay. and then just, 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 just so smooth it out. Ma'am, we'll get back to that in a minute. Let's go back to the tape so we can let Mike re relax here. Um, they played you some portions, and the jury's going to get the, the full picture of this thing. But um, I just wanted to play a couple clips for you as well and see if you recall that being okay, accurate. Sorry, I saw too many words there. Is that okay? Um, so what do we need them? Um, Judge. Um, Do we need to call Tristan? Yeah, I think we just need to get to, to where we can see his uh, screen. Let's see. Uh, yeah, Attorney Easter is very. Miss Easter was using to, to use her laptop to play off. Or is that what Attorney Easter just hit? Judge, can we get Tristan? Yeah, I absolutely. Apologize. This is, That's okay. Adam, could you please send in Magistrate Sari? Well, I, you have 
Clearly having some technical issues on the court's end here. Uh, happens pretty common when they switch from the prosecution to the defense. Different technology, different files. Right. He's actually my magistrate, but he's the youngest person on our staff, so he knows how to run everything. There he is, Magistrate Sari, not IT technician. He says that I should know how to do it, but I don't. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's why Mike's here. <laughs> All right, thank you for, for your patience. So we're gonna play a, a brief clip. It's from um, one minute, 45 seconds to two minutes and 15 seconds. It's kind of right when she shows up, okay? Let's go ahead. I don't know if anyone actually heard that. Did you all hear that? I, could you replay that? If you want pop, or, oh, I'll take some of the stronger stuff if there's any available. Like what? What, um, whose voice was that saying, I'll have to have some of the stronger stuff? Erica. Okay, and that means alcohol. She clarifies it later on. She right? clarifies it? Okay. What kind of alcohol did you did you give her? Uh, she wanted vodka. Okay. Uh, what was the size of the glass that you put the vodka in? That's just a regular, regular size glass. Okay. Like, is that a pint glass? I don't, I, I don't it would just be a regular size, like, tumbler. A tumbler? Did you have ice out there in the barn? Yes. Okay. Did she have ice in her drink? I don't remember. Did she mix it with anything? I think on the recording it said maybe cranberry. Okay. What kind of mixers did you have out there? I mean, pop, evidently I had cranberry. Okay. But you don't remember if it was mixed with ice or anything? I would assume so. Okay. But I can't say 100%. Did she pour it herself or did you pour it? I believe I poured. Okay, where were you sitting? Behind the bar or on the outside of the bar? Or is there a bar? Yeah, there's a little table-like bar. Okay, <clears throat> and the alcohol is behind the bar? Yes. Okay, where were you guys sitting? She might have been sitting on the end. I was probably standing behind the bar. Okay, did she have access to the alcohol from where she was? She would have had to have gotten up. Okay. It sounds like you guys did, this is a three, over three hours. You guys did get up and move around on some level, correct? No, I think we pretty much stayed sitting. Okay, we hear some noises and <clears throat> things that I can't really explain, and what are those? I don't know, maybe I was picking at stuff, trying to organize some stuff, I don't remember. Okay. Like I said, it was a mess, it had flooded. Okay. Is it your testimony here today that over the course of three hours, three plus hours, you guys had one drink? Yes, sir. Was she sipping it really slowly? Evidently, I only remember pouring one. Okay. All right, the next clip we're gonna play for you is uh, 26 minutes, 20 seconds to 26 minutes, 33 seconds. I don't need to be in charge, but I need to have some control over my life. And Chad is very, this is what's happening, and you're going to do what I say. And that's, that's just his personality. Is that Erica talking right there? Yes, sir. Um, and who is she talking about? Chad. Okay. Chad Cobb, your son? Yes. Okay. We're gonna, the next one we're gonna play. And a couple of these bleed over into, into things you've already, that Miss Easter played, so I apologize for that. But um, what she played you was, it, it, they were longer clips, is that correct? 
Sometimes, some of them? Some, yeah. Some of them were real short, but some of them were longer, right? Yes. Okay. This one, I think, is, is included in one that was already played, but I just wanted to ask you about this part of it. So it's 48 minutes, 15 seconds, to around 48 minutes, 20 seconds. <clears throat> 48, sorry, Felicia, 48.05. 48 minutes, five seconds to about 48 minutes, 20 seconds. Then it's a totally different charge. I don't see it as manslaughter, but it would be a different de different degree of murder. But I just, I don't see anything getting that wow. <laughs> I, I think, I think he snapped. I don't know. That is, is that your voice there saying, I think he snapped? Yes. And who is he? Chad. Okay. Why did you say that? Just with, I mean, everything that had gone on with the custody case. Can you explain that a little bit more? Do you mean that the things that's going on with the custody case, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but things going on in the custody case caused Chad to snap? Just, I mean, there was just a lot of, court court related issues not getting solved and i just think it takes it was a lot of the emotional turmoil it, the, it there was an emotional turmoil within chad because of the custody issue with grace i think everybody okay chad and grace were extremely close correct yes um grace just to remind everybody was was he and ashley biggs's daughter correct Correct. Um, in, 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 with your perception, and you know these people well, did, did Chad have a special relationship with Grace? Yes, I would say so. Okay. Is that because that was his first daughter, first child? Yes. Okay. Possib possibly. But his first child for all intents and purposes. As far as we know, his first <laughs> one, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, if you know, was was Chad upset by this by Grace getting taken away, as he said? I think anyone would be upset with their child. Absolutely, but was Chad? Yes, he was upset. Okay. Um, you you say you think that you think that Chad snapped. You used the word think there, correct? I believe so. Like you. I'm not trying to trick. You don't say, I know Chad snapped and did this, correct? You don't say that. You say, I think Chad snapped, correct? Correct. Is that because you don't know what is happening inside Chad Cobb's head? That's just my speculation. Because you're not inside of his head, right? Correct. You testified earlier, you didn't know what he was planning that night. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, the next one that we're gonna play um, is 59 minutes, 30 seconds to uh, one hour and two minutes. Here, and there was nothing, there was a, for a long time, there was nothing going on with Mike and I that was inappropriate. I would go over to his house when I was And then a couple of times, I, and it was my fault. Like I told Chad, I'm like, 
him on raising the kids and that. I know one of his issues is he does not want the kids growing up thinking, and I don't know what issues married twice you guys had before about unfaithfulness and that, but obviously some things have changed. Um, that it's okay to be married to one and then doing this with the other. And I've had conversations. I've, I've, Alexander is the one that I've had the most conversations with. Well, obviously. With because yeah. he's older. Right. But it's like, this is why this is going on. It's like, I still love your dad. Your dad and I can't get along. Your dad is in prison and this happened. And so now I'm with Mike. Do you recall that con conversation? Yes. Okay. Um, did you hear her say, make a reference to being passed out drunk? I must have not caught that in there. You didn't catch that? No. Being passed out drunk and going to Mike's house? You didn't hear that? I'm sorry. No. Okay. Um, you make a reference to It Takes Two. You remember that? Yes. Okay. And is that Mike, Stefanko, and Erica? I believe so. Okay. You listened to what we just played, correct? Yes. Okay. Is it fair to say that, that most of that conversation was having to do with Mike Stefanko and Erica's new relationship? I believe so. Okay. So, and at the beginning of that, talking about how kind of that started, which was after he went to jail, she would be passed out drunk, she was drinking, and would go to Mike's. Is that correct? Okay. okay. Yes. And when it talked in the context of them getting together, you made the statement, it takes two. So is that about Mike and Erica? I believe so. Okay. Um, did, you, did you approve or disapprove of how um, Erica started up a new relationship? I would have to say disapprove. Um, you know, it would have been nice just to be, hey, you know, Chad's in, in prison and that, and I'm going to move on and, and start dating. Okay. So you didn't like that? No. Did you think that was kind of duplicitous of Ms. Stefanko? What exactly does that word mean? Like, lie, she's lying to you, kind of. She's being untruthful. <clears throat> She wasn't being up front. She wasn't being up front? No. Okay. Did you, did you find her to be trustworthy? In the beginning, yes. In the beginning? Yeah. Okay. But as time went on, you found her less trustworthy? Well, after indiscretions with Grace and that, yes. Okay. Fair enough. All right. The... Um, Next part that we're going to, actually, we don't need to play this if you remember. So you talked about, because they played it, you talked about Chad um, when the whole Grace situation was going on and he was, you know, worked up by it, that, you know, he got to a, a, a tipping point. Do you remember that? Yes, Erica stated that they, she had gotten to a tipping point. Okay. And... To your knowledge, did that reference him um, giving up parental rights to Grace? Correct. Can you describe that? Um, just, he said, you know, couldn't take it anymore. Um, FC was having issues, um, the, the younger sibling, uh, with Grace not being around. Okay. And just really didn't wasn't getting anywhere with the custody hearing and that, that he was going to give his, terminate his rights or whatever and give custody to, to Ashley. Just stop fighting it and Ashley can have her. Yes. Did that surprise you? Yes. Why? Just because I know how much he loved Grace. Okay. Is it your belief that he would keep fighting that fight for Grace. I thought he was going to give up his parental 
rights and just have visitation with her. Okay. How'd that make you feel? Because that'd limit your time with Grace, right? Yes, but I mean, he still had the rest of the family that he um, had to keep together, though, too. Okay. Just got to kind of move on, right? Unfortunately, As best yeah. you can. Okay. Yeah. Still have two, three other kids at home. Right. Chad, Chad and his decisions can keep you busy sometimes, right? Is that fair to say? I guess that'd be fair. Okay. The next part that we're going to play is uh, two hours and six minutes and 40 seconds to two hours, seven minutes, 27 seconds. Does that sound right, Mike? Okay. We're not overly great fans of each other. And well, I don't, from my perspective, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I, you can say that and I respect it, but it wasn't that. It wasn't that I, you know, I have some problem with you guys or, you know, anything of that nature. It was just, it wasn't comfortable. I couldn't, you, you, I don't think you, you would, over the situation with Chad, I think we were doing it in different kind of ways, and I don't—I didn't feel comfortable with you, and I also felt like, as much as you were trying to be supportive of me for him, that you also were—you didn't say it, but I felt like in the back of your head, you still must be blaming me for it in some way, which is not unreasonable, but it still didn't put me in a comfortable spot to be here. Is that—is that you and Erica talking? Or is that Erica telling you about you and her relationship? Yes. Is that fair? Yes. Um, and she starts off and says that you're not great fans of each other. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. And you testified you guys were getting through it, right? Yes. <laughs> For the sake of the kids. Um, is it... Did, did you hear her mention that she does not have a problem with you? But yes. just did not feel comfortable? Correct. Okay. Um, do you think that she was comfortable in that barn that night with you? Yes. You do? Yes. Okay. Um, the next part that we're going to play is two minutes, 25 seconds, or I'm sorry, two hours. I did the same thing. Two hours, 25 minutes, 55 seconds. Two hours, 26 minutes, and four seconds. Go ahead, Mike. Who's got the kids? Mike has a kid. Mike has a kid sometimes. <laughs> Just what? I know. <laughs> we grit our teeth when we <laughs> Did you say we grit our teeth? I could have. I couldn't hear real plain. Can you replay it for her, Mike? Thanks. I can't sit back down. Just... Who's got the kids? Mike has a kid. Mike has a kid sometimes. <laughs> Just what? I know. <laughs> we grit our teeth when we. <laughs> did you hear that? Yes. And what did you say? I, I think I said we grit our teeth sometimes when he has the kids. Okay. What? What? What's that mean? Just like I said, he was a, a teenager, young man that does marijuana. So your biggest concern in this whole thing was, was marijuana? Well, no. I'm just... Not necessarily, I mean, not just that, but him being... I guess like a, a dad figure or just them left in their care. In lieu of your son, right? Or in somebody place, else watching the children also. Mike is doing that in place of your son who's in prison serving life sentence at this point, correct? Correct. Were you drinking alcohol that night? I had one drink. Okay. So you're not against things that might intoxicate you, just pot, right? Well, at that time, that was illegal. Okay. So it's the legality of it that is an issue for you? It's status under state law? It's just <clears throat> something that we, we don't do. 
How do you feel about aggravated murder? Against that too. Ma'am? There's stuff that is punishable by the law. Okay. Um, when you say we grit our teeth, in addition to this pot problem, um, is there any other reason that you didn't like Mike watching the kids? Just didn't care for him watching the kids. You are aware that that Erica and Mike Stefanko remain married to this day, correct? Yes, sir. Do you think he's a good father to those kids? I think it's questionable. Do you think you and Jay would do a better job with him? Um, I. Don't want to raise any more children. If given the opportunity, you think you could have done a better job? Maybe. Okay. Is part of the reason you don't want to raise any more children is how Chad ended out? Ended up? No, sir. Okay. All right. The last clip we're going to play for you, Cindy, is uh, uh, two hours, 30 minutes, 15 seconds to about two, two hours, 30 minutes, 25 seconds. I'm not saying that. That's one of the reasons that Chad and I stayed together for so long. I cannot say that. I will, I will forgive you. I don't care what you did to me. I will forgive you. Sorry, I can say that. Yeah, I know you can. <laughs> but I, see, that's why it's different. Did you hear that, ma'am? Yes. Um, was that Erica saying she, she can't stay mad? And did you say, well, see, I can stay mad? Yeah, back then. Back then? Yeah. You've changed since then? Yes, I have. I've learn to forgive and forget. That's good. That's good. Um, do you know what do you know what Chad was charged with in this case? In his case, excuse me? There were several charges. Okay. Um, was there aggravated murder, murder and kidnapping? I believe so. Okay. And do you remember some charges that he pled to um, like tampering with evidence or abuse of a corpse? I believe those were on there. Okay. Um, and do you know that those are felony offenses? Those, those ones that would happen after the killing, so to speak? Are you aware of that? Yes. Okay. Um, and do, do you believe that a crime like that, a person could go to prison for, theoretically? Yes. Okay. So you're aware generally of the concept that if um, a person helps somebody after a crime, that they could also be committing some other crime, right? Yes. Like if you help the getaway driver we've talked about here, or if you helped clean up a crime scene or something like that, you could be guilty of a felony and go to prison, right? Correct. You mentioned um, on that tape that if there was any justice in this damn world, Chad would be out. You remember saying that? To take care of Kai? Or excuse Maybe me, Casey? Maybe something that lines, yes. Okay. What did you mean by that? Just because of all the issues with the custody hearing, with the court system, um, never having any hearings in that, and... KC kind of takes after, after Chad. Okay. So if there was justice in the world, he'd be out to deal with that situation. Yes. Right? In the best way that he knows how, right? Correct. Okay. What do you think he would do to take care of that situation? Ob objection, Your Honor. I withdraw that. Thank you. I apologize.
Can we go to the Elmo? Little auto one here, okay. Showing you what's been marked as <clears throat> Defendant's Exhibit A, and I'm sorry this is a little bit. We'll start kind of with the top half. Do you know what that is? Looks like camo gear. Okay. Um, are you aware that that's, that's what Chad had on him, was wearing and had on him at the time that he killed Ashley? Um, I, no, I was not. Okay. Have you ever seen um, any of those items? And you can take a second and I can actually even give you the picture if you want. Can you recall ever seeing any of these items here in the top half of the picture? No. Okay. Do you recall this, this knife here, this diving knife? No, not really. You don't remember that? No. How about that taser? No. How about that flashlight? No. Did you ever do any work for, and I know you were a vet tech and you had some other jobs. Did you ever do any work for Cobb Cable Company? No. Okay. Um, but you knew that he had trucks and employees and a business, right? Yeah. Do you know any of the types of tools or equipment that he used to use in relation to his cable company? No. Okay. Did you ever see large three to four foot industrial zip ties? No. Okay. Do you know that those are relevant in this case? Just from bef what I've... What you've read, and I, I don't even want to get, okay. You're generally aware though. Yeah. Okay. Ms. Cobb, how did you feel when you first heard that your son was facing the death penalty? Devastated. Okay. And is that because the state was trying to kill him at that point, right? Correct. Okay. Were you relieved on some level that he just got life without parole and so at least he's alive on some level? Yes. Okay. Now, when your son went in, and I know you weren't there at this hearing, but you were at the sentencing and you saw the result of this decision that he made. But when your son went in and pled guilty to the charges in the indictment that he pled guilty to, that meant he was not going to have a trial, correct? Correct. Um, so if he had arguments that he wanted to raise, he wasn't going to be able to do that, correct? Correct. If he had witnesses he wanted to call in, to testify on his behalf, that was not gonna happen because there's no trial, right? Correct. If he himself wanted to profess his innocence from the witness stand and say, I didn't do this, he lost that ability when he pled guilty, correct? Correct. And that meant that the, the court could sentence him, including to a sentence of life without parole, right? Yes. So if you know why did he then start appealing right off, right off the bat? You would have to ask him. Okay.
Your Honor, may I have one moment? Yes, of course. Thank you. We, we established that the date of that tape was March 4th, 2014, correct? Yes. So given how you've described this tape and the alleged admissions on there, you, you, you turned that tape over on March 5th, 2014, right? Yes. You turned it over the next day? No, I'm sorry. I thought you said 18. Oh, I thought because of the importance of it, as, as you're saying it is, that you'd want to get it to law enforcement right away, right? I didn't realize what was all on there. I had a lot going on when I made the recording. Okay. Um, is, is part of the reason that you, you didn't know what was on there is because you guys were drinking a lot? No, sir. So if you weren't drinking a lot, how do you not know what's on there? It was just a lengthy conversation, dealing with the barn, just getting off from vacation when I relocated it and played it and realized what was on there, then I turned it over. How long, tell the jury how long you had exclusive dominion and control over this alleged tape? I think it was about four years. Four years? I believe so. So in four years, you never once called Detective Hitchens? No. In four years, you never once called the Wayne County Sheriff's Department, where you no. lived? Did you tell anybody about it? No. This was your little secret, right? I didn't realize it was a secret till I replayed it. In those four years, ma'am, is it fair to say that you had access to the equipment that made this recording? Yes. And you and you alone, correct? My husband lives with in the house. Your husband had access to it as well? Yeah, it was in the gun safe. And then four years later, you decided to turn it over, correct? We upgraded safes, and when we took stuff out of one and put in the other, I came across the tape recording. So this would be in 2018, correct? Yes. How many of Chad, P Chad Cobb's appeals had failed by 2018? I believe just the one. Was he still in prison serving a sentence of life without parole in 2018? Yes, sir. And you've testified that you've got hope that one day he'll get out, correct? Yes. And you've testified that you'll do anything within your power legally to help him with that, correct? Yes. And you've testified that you don't know what Chad's plan was the night that he killed Ashley Biggs, correct? That's correct. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Thank okay. you, Ms. Cobb. Let me redirect from the state. Okay. Dan DeRose with 19 News here. Uh, some tough questions for the mom of Chad Cobb. We're going to get some redirect okay, here. Which one did you want? She was asking if you wanted. Oh, I, gave yeah, it to your, you. I gave it to your co counsel. All right, Ms. Cobb, on cross-examination, you were asked multiple questions. Is that a fair statement? Yes, ma'am. One of those. Oh, cute dog. Yeah, can we keep that up there for a moment? Oh, the dog. <laughs> I don't know how to work your computer, so. Oh.
you were asked about and played a clip that you think that Chad snapped that night. Do you remember that on cross-examination? Yes. Okay. And I'll play it to the defense. I can just read it. Do you recall the defendant stating, I don't. The only reason I'm confused about that, I can totally see him snapping, but except for two reasons. One, I've seen him in a rage, totally furious, wanting to beat the crap out of somebody. And I've seen him be controlled enough to get just to that point where someone's at ankle would snap, but then not going any further with it, even being that angry. That, and then the fact that he talked to me originally in a totally different way right after it happened. So, so that, so I don't know which one it was, but it's a legitimate argument if he can get it that far. Do you remember that portion? Yes. That's funny, but the thing that made it hard for him to try to make his argument was the fact that it looked so premeditated. He, I, under, I never understood why the attorneys didn't try to push that it was a different premeditated crime. And that he never actually intended to kill her. And there are a couple different ways that he could have gone, they could have gone about that. Because you have to have the knowledge and the intent in order for the crime to be valid. If he didn't have those, either because he was out of his mind with rage or because something just went wrong, like he was just trying to get her to be quiet, he wasn't trying to kill her with his zip tie, he was trying to get her to be quiet. At, you know, if at any point, whatever Van Ho said, if at any point he was actually knew that his actions would end in her demise, then that the charge was right. But if he didn't know that, if he either was not cognizant of what he was doing, he was not aware of what he was doing, or if he didn't, wasn't aware that what he was doing would kill her, then it's a totally different charge. I don't see it as manslaughter, but it would be a different de different degree of murder. But I just, I don't see anything getting that <laughs> I, I think, I think he snapped. I don't, the re only reason I'm confused about that, I can totally see him snapping, but except for two reasons. One, I've seen him in a rage, totally furious, wanting to beat the crap out of somebody. And I've seen him be controlled enough to get it just to the point where someone's at ankle would snap, but then not going any further with it, even being that angry. But I that, and then the fact of, he told to me originally a totally different way, right after it happened. So that, so I don't know which one it was. But it's a legitimate argument if you can get it that far. Okay. And that fairly represents that conversation. Yes, ma'am. I played a little before, um, and that was Erica talking about what manslaughter is. Yes. Okay, and she went on about her knowledge about manslaughter. Is that a fair statement? Yes. And then when you said he snapped, she said, I did not, I don't think so. Correct. Okay. You were asked to, on cross-examination about the recording, and you had it for four years prior to turning it over. Now, I believe you said when the defendant called for this meeting, did you just come back from vacation? Yes. And you said your barn had flooded. Yes. No, I saw your, did that bring back bad memories? Yeah, a little oh. bit. Uh, did you have a lot on your plate at that time? Yes. Okay. So that was in your gun safe until you upgraded. Correct. At some point in time, you turned it over to Detective Hitching. As soon as I located it. And listen to it, yes. Okay. And Prosecutor LaPrenzi and Detective Hitchings, they've been on this case as the prosecutor and detective since the beginning. Is that a fair statement? Correct. Okay. And at the point in time that you were going to turn it over, um, and it is, you are his mother and you do want your son home one day. Is that correct? Correct. When you turned that tape over, was it made clear to you that nothing was going to be done for your son correct by the state correct were you given an opportunity and a chance to still turn it over or not correct yes okay. at that point in time when that was made clear to you did you still choose to turn that tape over yes i did oh i forgot the page at one point on cross-examination you were asked about and played a portion 
that Chad was giving up. You know, he was going to terminate his parental rights. Yes. Um, in that recording, your conversation, was it the defendant that encouraged him not to from that recording? Objection. I can find the part. My question was, from the conversation, the recording, from the conversation, was it the defendant who stated she encouraged him not to? Yes. That was my Objection. question. In basis? I don't, I don't know where she's talking about. I can. And she's also. Why don't you just replay the section? And That's fine. Let's do that. That's fine. So we'll strike the answer from the witness and we'll just okay. have uh, Attorney Easter find the section and play it. That's fine. I just have to find it, Your Honor. It's okay. Time frame is this attorney Easter? It is going to be a little before, but 152.15 is well. I was already there. I was there from the beginning. I, I knew what the situation was. I was like, given that this has happened, this is this is these are the courses of actions that, that can happen. And granted, one of them I should have looked out, but he was at the point where he was getting ready to be like, I can't help her. I'm just, I'm, I'll terminate my rights. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, whatever, whatever he thinks about, you know, me and what my relationship with Grace, you know, that could, I couldn't, I couldn't any more than he could say that that was okay. Not because he thinks I had this big thing with Ashley. Like, it's, 
big battle between who, who, you know, and granted we hated each other and there was definitely a rivalry, but it, it was, it was just knowing what she would become if they had her and what her life would be like. I can't stand there and be okay with it and say, this is my daughter. Um, my boss, her husband has well, one biological child and the father has raised you because he was do you have an objection? I do. Okay. Objection asked and answered or previously said. Go ahead. Do what your response? I wanted her to hear it was part of my question. Um, but I needed her to hear um, my question was the original question was when Ashley, when Chad said, I can't help her, I'm just I'll terminate my rights. Do you remember that it was the defendant who stated or who um, encouraged him to keep going. And then I started to read it, or I, and then the, there was an objection then, and that's when the defense said, I think the court or the defense said, play that portion, we can have it read back yeah, on the court report. Yeah, reading it. So we played it instead of reading right, it. Right, and that's what I'm doing now. You can use it on your redirect. Go ahead. Okay, I'm okay, that's what I'm doing. Right. Objection of Maybe. And the mother is a piece of crap. She's just an absolute piece. She actually is very much like what Ashley would have been that age. And now the daughter has picked up, at 15 years old, has picked up on all those habits in this the exact same way. And he, they tried to get custody of her over this past summer, which was a lot of fun for me at work while she was doing nothing but trying to work on that. And um, then she turned around and just totally backstabbed them because she didn't like the fact that there were rules. I had her mom come up after they had spent all this money and so forth. And she's like, she's just like her mom. There's nothing you can do for her at this point. And that would have been great. Now Grace has a chance at life. She has a chance at being a person with a life. And with Ashley, she would have, I don't see a chance for her to have been anything like but what Ashley was, because she was already picking up all the shit. Yeah. So I couldn't sit there and be like, oh, that's okay. Especially since I was the one like, we cannot continue to go through this because we had finally gotten, the thing that really makes it hard for me about Chad and I is we, granted, I didn't like the way that the situation was. It was still hard for me, but at least we got to a point where we could coexist. We had gotten to that point. And then when Ashley came and took Grace, it all fell apart. Like, the... the well, let me stop there. Um, and you heard the part where she said, so I couldn't sit there and be like, oh, that's okay. Did you hear that part that yes, was just played? Um, just one last question. That recording, did you alter it, tamper with it in any way? No, ma'am. The recording we hear today, the recording that's going to go back to the jury, is that the same tape recording that happened on March 4th, 2014? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And that is the recording you secretly recorded and the defendant did not know about it, correct? Correct. And it was a free flow of conversation back and forth. Is that a fair statement? Yes, ma'am. I have no further questions. Okay. Anything from defense? Just briefly. Ma'am, on, on redirect, Miss Easter asked you about um, a convert or, or a statement allegedly made by Erica about uh, manslaughter or things could be this, could be that, correct? Correct. Um, it, and I know this sounds silly, but this is a conversation that has occurred after Chad has killed Ashley, correct? Correct. This is this is a conversation that occurs after he's accepted full responsibility for it, correct? Correct. Um, and Erica is not an attorney, correct? Correct. Do you know if she's making accurate statements of the law as it relates to that conversation? I would not know that. Okay. You're not a lawyer either, correct? Correct. Okay. Did you have a mother-in-law? Yes. You did? Yes. Um, Jay's mother? Correct. Did you ever get the feeling that 
and this is not, I'm not trying to be insulting or anything like that, that maybe she didn't think you were good enough for her, Jay? No. You didn't? No. Did you ever have any uh, awkwardness or awkward conversations with your mother-in-law? No. Never? No. You guys got along fine? Yes, sir. Are you the exception? I'm not saying that in any way, shape, or form. Okay. Did you ever say things or do things in your relationship with your mother-in-law to placate her? No. Never? No. Good for you. Thank you, Your Honor. No further questions. Okay. Anything else from the state? No. no. Your Honor. Okay. At this time, we're going to take a break for lunch. Um, and you'll have your next witness. We're going to start back up at 1.15. Um, Ms. Cobb, you're free to go. Thank you for your testimony. Dan DeRose with 19 News here. As uh, we have committed to gavel to gavel coverage, we're going to stick with you. All right. We're going to stick with you through this lunch break. Uh, it'll take us to about uh, 1 15, 1 o'clock, 1 10 or so. Uh, but want to review a lot of what's happened in court this morning. And we knew this case would hinge on whatever this conversation was. Uh, we had been told in opening arguments uh, by the prosecution that they had this three hour taped, a three hour, well, it's not tape, it's a digital recorder, a three hour uh, recorded conversation between Cindy Cobb, that's Chad's mother, and I always like to put up the picture to make sure everybody can stay with this because it gets very confusing, very convoluted. You have Cindy Cobb who is having a conversation with Erica. At the time, she's Erica Cobb. Uh, you see Erica on the right there. Uh, in 2014, Chad has already been convicted. He's already been sentenced. And Chad has been sentenced and, uh, uh, to life in prison without the chance of parole for his role in the murder of Ashley Biggs. Chad and Ashley were going through what we've heard has been a nasty custody dispute. Uh, one in which Ashley had been in and out of the picture of young Grace. She was only seven years old at the time of the murder. Uh, when uh, Chad and Ashley had Grace, uh, Chad testified that uh, very early on, uh, Ashley would take off uh, and just disappear for weeks, days at a time and come back into the picture and want something to do with Grace's life. On one of those uh, apparent um, absences, when uh, Ashley was leaving, she signed over sole custody to Chad. And that was very early on in Grace's life. So years later, uh, Ashley comes back into the picture. Uh, and she tells Chad that she wants Grace back. Or actually, I don't even think uh, at this moment, and this is, we're talking in 2012, when she comes back, she doesn't uh, go to Chad like she normally would. And uh, from what Chad testified, when Ashley would come back into town from time to time, he would actually stay with Chad. And there was even a time uh, in 2012 when Chad and Erica were now together that Ashley would come back and stay with them or around them uh, and have something to do with Grace. But on this particular time back into town, uh, Ashley goes and files paperwork, a CPO, a child protective order, claiming that Chad was somehow harming Grace, which from every indication uh, that we've heard from both Erica in these recordings and Chad, uh, and even the defense attorneys have admitted that was a dirty trick. Uh, that Chad had done nothing wrong to Grace, but yet uh, the system is what the system is. When Ashley makes that complaint, she is able to get uh, an immediate um, uh, um, order to take custody of Grace. She, Ashley goes up to the school where Grace is uh, attending. She takes her out of school. So when Chad goes to pick her up that day, he doesn't even know what's going on. Uh, heads up there to pick her up and she's gone and finds out that uh, Ashley uh, went to school, had this CPO, and was able to take um, Grace out. So that sets the stage for this nasty back and forth. It does go to hearings. There are uh, proceedings into the custody. And that's what sets the stage 
for murder. And it is important to understand that Erica regarded Grace as her own, this child that's now in the middle of this dispute. Uh, she called Erica mom. Uh, we heard from her yesterday and we're gonna play some of her testimony uh, before we get to these phone calls. When we had Grace on the stand, talking about the good times and the bad times of living with Erica as a stepmom. And we're going to play this as it's going to set the stage for the murder. We're going to kind of go through everything we've heard so far, uh, just so that if you, this is your first day watching our gavel to gavel coverage, uh, that it sort of sets the stage. So here we are, Grace on the stand, talking about what it was like. Granted, she's 18 years of age now, uh, this is talking about when she was uh, a young girl uh, before first grade, because that's how old she was when the murder occurred in 2012. And so again, she's talking about the good, the bad, but not only was she seven years old at the time, this was 12 years ago. But so keep that in mind, as that's something the defense tries to poke holes in is her memory. Take a listen. Do you know how long he's there? Um, he's life with and in fact, I need to set this up. Um, uh, they were asking Grace if she was testifying because somehow it would get her dad out of prison. They asked her right away, uh, do you know where your dad is? She obviously knows he's in prison. Uh, and they ask if she knows how long he'll be there. Do you know how long he's there? Um, he's life without parole. What does that mean? Um, like he's there for life, um, but potentially like no chance of parole. Okay. Um, means he's never Not getting, getting out. out. Yes. Okay. Uh, do you go see your dad or do you talk to your dad? I do. How often do you go see your dad? Um, I haven't seen him in a while um, since all of this picked up, but I would go and visit him in person twice a month. Um, and then we usually did like a phone call maybe once a week, once every other week. Okay. Is there a schedule you try to adhere to twice a month or you just try to get in twice a month? Um, we usually just do tw twice a month, so like every other week. How long have you been doing that? Um, I've been doing that since like 2018, maybe. I can't exactly remember the first date I saw him in person. Okay. I'm going to interject here because I'm assuming most of us have seen this already. I want you to pay attention to Erica during the majority of this trial, especially when Grace starts to describe her relationship with Erica and calling her mom. It's really one of the only times we see Erica tear up. And sometimes I'll drive myself. Okay. And you said you um, talk to him on the phone? Yes. Okay. Do you ever text him or write him letters? Yes. How often would you say you do that? Um, that I would usually do maybe once a week. I do like the, like through like the texting email more than I would write. And when you go see him, what are some of the topics that you all talk about? Um, talk about work, like my home life, what's like happening. Okay. Event wise. Talk about your boyfriend with your father. <laughs> yeah. Do you miss your father? I do. Do you hope one day, even though you just described to the jury that he's there with life without parole, mm -hmm. and you said you know what life without parole means, mm -hmm. do you hope one day that maybe he'll come home? I hope so, yes. Okay. Do you realize that your testimony today or nothing you say today um, will make that happen as far as the state making it happen? Yes. Okay. And have you been told that by the state? Mm -hmm. And you still agreed to come in and testify? Yes. Okay. Why is that? Um, because Erica had a role in my mother's death and she just walked away from it and I don't think that's right. And to be fair, you were subpoenaed to come in and testify. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. You didn't come looking for the state or anything? Mm -hmm. Have you, and we're going to get to that, you said the name Erica, have you talked to Erica, um, I believe back then, Cobb, um, since that time, no. since June of 2012? Mm -mm. No. 
Okay. So let's talk about your dad, um, not on the subject of where he is, but uh, you living with him. Do you remember some of the places that you live with your father? Um, I just remember the one on East Eastern Road okay. or Eaton Road. Okay. When you lived there with your, your dad, who all lived there with you? It was um, me, my dad, Erica, FC, Casey, um, A, AL. Is he the same age as you? He's he's a few months older. You can say his name. Okay, Alexander he, Lyon. Oh. And who's Alexander Lyon? He is um, Erica and a previous relationships. Um, it's Erica's son. Okay, so Chad is not um, Alexander's father. No, he's not. Okay. Um, when you grew up in the household, did you and Alexander interact like you were brother and sister? Yes. At some point in time, did you all go to the same school? Yes, we did. And what school would that have been? That was Chippewa. And we graduated together as well. Okay. Were you ever in the same classes or participate in the same sports or extracurricular activities? Um, we would have um, similar classes here and there, but it wasn't all the time. It okay. wasn't all of our classes. And how would you describe um, the household with the children? Um, what was your perception of living in that household? Um, I'd say it was, with me and Erica personally, there was, there was good and bad, um, but all of us together, um, it, was, it was good. Okay. Well, let's talk about um, Erica. Um, and what did you know her last name as? It was Cobb, I okay, that I knew it as when, they, when my father and her were married. Okay, so if I say Erica Stefanko, would you know who that individual is? Yes. Do you see that individual in the courtroom today? Yes. Will you please point to Erica Stefanko and describe for the court what she's wearing? Um, she's wearing a, um, a knit sweater and a blue shirt. Your Honor, will you please let the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant? Yes, so reflected. Thank you. Um, so when we talk about it, Erica Cobb, Erica Stefanko, mm -hmm. we're on the same page as the defendant sitting in court today. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. Um, now, how do you know the defendant? Um, she was married to my father. And I mean, I grew up with her when I was at my father's house. When you grew up with um, the defendant, what did you call her? I'm mom. I call her mom. Okay. And... You said you have good and, and bad memories um, mm -hmm. of being with the defendant. What are some of the good memories? Um, some of the good, we like we would have my like school dances. Um, There's this one time we got like the same dress. It was pink and pink and white polka dot. Um, and like I remember going with her and getting it tailored. Um, I remember she she would really like to watch NCIS. She watched that. Um, Sometimes we would just like hang out. Okay. Things that a mother and a daughter would mm -hmm. do. Yeah. What are some of the bad memories growing up? Um, some of the bad, um, she was abusive, uh, very controlling. Okay. Was there an incident where you believed you were eating dog feces? Yes. Please tell the jury about that. Um, so I don't remember the exact date or time, but there was an incident where Erica had put dog feces, it was in blueberry yogurt and told me to eat it. And I noticed that that was in there. And I, I mean, I haven't ever liked blueberry yogurt since then. Um, but that's something to say, dog feces. So I have to ask the follow up question. How did you know it was dog feces? Um, it looked like it, smelled like it. Obviously I hadn't ever had it before, but once she forced me to eat it, I kind of knew okay. what it was. Did you all have any animals or pets at that time? We did, we had German Shepherds and one Mastiff. Okay. What was your reaction? What was your demeanor? What was going on with you at that time? Um, I was like scared, nervous, I was crying. I didn't understand why it was happening. You had stated that the defendant was mentally and, and physically abusive. Um, and you gave an example about when you believed you were eating dog feces. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Um, were there other times she was physically abusive? Yes. Will you please describe that to the jury? Um, Erica was uh, physically abusive. Um, sometimes she would just hit me. Um, 
I'd have bruises all over me. Um, I remember one time she was very upset. Um, she had me like pinned to the floor. Um, one of her knees was like on my chest and um, I can't remember she had her hands around my throat or my mouth, but like I couldn't really breathe and I was crying. And she would tell me like in these circumstances, if I would tell my dad um, what she was doing to me, then she would do worse. So I just, I never told my dad about what was going on. That was some very test, uh, very hard testimony to listen to. That is Grace. She is the daughter of Chad and Ashley. She was the center of this custody dispute uh, when things got ugly. She would be questioned about her memory. On the stand, she's 18. At the time of the crime, she's seven. Uh, so some of these allegations of abuse are when she's even younger than she was seven. So questions of her memory. She's asked about what she remembered the night of the murder. And she talks about um, how she was asleep in the SUV. Uh, all four kids were all through every part of this murder. They may not have seen it, uh, but they were being driven around from location to location as it's all happening. Um, and she talks about what she remembers hearing when she wakes up. Uh, but then I uh, thought it was interesting when you hear the cross examination, they uh, and it's uh, the defense attorney. I can't remember her name. Forgive me, but she is questioning Grace pretty hard about what else she remembers that day. She can't even remember how many rows of seats there are in that Lincoln Navigator, but somehow remembers uh, this phone call. And why is this significant is because and there were a lot of objections and sidebars, one in which the jury had to be dismissed. Uh, because you have to question now that this is a retrial. She has already been through this trial. She was on TV. Uh, the child, Grace, was on TV after the first conviction of Erica. She was on court TV. She was interviewed. Uh, so is it that she truly remembers or is that she remembers hearing from the previous trial or from reading or from being on court TV. It's it's a very difficult situation. And the reason they have to be careful is because you can't let the jury know that this is a retrial. You can't ask uh, the child this. You can't ask Grace. Well, do you only remember this because you were on TV after the first conviction? Because you can't let the jury know this is a retrial. They have to think that this is square one. So now here is um, questioning of Grace's memory since she was just seven years old at the time. The night of my mother's death, I remember um, I, I remember waking up and I was in a vehicle. I don't know what vehicle it was. I was just in the back of it. Um, I remember it was dark outside and I can't remember if Erica was in the, f the driver or the passenger, but I remember she was in the front seat. Um, and I don't know if that was the same, like, the exact same time that I heard her make the phone call, if it was like a few minutes, like falling asleep, waking back up. Um, but I remember Erica making the phone call. It was her voice and she used a different name to order. And I remember it was a pizza, but I don't remember um, what she ordered on it. And I want to jump in there real quick. I remember Erica making the phone call. It was her voice. Why would why would you need to say that? Um, and part of this goes back to you have to remember the Cobb family and they call the, 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 the prosecution is calling them Team Cobb. Clearly, they've talked about this case. Clearly, as Grace is growing up, there have been conversations uh, aside from just the coverage. One of the key pieces of evidence here, and we're going to hear that in a little bit, is the Domino's general manager, the, the employee who takes the phone call for that pizza delivery that's going to lead Ashley to her death. The, the manager says, when I took a call, it was a woman's voice. And so I just thought that it was very strange to have Grace now say, I heard Erica call, it was her voice. That just struck me as odd during her testimony. Why wouldn't you just say, uh, I heard Erica making the call. She ordered a pizza. She did this. So let's listen to that again. And uh, I promise I won't interrupt. The night of my mother's death, I remember um, I, 
I remember waking up and I was in a vehicle. I don't know what vehicle it was. I was just in the back of it. Um, I remember it was dark outside and I can't remember if Erica was in the, f the driver or the passenger, but I remember she was in the front seat. Um, and I don't know if that was the same, like the exact same time that I heard her make the phone call, if it was like a few minutes, like falling asleep, waking back up. Um, but I remember Erica making the phone call. It was her voice and she used a different name to order. And I remember it was a pizza, but I don't remember um, what she ordered on it. Um, and at that time, I didn't really, I guess I didn't really think anything like of why she was using a different name. Obviously it's odd, but I just, um, that's what I remember. Tell me the last thing that you remember from June 20th of 2012. Um, like I said, I don't remember if hearing the phone call was um, the same time I had woken up and kind of looked around um, or if it was like before or after. Well, I just mean that entire day. Do you remember anything throughout the course of that day? Because you said that you were in this vehicle. You remember being in a vehicle after dark, correct? Yes. Okay, so do you remember what time you got up that day? No. Do you remember what the weather was like that day? No. Do you remember if you did anything with your friends that day? No. Do you remember doing anything with your dad that day? No. Do you remember what time you would have gone to bed that day? No. Do you remember driving anywhere that night? No, I don't remember. I don't remember if the vehicle was moving or not. Okay. You don't remember what type of a vehicle it was, correct? Correct. You don't remember how many rows of seats were in that vehicle, correct? Correct. You don't remember which row you were in, just the back, correct? Correct. Okay. You don't remember which seat of the vehicle Erica was in? Correct. It was it was one of the front seats, but I can't remember which. One of the front seats, but you don't remember which? Okay, if I told you that in a prior proceeding that you said she was in the passenger seat, would that sound accurate to you? Yeah, that could be accurate. Okay. And if I told you that your dad has said that Erica was driving... Objection. Basis? She's impeaching with someone else's testimony. I can ask her if she'd... Okay, I can rephrase it, Your Honor. Okay. Would you be surprised if your father has given a sworn statement that she was the driver? Objection, Your Honor. Sidebar. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, just came back to where we were. Grace, would, would it surprise you if I told you that your father has stated that Erica was in the driver's seat that night? I mean, I'm not, I'm not surprised. I don't. Okay. Would it, okay, well, let me back up here. You said that you, you heard a phone call, but regardless of which seat she's in, she's in the vehicle, correct? Yes. Yes, she's in the vehicle with you. Yes. Okay. So if your father said that she was not in the vehicle, um, who do you think is more accurate? Well, Objection, be... Your Honor. Sustained. You can be in a vehicle. That, and means, out of that the... means that means you don't answer. I'm oh, sorry. sorry. That's okay. Go to your next question. <laughs> okay. After you say that you had heard a phone call being made by Erica, can you, well, you know what, let's, let's talk a little further detail of that. Did you see it or just hear it? I heard it. Okay, so you couldn't physically see where she was? At that, during the phone call, like I said, I don't remember if that's when I saw her in the vehicle or if that was at a separate amount of time. Okay. If I told you that you have previously testified that she was inside the vehicle, would you disagree with me? No, like I said, she's in a vehicle. <clears throat> Did you see the phone? No, I don't remember. Okay. Seeing. After a pizza was ordered, do you recall that phone ringing? I don't remember, no. Okay, so... Do you have any recollection of there being a second telephone conversation that night? No. No. Do you know how long you were awake? 
when you say you heard this? Um, I'd say a short amount of time. I just remember just kind of hearing it. And if I'm understanding correctly, what your testimony was on direct, basically from that time forward, you don't remember anything else? After that? Correct. Correct. Okay. And you remember waking up at your great-grandma's house the next day, correct? Yes. Okay. And you know the prosecutor was asking if you remembered seeing any police at the house that day. I think you said one came to the door. Is that correct? Yes. All right. What, what did you do the rest of that day? Um... I don't remember what I did the rest of that day. Okay. Do you, do you remember when you went to stay with your grandparents? What day it was after that? No, I don't. I just, I remember when I went with them, it was before my eighth birthday. Okay. And your eighth birthday would have been the next month? Is that um, right? Yeah, I would have been in July. So some real questions of memory for one of only three people that can attest to what happened that night. You have Chad Cobb, who testified, who said Erica, and I remember very clearly, Erica was outside the SUV when he saw her make the call. And I remember that because he was asked, what was the look on Erica's face when she made that pizza delivery call? And Chad said she was smiling. That gives you a little bit of an indication, perhaps, um, but again, you're talking about somebody that may have an ax to grind, uh, somebody whose best friend had impregnated his wife uh, as this crime was being committed. Or not as, but you know what I mean. In the time period, they were having an affair at that exact same time. Uh, let's move on now to why this phone call is so important. Because as we heard in opening arguments in the state of Ohio, it is called complicity. Uh, complicity is mean, meaning you were complicit, you were involved, you had something to do with it, and you can't claim ignorance. Uh, we keep giving this example, we'll give it again. Uh, this is an example that was used by our defense analyst, Jared Klebenow. If you and a friend are going to commit a bank robbery and you are going to be the getaway driver and you sit outside the bank, you can't throw your hands up and say, I had nothing to do with this bank robbery. He's the one that went in. He's the one that had the gun. Uh, so I'm innocent. No, you knew what the plan was. You went along with the plan. You drove the bank robber there. And so anything that happens inside that bank, whether the bank robber uses a weapon and hurts someone or kills someone, you are complicit. Uh, Jared Klebenow said uh, the only way it doesn't work is if it's just you and your friend are driving down the street, you're sitting at a stoplight, that friend jumps out and goes in, robs the bank and runs back to the car. That would be the only way you could claim you were not complicit because you didn't know he was going to go rogue and run into that bank and rob the bank. That's the only way. So for someone to place a phone call to Domino's to lure you there, that is pretty damning. We're now going to play the phone call or the testimony uh, from Matt Travis. Matt Travis was the general manager of Domino's. He was working that night. It was just him and Ashley. Ashley was his delivery driver. And he takes the phone call for a pizza delivery at about 1149 that night. They were closing at midnight. This was going to be the last run. And you can see this still weighs on Mr. Travis's mind uh, because he's going to talk about he almost went with Ashley on this delivery. Keep in mind how that may have changed things. Would that have saved Ashley's life? Would, uh, would Chad Cobb have seen there were two people in the car and decided not to do anything? Or perhaps would he have become uh, victim number two in this? Uh, Matt Travis uh, currently lives in South Carolina, had to be brought up here for his testimony. And again, he was friends with Ashley. He wasn't just his boss. He was friends with Ashley and her girlfriend, Brittany Dunson. They had gone camping together. They had been on trips together. They hung out together. Uh, so this wasn't just an employee who was killed. This was a friend. Take a listen to his testimony from just the other day. So that night, um, did you get a phone call for a delivery when you and Ashley were just there? I would guess. Approximately what time was that order or that phone call? It was before midnight. Okay. 
And will you please tell the jurors about that order or that phone call? Um, okay, so um, a female caller, uh, I believe the name was Jennifer that she gave me in the phone number, um, had ordered a pizza. I took the address and she asked it for it to be delivered to the back door. Um, and I took the order and then I called it back to make sure. They answered the phone and said, yeah, we're here and continued on. Okay. Now you said a lot. Um, so that call came in before midnight, you said. Yep. Okay. And you said they gave a name. Yep. Okay. I want to say it was Jennifer. Okay. And you said it was a female. It was a female. How do you know it was a female? It sounded like a female on the phone. Okay. It had a female voice. Yes, it did. Okay. And you said you called the number back. I did. Why? Because it was a new customer. Okay. And how can you tell if somebody's a new customer or not? It shows me on my computer. Okay. Was it, if I say that phone call came in at approximately 11.42 p.m., do you have any reason to think otherwise? No. Okay. Up to this point in time, um, how was the night? Was there anything unusual? No. Okay. Typical. Was that call unusual? No. Typical normal. Okay. So when that call um, came in, pizza done, Ashley was going to go deliver the pizza? Yes. Okay. Um, I didn't have no other drivers. She had to take it. Okay. Were you going to go with her? I was going to go with her, yes. I was going to lock up the shop and go with her. Um, I do that a lot, just training and just to know that my crew was doing what I wanted them to do. Okay. Um, to spot check, make sure everything was going fine. Okay. Has she delivered pizzas at this late at night before? Absolutely. Later, that, actually. I do believe on the weekends we're open an hour later. Okay. And everything was fine? Everything seemed normal. Well, you said you were going to go. What stopped you? She did. Why? She wanted me to stay and start cleaning. Okay. She's got She's got this. She told me that the, the delivery is right up the road. She'll be right back like 10, 15 minutes tops. Was the delivery right up the road? It was. Okay. If I say 647 West Turkey Foot Lake Road, does that ring a bell? Yes. Is that where the delivery was going to? Yes. Okay. And that was right up the road from uh, yes. the Domino's? Okay. Did you stay and continue to clean? I did for a short period of time. Um, and why Why did that make such a big deal to Ashley for you to stay and continue to clean? She wanted to go home. Oh, you all, even her, you all couldn't go home until the shop was closed. That's correct. Okay. Do you remember, do you know what type of car Ashley drove? Ford Taurus. What color? Gray. All right, so now you're at Domino's Pizza Cleaning and Ashley is making that delivery. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. What happens next? She don't return in a timely manner. I lock up the shop, but I go try to find her. When you say a timely manner, how much time do you think passed before you started getting worried? 15, 20 minutes. And according to you, that would have been ample time for her to go, drop the pizza off, and come back? Absolutely. She was my best driver. She is quick. Okay. You say you lock up the... Thank you. Okay. At any time before you lock up and, and just going out there, did you try to call her? Several times. Did she answer? No. And you had her number? On speed dial. All right. So you lock up and try to go find her. Tell the jury what happens. I went to that. I went to where she was supposed to be delivering the pizza. I pulled into the parking lot. I seen a puddle of blood. I turned around and I called the police. Did you get out your car? No, no. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Did you see any other cars around? I did not. The place was completely black. And when you say black, is that the night, dark no, out? No lights, no outside lights. It was dark. And you were able to see blood on the ground? With my headlights, because, like I said, oh. it was asked to be delivered to the back door. There's a little road that goes to the backside 
and I didn't even pull back that far. Okay. You did not get out your car, and upon seeing that, you said you went back to the shop. I was calling the police on the way back. Okay. You make it back to the shop. Did the police come? Yep. Tell the jurors what happened after the police came. Summit County Sheriff's were the first one to arrive. I told them what was going on. I called Brittany Dunson and asked if she heard from her. And she told me no. I actually woke her up. She was sleeping. And I told her what was going on. And Brittany immediately got up and came to Domino's and met me there. Okay. At that point, Brittany Dunson started talking to the officers about the custody battle and about Chad. Okay. All right. But And all of this happened at Domino's. They came to Domino's. The, the police came to Domino's. Brittany Dunson came to Domino's. Domino's on South Main Street. Did anyone try to call the number that called the pizza back? I did. I said pizza back. Several times. to order the pizza. Okay. Several when times. did you try to do that? I called Ashley a good couple times first, and then I called that number a couple times, and I kept calling Ashley. Did you provide that number to the police? Absolutely. Do you I, know? I gave the police information from the the delivery, the delivery stickers, as much as I could possibly give them. Okay, I'm gonna um, show you some exhibits. I'm going to show you what's been marked as state's exhibit number 43. That's Ashley's car. And that's the gray, what kind of car is it? Ford Taurus. That's the gray Ford Taurus that she left out from the store delivering the pizza? Dan DeRose with 19 News, uh, very emotional for Matt Travis, uh, having to see that uh, f that car again go through that night again uh, as the night that his friend Ashley Biggs was murdered. Uh, the reason that phone call is so important again is because of complicity. Who placed that phone call? And you start to talk about a plan. <clears throat> that was a big topic of the conversation in the conversation recorded between uh, Cindy Cobb and Erica. She was Erica Cobb at the time. She would later marry Mike Stefanko. Uh, she was having a conversation and you can really, uh, we listened to all, all of it. And if you're about to listen to this at home, if you have headphones that you can put on or earbuds that you can put in to help you hear this a little bit better, uh, it's not the greatest of qualities. It was recorded back in 2014 and you really hear Erica trying to plead with Chad's mom. She keeps saying that Chad is getting upset. He is in prison. He is putting ultimatums on Erica about going to police and telling him everything, telling him about her role in all of this, excuse me, all of this. And it's uh, making Erica uneasy. So she goes to talk to Chad's mom, Cindy, and it's clear that she is trying to get Cindy to then maybe turn and talk to Chad and talk him off of this wall. Because if she goes to prison, nobody gets to see the children. They will be put into the foster care system and uh, be sent away. So listen now to the recorded conversation between Cindy Cobb and Erica. Really the first part of this uh, talking about the ultimatum, the threats that Chad are making, that Chad is making, and and she really starts to tip her hand as to what role she had in this, 
and we'll get to more about making the call in just a minute. And in fact, that's the reason Cindy recorded this conversation because Erica had previously told her when it was just the two of them that she made the call to the pizza place. And Cindy Cobb never went to the authorities with that because she said it was my word versus hers. And who are police going to believe? I'm Chad's mom and it's going to look like I'm trying to make Erica out to be the bad guy. So she never went to police. So here she is about to have this conversation and she has the presence of mind to get a digital recorder out and record this conversation. First, here is the discussion about Erica talking about Chad saying he's going to tell the authorities everything. Was that a fair and accurate recording of the conversation you had? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, what was your understanding um, of that portion of the conversation? Just about the ultimatums? Objection. Sustained. You're having a conversation with the defendant. What do you, Cindy Cobb, think you're talking about at that time during that portion of the conversation. Objection. Basis. The same reason, Judge. Well, she's inquiring into her thoughts. Speculating into the defendant's. Nope. I just want to know what she thinks. It's two people in a conversation, Your Honor. I want to know what she thinks the conversation is about. Yeah, overruled. I'll hear the answer. Um, it's about Chad having evidently ultimatums in Erica's part. <clears throat> In it, and she's not wanting that held over her head, but I mean, she's also stating that she had a part in Ashley's death. The next portion, Your Honor, or ladies and gentlemen, is one hour, 43 minutes, 36 seconds, to one hour, 45 minutes, and 24 seconds. a fair and accurate recording of the conversation you had? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. The next portion is one minute, 43, one hour, 43 seconds, 36 minutes to one hour, 45 minutes, 24 seconds, Your Honor. 
Isn't that what we just heard? Number nine. Oh. There in the audience, you see Ashley Biggs' mother. One hour, 50 minutes, seven seconds. One hour, 54 minutes, 43 seconds. Okay, thank you. My, my intention is not to make things harder for him. I'm trying to work with him. But the worst thing he could do is try to put something like that over my head because it's already over my head already. And do I feel bad about what happened to her? Not really. Do I, have, do I feel bad about what happened to everybody else? Absolutely. Could I take it back if I could? Yes, I would. Why well, ask yeah, so would he? Well, I mean, I don't think there's any question about that. <laughs> These are the courses of action that could happen, and granted, I should have left one out. What is she implying? She is implying that she gave Chad a list of options on how they could get Grace back from Ashley Biggs. And she'll go on to say, I believe in this next clip, or at least one of these clips that we're going to play for you, she talks about how, uh, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, this is when this is Erica talking to Chad before the crime is committed. She said, you know what you can do and what you can't. She's implying, do you have the stomach to commit this crime? So you know what you can do and what you can't. We've been over it so many times. This is the only way this problem goes away. Now tell me with a statement like that, how are you, how is a jury not supposed to believe that you had a hand in at least the planning or the discussion of what was going to happen that night? Let's get to the uh, next portion of this, uh, the conversation between Chad's mom and Erica about who was responsible and did it take two of you to get this to be pulled off. Remember, somebody had to drop Chad off in that parking lot and then drive away so that it was just Chad when Ashley showed up. Then somebody had to follow Chad out to Wayne County in the middle of nowhere when he dumped the car and the body into a cornfield to give him a ride home. So think about that when we hear about this next portion of the conversation, again, recorded by Chad's mom back in 2014. And again, just to give you a heads up on this, why did this come to light so much later? We heard Chad's mom say she made the recording in 2014. She didn't really think anything of it. She put it in their gun safe. And it wasn't until 2018 when they got a new gun safe that she pulled it out, listened to it again, and thought she better turn it over to authorities.
determination as to whether he was capable to do something that we should, I should have had the good sense to know you just don't ever try to do. I should have had the good sense of trying to do something you should never do. I threw the ball back in Chad's court. I asked him if he thought he could do this, if he could go through with it. Uh, as a defense attorney, I, I, I really don't understand uh, how you rebound from something like this, a conversation like this, where she is saying over and over again, we went over it so many times. And if there's something you can do or you can't do, uh, this is an issue. Uh, and it just is pretty incredible. Now let's get to the part of the phone call. Even if, if you believe that everything she's saying to Chad's mom is speculative and she never, she never comes right out and said, okay, we're going to go at 11 o'clock and we're going to go to parking lot A and then we're going to go to parking lot B and then we're going to make the phone. She doesn't ever spell everything out. So if you're a person that's sitting on the jury and say, well, wait a second, she's saying a lot of things in that video or in that conversation in that recording, but she never says we're going to use zip ties. She never says uh, we're going to put her body in the car and take her out to the middle of nowhere. That's great. That's great. Then the piece of evidence for you might be, well, who made the phone call to lure Ashley to that parking lot, uh, to that uh, business where she was murdered? Uh, so here is uh, Erica telling uh, Chad's mom, and he's, she's going to bring it up. Cindy is going to bring it up. Well, before you, you said something about uh, the phone call, and you're going to hear Erica say everything right there in the recording about placing that call. Take a listen. One time, I mean, you told me face to face that you made the phone call and you set the meeting up. I mean, that, that there, I, you had told me, and there's no lie in that. that like I said, if we were, if we, if chat. There's no lie in that. The, uh, Cindy said, at one point you told me face to face that you made the call, you set the meeting up. There's no lie in that. That's exactly what she just said. We're going to listen to it again. But wow, um, if I'm a jury member and I hear somebody say that, yep, there's no lie that I set up the meeting, I'm not sure how you come back from that. I, uh, there, and I had said it when we took a break between uh, our morning break, between when these conversations were played and before cross-examination was played, I said, if you're the defense, you better hope there is a portion of that three hour uh, conversation that the state didn't play where she says five times, but again, I didn't do it. Uh, but again, we're just talking hypothetically. But again, I'm innocent. I had nothing to do with this. We got none of that. Uh, we heard none of that throughout this entire conversation. Listen again, as you hear Cindy say at one point in time, we had a conversation face to face and you told me you made the phone call, you set up the meeting. Take a listen. One time, I mean, you told me face to face that you made the phone call and you set the meeting up. I mean, that, that air, I, you had told me, and there's no lie in that. that. Like I said, if we were, if we, if Chad, Chad said this is what we're going to do and this is your part in it and I carry out my part in it, I did exactly what he told me to do. And it wasn't because he was forcing me to do it or like he had a gun to my head. It was because he said this is your part. Is that a fair and accurate representation of the recording on March 2014? Yes, ma'am. Okay, during that portion of the recording, you stated at one time you told me face to face that you made the phone call and that you set up the meeting. The meeting? Um, I mean, and that you had told me, um, and Ms. Lyons said, the defendant, there's no lie in that. Um, what were you talking about? At that point in time, what was your conversation about? What phone call and what meeting? The phone call to order the pizza and have it delivered. Wow. Wow. It's it's almost so unbelievable that you have her admitting this. And I've said this from really uh, as we started into this trial. Um, if these two planned this out, this was one of the worst 
plans I've ever heard of. I've covered numerous trials. Uh, the missteps, the miscalculations, the handling of evidence between these two. We're talking Chad and Erica that night. Uh, nobody ever said criminals were smart, but these two uh, are, are clearly on the other side of that, that explanation. Here is, uh, this is evidence that was submitted yesterday. When BCI arrives to the house the very next day uh, of Chad and, and Erica, we know that the crime was committed. They drove the body out to the middle of nowhere. They went back to their house because Chad was covered in blood. He testified that he took off all his clothes right there by a sawhorse or a work table, and he left it there in the yard, went in and took a shower. After they took a shower, they went back to the crime scene because they thought we better get her phone and we better get the scene cleaned up. Well, this is four hours later. The police are already there. That's dumb. Uh, they then go hide out at his grandmother's house, which was in very close proximity to the crime scene, and that's where they're caught and arrested within hours of the actual crime. And so now you have BCI. They find the car that morning because a very astute person, uh, a neighbor out in that cornfield, saw the car and called police. Uh, then BCI goes to their home. Take a look at this. These are pictures. When BCI show up, there's Chad's cable work truck. There's the burn pit. They didn't find anything in the burn pit. Take a look at that table in the background. Oh, by the way, here's the camouflage backpack. Here's the stun gun. Here's his muddy boots. There's his bloody t-shirt on the ground. There are the zip ties. You see those really long gray industrial zip ties. There's the stun gun. There is a knife. Uh, all of it was just left right there. In fact, the BCI agent who was taking these pictures said, uh, you know, from time to time, this gentleman right here, when, when we go to these crime scenes, sometimes we find a treasure trove of evidence. And there are the zip ties that were on that table. You can see these are not just your run-of-the-mill zip ties. Uh, and it is one of those. I've seen the picture, unfortunately, of Ashley dead in the back of that car with the zip tie around her neck. It does appear to match. Uh, and... This is an extra unspent cartridge. This is the, in fact, that was the stun gun that Chad used. Uh, there was another cartridge. There were actually two more cartridges uh, that Chad didn't use that could go on the front of that. Uh, but again, it is just this uh, information of uh, that Cindy had this recording. She held on to it for four years, and I believe I have a cross-examination that I want to play here as they ask Cindy a couple of questions here. Let me double check my sources here. Uh, yeah, here we go. And we'll get this in the system. Uh, they try to poke holes in Cindy's story. You're the defense. You have to try and find some way that this damning piece of evidence you can poke a hole in, or at least poke a hole in the person uh, who uh, recorded that or had that piece of tape. So we're going to listen uh, to the cross-examination. Let me find it here, and it's right here. This is the cross-examination of Cindy Cobb. And again, as a defense attorney, you have to be very careful. Uh, you can't push so hard that the jury sees you being a jerk to this uh, witness, uh, but you do have to try and give some doubt uh, to the jury. Take a listen. Given how you've described this tape and the alleged admissions on there, you, you, you turned that tape over on March 5th, 2014, right? Yes. You turned it over the next day? No, I'm sorry. I thought you said 18. Oh, I thought because of the importance of it, as, as you're saying it is, that you'd want to get it to law enforcement right away, right? I didn't realize what was all on there. I had a lot going on when I made the recording. Okay. Um, is, is part of the reason that you, you didn't know what was on there is because you guys were drinking a lot? No, sir. So if you weren't drinking a lot, how do you not know what's on there? It was just a lengthy conversation, dealing with the barn, just getting off from vacation. When I relocated it and played it, and realized what was on there, then I turned it over. How long, tell the jury how long you had exclusive dominion and control over this alleged tape? I think it was about four years. Four years? 
I believe so. So in four years, you never once called Detective Hitchens? No. In four years, you never once called the Wayne County Sheriff's Department where you no. lived? Did you tell anybody about it? No. This was your little secret, right? I didn't realize it was a secret till I replayed it. In those four years, ma'am, is it fair to say that you had access to the equipment that made this recording? Yes. You and you alone, correct? My husband lives with in the house. Your husband had access to it as well? Yeah, it was in the gun safe. And then four years later, you decided to turn it over, correct? We upgraded safes, and when we took stuff out of one and put in the other, I came across the tape recording. So this would be in 2018, correct? Yes. How many of Chad, P Chad Cobb's appeals had failed by 2018? I believe just the one. Was he still in prison serving a sentence of life without parole in 2018? Yes, sir. And you've testified that you've got hope that one day he'll get out, correct? Yes. And you've testified that you'll do anything within your power legally to help him with that, correct? Yes. And you've testified that you don't know what Chad's plan was the night that he killed Ashley Biggs, correct? That's correct. And that was the end of the cross-examination. Now, uh, in redirect, uh, the state got back up there and made it very clear to the jury by asking Cindy Cobb, when you came forward with this recording and you came to talk to the detective and the prosecutor, they told her before they even accepted it, they said, you giving us this will not get Chad out of prison. Was that correct? And she said, yes. And, and the, the, the state said, but you chose to give it to him anyway. And she said, yes. I thought a great follow-up question would have been, why did you decide to give it to detectives even though this can't get your son out of court? And we would have heard the line that we've heard a couple of times. We heard it from Grace. Uh, we had heard it uh, once even out of the mouth of Erica in that conversation, this idea of walking away scot-free. Uh, uh, it was Grace, the daughter of Chad, who said, uh, Erica played a role in this and she simply got to walk away from it and I don't think that's right. She, that was her answer when they asked her why she decided to testify uh, against Erica, somebody that she called mom at one point in time and she said because I think she played a role in this and she got to walk away and I don't think that was right. Uh, so here we are, we should be coming up on the end of our lunch break. Uh, that'll be very soon. Uh, and. We'll see who the state calls next. Uh, just based on my coverage of court in the past, uh, we still haven't heard from a medical examiner. Uh, somebody has to say exactly uh, how Ashley died, and it can get graphic, it'll be gruesome, but perhaps uh, from a strategic standpoint, that's what you want to leave the jury with before the defense takes over their side of the case. Maybe you want this, uh, again, we've heard from Jared Klebin, our defense analyst, uh, who said uh, you, you want to leave a lasting impression, you want to show that this was a human being, although when we hear from coroners, it's very clinical, uh, but think about the pictures uh, that the jury has already seen. I've seen several of them. Uh, they are graphic to say the least. There was an, an immense amount of uh, injury to Ashley's body, regardless of the zip tie around her neck. Um, and it's going to show all of that. Again, it is the zip tie around her neck that caused her murder, that ultimately was her cause of death. Uh, but there was a large fight and a large struggle that happened even before she died. And so there will be reference to, references to perhaps broken bones, uh, contusions, cuts, 
on various parts of her body. She was hit with a taser uh, before the fight started. Uh, and so we expect uh, to hear all of that. So is uh, the state has to be pretty close to wrapping up their case. Uh, uh, Cindy Cobb, in my opinion, from that recorded conversation, uh, that was is the biggest smoking gun that they have against Erica Stefanko in all of this. Uh, remember, her name was Erica Cobb at the time, uh, but uh, she basically admitted multiple times that they had talked about this, they had planned this, she had told Chad, here are your options, uh, and she said this is the only way to make this problem go away. Uh, she even said, uh, boy, that, that really cold portion of that conversation where she said, do I feel bad for what happened to her? She said, I don't. And Chad even asked me, do I feel bad what, about what happened to Ashley? And I don't. Uh, so very cold. Uh, that, that sounds like a person who could potentially uh, be involved and be cold and calculated. And that's exactly what they wanted the jury to hear. Uh, and so uh, here we uh, are waiting for the end of our lunch break here on day four. I would expect uh, the state has perhaps one or two. Uh, actually, no, we haven't heard from the detective uh, in this case. The lead detective will have to speak. Uh, so we're at least two uh, officials away uh, from the state maybe wrapping up its case. Uh, and it, maybe this will coincide with the end of the week uh, and then perhaps take the weekend and perhaps the defense uh, takes over starting Monday. We will have to wait and see. We are officially over an hour for lunch. Uh, we have seen this court uh, be a little bit uh, a little bit uh, lax in their time back. They're not uh, the most expedient uh, coming back from uh, the announce or from uh, their breaks and their lunch. Uh, let me see if I have uh, again. I do think these uh, video pictures are so or I'm sorry. These evidence pictures are are so telling of just how haphazard this whole thing. If it was planned, well, they didn't plan for everything that happens after the murder, uh, because here is basically all of the evidence laid on a table in the backyard of Chad and Erica. Uh, because they came back from committing the crime and he was covered in blood, so he had to get in the shower. Uh, so basically he just tossed everything in the yard and on this workbench, including the zip ties that are in question. And it will, these zip ties will no doubt be linked to the zip tie that was found around the neck of Ashley Biggs. Uh, it is a brutal picture. Uh, her body stuffed in the not even on the back seat, but in the back floor of a Ford Taurus, not the biggest vehicle uh, to begin with. Uh, but her body was stuffed there, uh, zip ties around her ankles, zip ties just above her knee. And uh, it is not going to be hard to match uh, these. Now, the one question about that backpack is, as we heard Chad testify, and again, you have to ask what kind of an ax he has to grind here. He lost his wife to his best friend while he was in prison. Uh, she was, in fact, pregnant uh, with uh, a child of Mike Stefanko before he was uh, before she was even divorced. Uh, and so you have to ask, yeah, what kind of ax does he have to grind? So why would he say that he didn't kill Ashley, that the thing that killed Ashley he didn't say this? He said, I didn't kill Ashley. Uh, and he was asked that several times. He said, no, I did not kill Ashley. And they said, well, the zip tie killed Ashley. And he said, but I didn't put the zip tie around her neck. Erica did. Now, that's that's as far as that that argument has gone. We have not heard. Uh, no one asked Chad to expand on that. No one asked Chad, uh, OK, well, tell us when did Erica come back into the parking lot? When did Erica, okay, she exits the, the SUV, what did she do next? Uh, he also claims that that backpack, when he was told uh, that when he was picked up by Erica that night before the crime, he said he was simply told uh, to go inside and get the backpack uh, and bring it out to the SUV. And the reason he was asked that is, uh, the defense said, well, how many pairs of gloves did you have in the backpack? And he said, I, I, I don't know. I didn't pack it. And they were confused. And they said, well, who did? And he said, 
the defendant did, and I was simply told to go in and get it and bring it out. Um, so, uh, and they, they didn't ask to expand on that either, and uh, d just very interesting as to why not. I, I'm guessing uh, that if you are the defense, you don't want to get too far into that because is it possible your client uh, is now in double jeopardy and it turns out if she is the one who got out of the vehicle and put the zip tie around her neck, now maybe she would be looking at the death penalty. Maybe they would turn this around and go back and try and get the death penalty if they were, if that was proven. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see what we get on that. Uh, again, just waiting for uh, the end of our lunch break. Uh, while we do that, let's play a, a little bit of the scene. Uh, you're going to see some video here. It's uh, taken by a drone, and this is Chad Cobb when he was on the scene. Remember Chad? He was wearing prison orange, chose not to be on camera, uh, but uh, was explaining the scene and where they were when this happened. Take a look. And when you say the defendant drove to the back, is this the back parking lot you're referring to? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, when you look at this video, um, is it fair to say that the scene Nari may not have looked the same back in June 2012? That's correct. It's different. Okay. And what, what is different about it? I remember the parking lot in the back being larger because it went over what would be to the right-hand side of the screen more. And the trees, this was in June. Did the trees have leaves and foliage on it? Uh, I would assume so, yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, once you got to the, once you got to the back of this parking lot. The parking lot was closer to that large tree right there. This large tree? Yes. Okay. For the record, I stopped it and we're looking, there's, there's literally one large tree in the picture. Is that the large tree you're referring to? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, once you got to the back of this parking lot, and 647 West Turkey Foot Lake Road, where we're at right now, is that in Summit County, Ohio? Uh, I believe so. It's in Akron? It, either that or New Franklin Township. I'm, I'm not sure where the, uh, the municipal lines are drawn. That's fine. When you were there, tell me what happened. Did you all stay in the car, get out the car? Uh, I ended up getting out of the car and walking over to that tree. What did the defendant do? Uh, she ended up following me over. Did you all have conversation by that tree? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Where were the children at this point? In the Lincoln. During the ride with you with the girls um, to Mitco, uh, were they sleeping or were they awoke when you left the house? Uh, I think they were bouncing around in the back seat. Okay. When you got in the car at Mitco, were the boys woke or sleep? Uh, they, they were all awake. Okay. So time has passed. Um, do you know, were they still awake, sleep when you got to, uh, or you don't know, when you got to Mit, um, 647 West Turkey Foot Lake Road? When I walked out of the Lincoln and walked over to the tree, I couldn't tell you one way or the other. Okay. So you're at the key, key. you're at the tree. You and the defendant are having conversation. Is that a fair statement? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Approximately how long did you stay over at the tree? I, minutes, maybe 10, 15 minutes, if that. After that conversation under the tree, did the defendant make a phone call? 
she left the tree and walked back over to the Lincoln. At that point in time, she ended up making a phone call. Okay. I want you to tell the jury about that phone call. Um, could you hear that phone call? Bits and pieces of it. Okay. And when she walked back over to the Lincoln, that's where the children still were, correct? Yes, ma'am. Will you please tell, not this time, will you please tell the jury the bits and pieces you heard of that phone call? Uh, remember, she called Ashley's place of work to order a pizza, um, used another person's name like Jennifer or, or Katie. Okay. Uh, I remember the last name was Mick something. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to say it was like a, a half topping. I remember either half pepperoni or half mushroom or, or half something. Uh, I remember uh, her saying working in the back uh, to like keep knocking on the door. That's about all that I remember overhearing. Okay. <clears throat> what was her, the defendant's demeanor when she was making the phone call? Seeing her smiling. After that phone call was made, did you have conversation with the defendant after that? Yes, ma'am. She walked back over. Back over to To where? the tree. You were still, okay, you were still at the tree at that time? Yes, ma'am. Okay. What was the environment like out there? Was it light? Was it dark? Uh, I mean, I remember it was a parking lot. I remember it had lights. In there, uh, it was dark outside, though. Was anyone else back there? Were there any other cars? No, ma'am. So you were the only ones back there? Correct. Was the business open or closed? Uh, closed. And I'm going to jump in there. I'm still watching uh, our live picture coming out of the courtroom. Uh, we're not missing anything. I'll make sure we come back. Uh, but I do want to get to the actual, uh, the confrontation between uh, the defense and Chad Cobb talking about uh, the actual death of Ashley. I'm not sure if we'll get through this, but again, this is where Chad claims that it was Erica that put the uh, zip tie around Ashley's neck. Yesterday, you said that the only reason that you pled guilty to aggravated murder and accepted a life without parole sentence was because of your children, correct? Yes, sir. That was a difficult thing to do, wasn't it? Yes, it was. The most difficult thing you've ever had to do? I think that's fair. Where does it rank in terms of difficulty with killing Ashley Biggs? I never said I killed her, sir. You didn't kill her? No, sir. You didn't kill Ashley Biggs? That is correct. Okay. We'll get to that in a minute. So the most difficult thing you've ever had to do was plead guilty to this for your children, correct? It was not an easy decision to make, that's correct. But you powered through anyway and you got it done, right? I was a dad. Your dad. I think that's what had to be done. Okay. But any difficulty involving JW, okay. the daughter you haven't so seen, you weren't willing to make that effort, correct? No. Dan DeRose with 19 News. I'm going to jump out of that. Uh, the judge is back on the bench. I'm going to have to check with one of my sources here. Uh, our court TV source may be frozen, but we've got this other source uh, coming out of the courtroom. So let's use this one for the time being. Everybody got some lunch, a break? We get the all rise for the jury to come back into the room. Looks like uh, our computer issues are resolved here, so we'll be just fine moving forward. Uh, just waiting for the jury to be seated and we'll get started again. Not shocking, we're about uh, 15 minutes behind schedule. That seems to be about par for the course a break here. And some lunch. Here we go.
We have, thank you so much, Adam. All right, we're going to go back. Go ahead and be seated. Thank you, everyone. We're going back on the record for State of Ohio versus Erica Stefanko. It is now 1.27 p.m. Um, let's see. Let me turn on the cameras. And I believe the state has their next witness ready to go. We are. Your okay, wonderful. Good afternoon. Could you raise your right hand, please? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just uh, wanted to give the um, jury a warning. There may, or may be, there, I think there will be some graphic photographs. I just wanted to give you a heads up before um, her testimony begins, okay? Okay, thank you so much. Go ahead, Attorney LaPrenzi. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Ma'am, if you would please introduce yourself to the jury by telling them your full name and spell your last name for the court reporter. I'm Dr. Lisa Kohler, K-O-H-L-E-R. I am the Chief Medical Examiner for the County of Summit. And the Chief Medical Examiner, um, how long have you been the Chief Medical Examiner? Since April of 2001. And prior to that, did you work for the Medical Examiner's Office? Yes. Yeah. I was hired back in November of 98 as a Deputy Medical Examiner and was promoted up through the ranks until April of 01 when I took over. And you mentioned uh, that you were the Chief Medical Examiner. That means it's you at the top of the chain. And then how many people are underneath you? I have two other doctors that perform autopsy exams as well. We have a total staff of, I believe, 21 people. All right. And as a medical examiner, um, let's just kind of talk about that terminology. Um, a lot of times we see on TV and hear other places the, the term coroner. Tell me what, um, what's the difference between a coroner and a medical examiner? <coughs> Excuse me. In the state of Ohio, the coroner is an elected official who must be a physician, and that is true in 86 of the 88 counties. In the other two counties, here in Summit and up in Cuyahoga County, we have a medical examiner, which is an appointed position, and the preferred training there, not only as a physician, but as a forensic pathologist, someone who is trained to perform autopsies, collect evidence, and present that in court. All right, so in the city or in the county of Summit, we have a medical examiner situation. So you're not a politician, you're not elected, you're appointed by the executive's office and approved by, I think, county council. Is that fair? That's correct. All right. <clears throat> as far as you mentioned, the qualifications that for a medical examiner, the preferred uh, qualification would be f a forensic pathologist. Is that fair? Yes, sir. All right. And in regards to a uh, coroner, which is the other 86 counties in the state of Ohio, do you have to be a forensic pathologist? No, you're required to be a physician, but you can be any type of physician, whether it's a family practice doc, OB-GYN, trauma surgeon, ER doc, what have you. All right. You could be a foot doctor. Yes, All right. probably. So <clears throat> in Summit, you need to be a forensic pathologist. So I guess we need to tell the jury what is exactly a forensic pathologist is. Okay, a forensic pathologist is a physician who has completed training in at least anatomic pathology. That would be a residency where you learn how to do autopsies and learn various aspects of the disease processes and how to diagnose these. And then you would have completed also a forensic pathology fellowship, which is an additional year of training beyond that in which you are doing autopsies, collecting evidence, and preparing reports, and determining the cause and the manner of death of individuals under your jurisdiction. And part of the process is also to take a board certification <clears throat> exam in the specialty area that would, um, thank you, thank you, that would indicate that you've completed not only the prescribed training, but you have demonstrated through a national examination that you have the required knowledge to perform your duties. All right, and just in case there may be jurors on this, uh, members of this jury that know exactly what you're talking about, but just in case there's one or two that don't, what is, when you say forensic pathologist, first of all, what's pathology? Pathology is a study of disease, and there are two main 
subspecialties with pathology, which would be the anatomic pathology, which so if any of you have ever had your tonsils out or had some sort of tumor out, that <clears throat> tissue went to an anatomic pathologist who looked at the tissue under the microscope, put a name to what was going on with that tissue and communicated that to the treating physicians. They also will do autopsies on some of the cases at the hospital, but they're largely involved in surgical pathology. A clinical pathologist is someone who runs the laboratory in the hospital. So this is a person who is going to get the blood work that was taken at your physician's office, and now they're going to check to see what your liver, liver function, your kidney function, your thyroid function are based on laboratory results. They troubleshoot that, so if you get an abnormal value, that, that pathologist will go back and decide, is this a problem with my equipment? Is this a problem with the patient? Or is this a problem with my quality control? And they will communicate that with the clinician as well. So those are the two main types of pathology. And then there are other subtypes that go off beyond that. And forensics is one of those. And what does forensics mean? Forensics has to deal with testimony in courtrooms. All right. Um, and so in order to be the medical examiner here in Summit County, you had to be a forensic pathologist, which you obviously are. But let's talk more specifically, and you're board certified? Correct. And so let's go ahead and talk. I know you have more than one board certification, but let's go ahead and talk about your background training and education that qualifies you to have the job you do. So I began, uh, my undergraduate degree was at the University of Toledo, and it was a Bachelor of Science in Biology. From there, I went to what was then the Medical College of Ohio at Toledo. It's now the medical campus of the University of Toledo where I got my medical degree. From having my MD, I then went to the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center where I did a combined anatomic and clinical pathology residency and became board certified in both areas. And I finished up my training at the Medical College of Virginia, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in Richmond, Virginia, where I did my forensic pathology fellowship and became board certified there before joining the office here. All right. <clears throat> so now let's talk about the duties of a medical examiner. Um, what are the duties of a medical examiner? The medical examiner is determining <clears throat> the cause and the manner of death of individuals who are dying within their county when they die suddenly and unexpectedly, when they're in apparent good health or not being treated for a potentially lethal disease, when they are dying from any sort of injury or poisoning, whether it's self-inflicted or inflicted by another person, or when the circumstances are suspicious. Those types of cases will fall under our jurisdiction. And then we will oversee the investigation of those deaths perform some sort of examination and come to a conclusion as to what caused the death of that individual and classify it by the manner. All right. And so just to be clear, you do not do autopsies on everybody that dies in Summit County. Correct. So if somebody is being treated by a physician for cancer and then passes away from cancer under that care, you're not going to do an autopsy there because it's pretty clear what the, what the result is in that case. Right. They're under the care of a physician for a potentially lethal disease. So it would not necessarily fall under my jurisdiction unless there was an injury that intervened that caused the death. All right. And so to the lay person, when you say the cause and manner, that sounds like it's kind of all one big thing. So can you just maybe give an example of what it, the cause is versus the manner? The cause of death is the injury or the illness that results in that person's death. The manner describes the circumstances. As a medical examiner, I've got five choices. It can be natural if it's due to a cancer or an infection. It could be accident if there's an injury or poisoning that was unintentional. It can be suicide if there is an injury or a poisoning where the person intended to cause self-harm or death. It could be homicide if it's death caused at the hands of another person or undetermined in a situation where two competing manners can't be distinguished. All right. And of course, uh, undetermined could also be like, you know, you find uh, a decomposed body, just a skeletal remains, you might not be able to make any kind of conclusion about that. That would be also an undetermined, correct? That's correct. Okay. <clears throat> um, as the medical examiner, you talked about uh, cause and manner, and part of the manner would be uh, um, homicide, correct? Yes, manner of death would include homicide. Now, when you say the word homicide, obviously that has many meanings um, to a layperson. 
when you talk about homicide, is that the same thing as we would talk about in the criminal sense? No. When I make a ruling of homicide, it's a medical opinion. It is not a legal opinion. So if I rule homicide on a case that doesn't require that litigation take place, and the converse is true, if I would rule something else, such as an accident, it doesn't preclude litigation <clears throat> taking place. So it's a medical opinion, not a legal one. So if you had a clear case of uh, self-defense, somebody breaks into somebody's house and the homeowner shoots and kills the burglar, that's going to be a homicide. Yes, sir. It might be justifiable legally, but for your purposes, it's at the hands of another, it's going to be a homicide. Correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, in this situation, there's already been testimony that the jury has heard that um, the victim in this case, Ashley Biggs, was her body was found in Wayne County. That would be outside your jurisdiction, correct? Correct. All right. In um, Summit County, as a medical examiner, in, let's say, Wayne County, do you know who the, the that's a coroner's jurisdiction, correct? Yes, ma'am. So in that jurisdiction, the coroner, do you remember who the coroner is? That would be Amy Jolliffe. And do you know what type of doctor she is? I believe she's a family practitioner. And would she be qualified to do an autopsy a forensic pathologist would do? No. So what does a coroner in another county do when they have somebody under suspicious circumstances found in their jurisdiction? What do they do? They will typically work with another <clears throat> established coroner or medical examiner's office who has the ability to perform a, an autopsy, preferably by a forensic pathologist, and then that forensic pathologist will report their findings to the coroner, and the coroner will sign the death certificate based on the findings we report. All right. And at that time, and I would say the time, uh, uh, June 21st of 2012, did you have a, a business relationship with Wayne County? Yes, we did. And what was that relationship? Uh, Dr. Jolliffe was sending their cases that needed an, an autopsy, a forensic examination, to our office for that purpose. All right. So they had a contract with you to perform the autopsies for on their behalf? Yes. It was more of a gentleman's agreement than a firm contract, but we were providing that service to them on a regular basis. All right. And so it just happens to be that this case ended up in Summit County, and you happen to also be the one to get called to do the autopsy from Wayne County. Yes. All right. <clears throat> when you do the perform the autopsy, um, you are not acting as the medical examiner in Summit County. You're acting as a forensic pathologist, correct? Yes. And then, so you make your recommendations to the Wayne County coroner, and then based on your expertise, she then makes the ruling as to cause and manner of death. That's correct. Okay. So let's talk about this particular case. Um, did you have occasion to uh, do the autopsy of Ashley Biggs? I did. And when did you perform that autopsy? The autopsy was performed on June 22nd of 2012. All right. <clears throat> and so she was uh, found on, a testimony was she was found on June uh, 21st, so it would have been the very next day. Yes. All right. <clears throat> Um, at this point in time, again, uh, we all, I think, generally lay, lay people understand what an autopsy kind of is in a big sense, but generally, can you just give us a general idea of what you do? How, what are the steps you take when you do an autopsy? Yes. So when we first receive the body into the office, we will go back and examine it as it's received with clothing on, any marks of therapy, any other evidence that's there. And that involves not only taking notes on what we're observing, but also taking photographs. If there is evidence that needs to be collected, we will collect it at that time. And we will also undress that individual and remove any evidence of therapy or anything else ex extra on the body. <clears throat> Again, do photographs, make notations at that time. We will collect evidence as needed and have that packaged up to be receded off to law enforcement for the additional studies to be performed on that. When we do the examination after we've done the outside 
viewing of the body, we're going to begin the internal exam. So we make an incision from each shoulder to the chest bone down to the pubic bone so we can see the organs where they lie. And then we can correlate if there's an injury on the outside of the body that affects the internal organs, we make that apparent. We make the description of that so that we can refer to it later. We also will look inside of the head. So we'll make an incision across the scalp, fold the scalp forward and back so we can see the top of the skull. The top of the skull is removed. We can take the brain out and we examine that. All of those descriptions are then reduced to writing and we create a report. We will also, any fluids that were drawn during the course of the autopsy can be sent for toxicology to see if there's any drugs or alcohol in their system that would affect our ruling. We then create a final report. And in, if it was a case from my county, I would also sign the death certificate. But because this is from Wayne County, I did not get involved with signing of the death certificate. I just provided the information to the, the coroner. All right. And you mentioned um, as part of that autopsy uh, procedure that you do some toxicology testing, correct? Yes. <clears throat> and in that process, where is that toxicology testing done? Is it in-house? Yes, it is performed in our own toxicology lab. And you have an actual toxicologist that does those tests? Yes, sir. At that time, who would that have been? That would have been Steve Perch. All right. And you, as the forensic pathologist, don't necessarily do the testing. You have somebody else do it, correct? Right. I'm not involved in doing the toxicology <laughs> testing, but my, my toxicologist will do that, and he then lets me know what those results <clears throat> are. All right. And just like anybody goes to a doctor, has maybe a broken hand, they go to a, a, have an x-ray done. They might have a, a radiologist interpret that x-ray, and then the, your doctor relies on his findings, correct? Correct. And you would do that with your toxicologist in these cases? Yes, sir. All right. Um, I'm going to show you, um, let me switch this over. Uh, may I approach, Judge? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm going to show you with a mark. Exhibit 103A, and just take a thumb through that for a second there, and tell me if you recognize. Dan DeRose with 19 News. Again, these are going to be very graphic autopsy photos. Uh, they'll be shown in the courtroom, but out of respect for the Ashley so Biggs State's family, Exhibit we will not be showing here. 103A is a copy of the report of autopsy and the toxicology report for Ashley Biggs. Does this accurately represent the actual report that you prepared as a result of doing and performing an autopsy on Ashley? It does. All right. And now just for the purpose of the jury, um, that would be a copy of your signature there? Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> now, since we brought up the toxicology, we'll just get right to that portion of it. Um, and I believe that's the last page of your report. Do you have a copy with you there? I do. Okay. On the last page of that report, would this be essentially the toxicology results? Yes, sir. And what are the results of the toxicology? And what do you, I guess I should ask you, what do you test for um, in toxicology? Well, we do a blood alcohol <clears throat> test, and then we also do a drug screen, which looks for a variety of classes of drugs. And if we would find the drugs present in the screen, then we would quantitate them in the blood. In this situation, we did not find any alcohol in her blood, and we did not find any drugs in the urine. All right. And as far as, you know, um, the level of or the amount of time that can pass um, with those substances in your body, is there some length of time that, like, alcohol will stay in your system? Yes, different drugs have a different half-life in the body. So, um, you know, when you have a drink of alcohol, the body is going to break that down or metabolize it over a period of time, and eventually it will go down to zero. So different drugs have different half-lives. All right. And uh, some drugs can stay in your system for quite some time. Is that fair? Yes, sir. Like marijuana stays in for quite a while. Yes, it does. Um, and But you see nothing here. Correct. All right. <clears throat> All right. Now, <clears throat> in preparation for your testimony here and educating the jury on the cause and manner of Ashley's death, did you prepare um, an aid for the jury? Yes, I created a PowerPoint. All right. Your Honor, at this time, um, 
I'm going to attempt, hopefully. Oh, yes, I'm in. No, it's not. Is it? Um, do the PowerPoint, which is states 103B. Showing on my screen, but not on the big screen. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. All right, so starting at the first page here, <clears throat> um, what, just tell us, walk us through this. What are we looking at? Okay, this is just a, a front page to the, to the uh, presentation that gives us some basic information. It was an autopsy of Ashley Biggs. It was performed by, the, my, by myself for the Wayne County Coroner's Office. The case number, the 1207385, tells us that it happened in the year 2012. It was the 73rd case that we had performed as an out-of-county case for County 85, which is Wayne County. And the date of death is June 21st of 2012. All right. And so now I'm just going to let you tell me when you want to go through the PowerPoint, when to show the next slide, to show kind of like walk through the process that you went through with the autopsy, OK? OK. So when you first have Ashley come in, you said you do a visual examination. Did you do that in this case? Yes, sir. All right. And on your visual examination, was there anything of significance that you found um, that we also put into your report? Yes. Uh, she had a zip tie ligature around her neck, and she had multiple bruises and abrasions on her body that were of concern. All right. And um, now you tell me, are, uh, do you want me to go to the next yeah. slide? Yes, please. Okay. So the next slide will show that ligature, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. So what are we looking at here? Because I, I know you have uh, photographs A, B, C, D, and E for the record. Yes. So image A there at the top, you can see the neck with the zip tie ligature secured around. And you can see there are some abrasions, the red marks near her chin, um, some bruising on the neck. And then in the remaining images here, that zip tie ligature has been removed from the neck and we're taking photographs documenting it there. So in image B, you can see the blue arrows pointing to either side and that's the right side of the neck. You can see that there is a pale ligature furrow or mark on the neck along through there. In image C, we're looking at the front of the neck with the chin extended upward. And again, the blue arrows are pointing at either side of the ligature furrow or the mark on the neck. Image D is the left side of the neck showing a similar arrangement. And image E is the back of the neck. So you can see that the ligature furrow goes around the entire neck and it is mostly in a horizontal orientation. There's slight variation, but it's predominantly horizontal. And you can see that there are other marks on the neck as well, which are abrasions. And some of them are what are called petechial hemorrhages, which are pinpoint hemorrhages where small blood vessels have burst from pressure. And doctor, if you need to, uh, the judge can give you the opportunity to, to uh, draw on there with your finger if you need to point something out. So just keep that in mind. Thank you. All right. Um, now, you were talking about the horizontal nature of these ligatures. Is that significant to you as a forensic pathologist? Yes. So different types of asphyxial dust that we deal with would be hangings and ligature strangulation. And the difference between someone who is being hanged, which is typically a suicidal, is the ligature mark goes upward. 
and there's a, usually a pretty sharp upward angle to it, whereas a ligature strangulation, the furrow is horizontal across the neck rather than being angled upward at a, uh, a sharp angle. And I believe you have an example of that is here. Yes. So stay, going to the next slide, this is a, a caricature of, or cartoon type photograph, is that correct? Right, so this is a diagram I've used in older presentations for just educational purposes, just to show the difference. So in the image where you're seeing the person facing directly towards you, she's got one black line that's going upward, which would be what we would typically see with a hanging, and then the, the um, multi-edged furrow going straight across, which is more typical of a ligature strangulation. And then we also have the side view showing again an upward and then a horizontal. So the upward would be from hanging and the horizontal would be a ligature strangulation. And, and why is it that it's more horizontal than upward? With, with the hanging, the person is being suspended from something above them. And so that pulls the ligature upward. Whereas with a ligature strangulation, it's being primarily just wrapped around the neck and tightened. So it tends to be more of a horizontal position. Uh, just very quickly, going, oops, the wrong way. going back to this, this is where you're talking about the horizontal nature of these injuries here. Yes. Now, of course, in this case, you actually have the ligature still attached. Is that correct? Correct. Going to the next slide here, you mentioned petechia. Um, is that what we're looking at here? Yeah, so this again is a, <clears throat> uh, a cartoon type depiction of the types of things we look for in any sort of strangulation or ligature death, whether it's a hanging or a strangulation. So many times the face is very blue, so we've got the blueness there of the, the jaw and up into the face and on the neck. The red dots are the petechiae, which are small burst blood vessels on the face. Many times you can see that in the eyes and inside of the mouth as well. The ligature mark there is the orange dotted line across there. If someone has grabbed that person's neck, you may see bruising. And then the curved lines are abrasions, which would be fingernail marks, which could either be by the person that is strangling this individual, or it could be from the victim trying to claw at the obstruction to their airway. So they could be causing their own abrasions or scratches on their neck from trying to get that off. All right, and so let's talk about that just for a moment too. Um, so you talked about, you might see some finger marks or in where the fingers might be. If someone were to be strangling them manually, you might see impressions from their fingertips or something like that. Yes, on some occasions we do. <clears throat> and then you also talked about the person being strangled could also be fighting to get that, keep that ligature from tightening around their neck. Correct. And is that a common thing that you look for when dealing with strangulation? Yes, even with, with a hanging situation, we do document if that's <clears throat> present because even with a hanging, sometimes the person's hanging themselves will reflexively reach up to try and loosen the noose or the, the ligature that's around their neck, so they can still have scratch marks like that. But we do document that regardless of the, the type of ligature that's around the neck. And so that we're clear, the petechiae you, you've talked about also, that is not just unique to strangulation. Is that fair? No, it's not. It's a, it's a nonspecific finding because even you know, as a woman is giving birth and is bearing down very hard, there's increased pressure in the blood vessels that can cause petechial hemorrhages. Some people who are having a heart attack can have petechial hemorrhages as well. But in this scenario, when you have the other factors there, it, it is something that we would take into account as evidence towards this being a, an asphyxial death. All right. Moving on to our next slide. What are we looking at here? Okay, we've got multiple views here of two views of the uh, petechial hemorrhages. So in image A there, we're looking on the side of the face. You can see her ear and her chin. And inside of that blue rectangle, there are some little dark dots. So those are petechial hemorrhages. And you can see the furrow line on the side of the neck as well. In image B, I've reflected the upper lip back. And you can see that there are some marks on the inside of the lip there. Those are also some petechial hemorrhages. And in image C, 
the, in the bottom there, there are some abrasions on either side of the ligature furrow. So you can see the pale mark going across the neck. And then above, there are two scratch abrasions. And then below, there's a, another small mark, which is an abrasion or a contusion. All right. And, and we talked about that you know, the, the difference between maybe the, the person doing the strangling versus the reflection, reflective uh, actions of the, the person being strangled. Did you see anything uh, that distinguished or any of those type injuries here with Ashley? I mean, I can't say for certain who made those abrasions, <clears throat> but in somebody who is getting strangled, many times they will claw at that. I can't say for certain if it was her that made those or if the person strangling her caused those scratches as well. All right. But there are some scratches that appear to be made on the neck independent of the ligature. Yes, sir. Okay. And then moving to the next slide. Okay. Is this? this is just an anatomic diagram. What I'm going to show you next are going to be some internal photographs of the neck with some of the muscles. So this is showing what some of the muscles are. All right. And what are the significance of, of showing these muscles? The, the main muscles, so when you are turning your, your head, you see there's a prominence of that muscle. That's the sternocleidomastoid. That's one of the big muscles of the neck. And that's one that's going to show some injuries and just documenting that there are some smaller, deeper neck muscles here as well, the sternohyoid and the omohyoid bone, um, muscles that are on the front of the neck that you'll see in the next images. All right. So next slide. So here we have that same <clears throat> diagram in the center with the main muscles. And what we have done is we've reflected the skin flap that's at the front of the chest in front of the neck upward. So we're now able to look down in that same area and you can see the, the muscles in the neck. You can see there are also some arrows there in image A that are pointing to areas where there's deep hemorrhage. So those dark areas there are bleeding into the neck and they're just out in the edges of that sternocleidomastoid muscle area and then one that's up high as we've reflected up onto the chin that would be would have come down lower in the neck. And then in image B, I've reflected the sternocleidomastoid muscles upward. So you can see that they're kind of hinged up. And you can see the more central muscles down the, the sternohyoid muscles down the, the front of the neck. And I'm pointing to, there's arrows, two arrows there on either side where there's some deep hemorrhage at the front of the neck on those inner muscles. And then there's one underneath of one of the muscles that has been reflected up over the chin. And you can, um, the, the thyroid gland sits in that general area. And what's, when you say deep, what do you mean by deep? You're, are you talking about, you know, physically deep into the, to the muscles? Yes, it's, the muscles themselves are deeper under the skin. So with the layers, when we're doing this type of dissection, first we take the le level of skin back so that we can see the muscles that you're seeing in that diagram. Then the sternocleidomastoid muscles go up and out of the way, and then we're left with two more layers of muscles across the front of the neck structures. So not only do we have bleeding into the soft tissues under the skin, but we've also got bleeding into the muscles themselves. And so what, when you talk about deep, these are deep muscle injuries, what is the significance of that regarding the use of force or how much force would be necessary to cause those deep muscle injuries? The fact that we're actually getting the, the deep muscle injuries is important because many times with just a hanging, we don't see any bruising in the neck. It's unusual for us to see that bruising in the neck. In this situation, we have a ligature around the neck that has been pulled quite tight and she's there's a good chance she's struggling against it as it's going, so it's it's causing even more bruising. The bruising is going deeper into the neck. All right. Um, now, as far as that was what you found in the neck area, did you also note certain injuries to her head area? Yes, sir. All right. And then, would that be our next slide? Yes. All right. So in this slide, mm -hmm. we're starting to look at some of the blunt force trauma injuries to the head. Image A, we're looking at the left side of her face, and I've got three areas that are circled here. She has uh, a bruise 
bruise and an abrasion up near her hairline. She's got some bruising here uh, just to the outside of her eye. And then you can see there's also some abrasion and bruising in front of her ear. As we move over to image B, which is a direct view straight onto her face, you can see up on her forehead, she has a large area of bruising and abrasion. The bridge of her nose has bruise and a laceration, so there's a cut on the one side. Her left eye is bruised, so she's got bruising and swelling of the tissues around her eye, and her right cheek is also showing bruising. All of those are circled in blue on this image. And then in image C, we have four ovals around injuries. So she has a bruise that's up near the temple on the right side of the face. We have bruising on her cheek to the front of her ear. There is bruising involving the ear itself. And then there are those abrasions down on the chin that we saw earlier with some of the neck photographs. And can you um, conclusively make a determination as to what caused these bruising injuries and scraping injuries, whatever? I can just say that they're due to some sort of blunt force injury. I can't say what instrument caused it, whether it's a hand or an object, just that she has been impacted in those areas. All right. And would these be consistent or inconsistent with somebody being punched? Some of them may be due to being punched. I can't say that all of them are. All right. And the type that would not be or could be questionable whether they were punches or not, which would be what type of injuries? Well, she's, she's got the abrasion up on her forehead. That is less likely to be due from a, a punch. But the other bruises may be due to a punch, or it may be that she is being struck against a surface. So these, uh, these are the front and sides of her, her head. Let's move to the back portion of her head. Um, so I'm moving to slide number nine. Before I do that, let's talk a little bit about bruises. Now, we've all seen them. We all know what they are as lay people. But in terms of your profession, um, what is the significance of a bruise? And can you tell whether a bruise is prior to death or subsequent to death? With us, a bruise is indicating that's a place where there's been some sort of impact. We've had some blunt trauma to the tissue. You can't accurately say when a bruise happened or how old it is. They, we all know that when you have a bruise for a period of time, it does change colors. And that gives you some idea of whether it's older or newer. So if it's a yellow type of bruise, that's something that's been there for a while. If it's more red purple, it's something that was more recent. So <clears throat> it's possible to, if you're injuring the tissue around the time the person dies, they may not have a chance to create what we would call a bruise right then. But as they lay and the blood settles down into those tissues, the bruise may become more apparent after they're dead than it was when it was first occurring. All right. And so although we may see on TV, they age the bruising. Um, we're going to take a recess. Okay. Adam, I need you to call, or Deputy, can you call? Tristan, can you come get the jury, please? Oh, he's out there. Dan DeRoss with 19 News. Something has occurred here in the courtroom. Okay, do you guys want to stand up or anything? We're going to take a break for a minute. Uh, the pictures have been very graphic. Uh, we did see the mother of Ashley Biggs have to uh, leave the room, um, and we're not sure if, if there was maybe an adverse reaction. Did somebody get sick? Uh, because of the pictures, uh, or was this um, uh, Ashley and her family uh, perhaps um, causing a little bit of a commotion on the way out of the courtroom? We didn't hear much said. Uh, we're looking back live. You can see the deputy has stood up behind Erica Stefanko. Uh, I don't want to call it a defensive position, but that is a ready position uh, to make sure and Again, uh, courtrooms like to be sealed once they start, uh, so anybody that's getting up and leaving uh, can be a bit of a concern. So uh, I think we're taking a recess for a couple of different reasons. Uh, we did see 
Ashley Biggs' mother have to uh, head out of the room. Uh, we've been watching the pictures on a different source and they are extremely graphic. Uh, it is no wonder that her mom had to uh, be taken out, but the question is something else happened in the courtroom after that uh, that uh, is why they had to quickly get the jury out of the room uh, for a quick recess. Not exactly sure uh, what that was, but we'll stay here with our coverage. Again, the pictures have been uh, very tough to look at. Uh, the ligature uh, injuries uh, to the neck from where the zip tie was placed. You heard the coroner give her, the medical examiner give her uh, opinion. And uh, literally some of those photos had to cut into the neck, remove the skin, uh, and even lift up some of the muscles to show how much damage was on the inside of her neck, uh, showing, uh, and uh, as the medical examiner said, uh, injuries from someone hanging themselves uh, were much less destructive than what uh, was shown today uh, or shown just now because of how tight that zip tie had been put on, the struggle that which would have ensued after that zip tie was put on, uh, and uh, it uh, clearly became too much for some of those in the courtroom. As we saw a number of, uh, we saw her mother at least have to get up and leave. And then there was some other uh, commotion. The judge asked for a recess and then asked to have the jury quickly removed from the courtroom. Uh, so um, these kinds of things will happen. Uh, again, this has been uh, very graphic photos. There had only been about five, six photos shown so far, uh, and understandably so, it was just way too much for uh, the mother uh, to handle. Uh, but the question is, what else happened? And uh, there have been there have been times where maybe someone in the gallery uh, couldn't take uh, the photos, may have gotten sick, uh, may have had an issue. Uh, and we saw uh, the court head into recess. We're gonna stay with our seal uh, right here for the time being. Uh, we will make sure you don't miss a single uh, second of this uh, and we'll see how long this recess goes. Uh, perhaps just enough to get the jury uh, some fresh air uh, out of the room, perhaps uh, a drink of water just to get them uh, back uh, a little bit unsettled or a little back from uh, being unsettled. So we're going to leave this right here uh, on the seal for the time being. Dan DeRose with 19 News. Uh, if you're watching us here on our gavel to gavel coverage of deadly delivery, uh, we had a very quick uh, recess called. Uh, we were uh, just at the very beginning of the medical examiner's uh, testimony. 
uh, for the death of Ashley Biggs. Uh, they were going through photographs, very graphic photographs of the autopsy. Uh, it was too much for Ashley Biggs' mother to take. She was seen leaving the courtroom. That is certainly understandable. Uh, but then something else happened uh, that the judge quickly ordered a recess and ordered that the jury be removed uh, from the juror box and out of the courtroom. Uh, we also saw a deputy kind of take a little bit of a defensive position, a little bit of a ready position uh, behind Erica Stefanko. You've got to protect the defendant uh, from anything that could have happened, and that's uh, simply why we saw that uh, deputy stand in behind uh, Erica Stefanko. Uh, no word on how long this recess will be. Uh, they had just gotten back from lunch. They had been uh, doing testimony for less than uh, about 30, 35, 40 minutes. Uh, and it does look like, uh, I can see on another monitor here, looks like we're about to get back underway. Uh, again, just a short recess needed. Um, sort out uh, who needed to get some air, who needed to be in or out of the courtroom uh, as uh, we will get back underway here shortly again of the testimony of Dr. Lisa Kohler. She's the chief medical examiner for Summit County. She is responsible for the, uh, for the uh, examination, the autopsy of Ashley Biggs in this murder case. Details hard to listen to, even harder to watch for those that are in the courtroom, uh, but it appears we uh, may be getting uh, back underway. versus Erica Stefanko, um, and it's now 2.14. Go ahead, Attorney Laprenzi. Thank you, Judge. Dr. Kohler, at the t um, time we broke, um, you were talking about the aging of bruising and indicated that I believe that it's difficult to really age bruising. And you may have even been talking about the fact that you may be able to tell the bruise occurred around the time of the death, but we can't um, distinguish whether it was before or after. Is that fair? Correct. Okay. Now, if somebody is, is dead, heart stopped pumping, you know, 10 minutes after death, somebody walks up, punches them, are we going to see bruising at that point? There's, if the tissue, if you're punched hard enough and the tissue is crushed and vessels are crushed, then what you're going to be seeing is lividity filling in that area, so it will become darker. Lividity is after the heart has stopped beating, gravity takes over and it pulls the blood to the lowest parts of the body. And if you've got damaged tissue from a heavy blow, then there's going to be more leakage of blood into that area. And you, you may see an area at that point. So you would still be able to distinguish that there's been an injury there, but it's going to still be what we would classify as a perimortem injury and we're not gonna give much more detail than that. All right, and so, and, and maybe this is too much detail, but as far as the mechanics of a bruise, our body is filled with blood vessels and all that blood's contained within the vessels. Is that fair? Yes, sir. So when we have a bruise, somebody comes and hits me, punches me, now I'm breaking all those little vessels and the blood is leaking out, fair? Fair enough, yes. And if my heart is pumping, it's still pumping that blood out those vessels, even though they're not, they're broken. Yes, they will, initially the blood will then escape from those <clears throat> damaged blood vessels until the clotting mechanism takes effect and stops, you know, basically plugs those holes. So initially there is bleeding okay. from the damaged vessels and then your clotting system stops that bleeding, but you've got the, the blood already in the tissues. All right. and and and. Based on what you've told us, can you make any kind of conclusion at all about the bruises that we're seeing on Ash? The bruises that we've been seeing here are all things that are happening around the time of her death. They are fresher bruises. They're dark purple in nature. So that's something that's happening around her, her final minutes. All right. <clears throat> um, and... 
in, in the uh, center picture, B, um, where would the ligature mark be on that, if, if you can tell me? The ligature is above the placard and below that central oval. You can see there's a um, double line going across the back of the neck. Can you tell me right here? Yes. Okay, thank you. Oh, and I'll turn on annotation in case she does want to. Yeah. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> All right, and what are we looking at here? Okay, in this image, we're actually looking from the top of the head. So I put a notation of nose at the top of that image. So we're looking from her head down towards her feet at the top of her head. I mentioned before that when we look at the head, we make an incision from ear to ear and turn the scalp forward and back. So we've done that here. The dark colored areas are all areas of bruising on the scalp. You can see where the placard is at the bottom of the image. There's quite a bit of dark coloring there around that is bruising and up around on each side, there is quite a bit of, of bruising present. All right, and so I'm gonna try and use this here. Well, it doesn't appear to work on the screen. Um, the lighter area here on her head. So this is what would normally, we would normally see, that normal? Yes, so the, the big pale area that's kind of pink on the screen, that's the normal skull color. And then the dark, almost black, is what it looks like on the screen. That's blood, both on the skull and into the scalp tissues as we've reflected them. So that's not supposed to be there. That's all indicative, indicative of injury? Yes, sir. OK. <clears throat> Let me turn the annotation off. Well, no, for some reason it's not matching. So I clicked it on here and it did not. Let me see if that's not dancing. It's not tracking over here now. I mean, the color IT that they, okay. There it is. All right, let's try this. Okay, so now we're on slide. Oops. 11, tell us what we're looking at here. Okay, here we are looking at Ashley's back. So in the small image with the blue background there, that's a barb, there was a little metal barb that was in her clothing from an electrical conduction device or commonly referred to as a taser type device and or a stun gun. And then on the image showing her body, this is looking down at her back and that's her right arm off to the side where the word punctures is found. You can see two ovals circling dark spots. So those are two areas where the barbs from a stun gun taser type uh, instrument were used where they came in contact with the body um, and they're about four and a half inches apart. Now, uh, you said ECD, what does that stand for again? Electroconductive device. All right, and I think we had some prior testimony about this and I guess the, the theory or the concept is, is that if you take these two electrodes and they both sink into the skin, they make a circuit with the electrical source back uh, with the gun part, and then there's an electrical conduction that does what to the human body? It's going to cause pain, and it also causes a paralysis. Typically, when somebody is under the effects of such a weapon, they will collapse to the ground. There may be some, um, some seizing-type activity, but they lose their ability to control their bodies. All right. Is there any way for you to tell as a forensic pathologist, whether there's ever a connection made? I can't see the electricity, but what I can see is that we've got two barbs that made contact with the body. If they are both from the same weapon, 
there should be electricity there, but not we can't see that ourselves. All right. And the amount of electricity that's being conducted would depend on how deep the barbs are, how close they are. There's many factors. Is that fair? There are multiple factors that will affect the amount. Okay. And, and <clears throat> it would be your understanding based on how she was found with clothing on that the barbs would have had to go through the clothing? Yes, sir. <clears throat> if it doesn't make a full connection, you, the description you, um, or the, your, um, how you described its effect on the body, could it be less, depending on the, um, the quality of the connection made with the skin? Yes, if only one barb is in contact with the skin or in close um, proximity to the skin, you're not going to get that electrical current going through because it doesn't have two points. You need to have both points either in contact with the skin or very close to the skin in order to complete that circuit. All right. So we don't know whether she was completely incapacitated by this or partially incapacitated or not at all? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> Tell us what we're looking at here. Okay, here we have some marks on her legs. When we, when we got her, she was not fresh dead. She had been down for a period of time, and she is starting to break down or decompose. So the skin is starting to, to slip off. So where the arrows are, there are marks going across her thighs near the knees and also across her lower legs above the ankles. And that's evidence that something was wrapped around her legs, either at the um, thigh area and on the lower legs. So something had been wrapped around her legs. And it looks to be post-mortem. There's no reddening of the skin to indicate that that was applied while she was alive. So this looks like somebody wrapped something around her legs in order to help move the body. So let's talk about that a little bit. You've seen that before? Yes, sir. And I mean, and I don't think I've ever asked you, uh, approximately how many autopsies have you performed in your career? At this point in my career, I've, I've done over 5,000. All right. And how common is it to see um, these type of ligature marks on, like you described, maybe to move the body? How, how common is that? That is not very common. I've seen a handful over the course of my career. <clears throat> now, hopefully, most of the jurors have not had to move a dead body, but is there some we talk about the, the terminology dead weight. Um, tell us about moving somebody that is dead. It, the challenges that you get in moving a deceased individual when they are freshly dead and they don't have rigor or sniff, stiffness in their body, the body isn't going to necessarily cooperate with what you're doing. So the arms and legs are not necessarily going to follow as you grab onto the the torso, the arms and legs are going to be floppy. Then once rigor sets in and the body is, is stiff in the position in which they were at, then you're dealing with a long, stiff object that you're trying to move, which can be rather awkward as well. So by wrapping it with something else to, to get a, a better handhold to move the body, that would be the, the main way to try and manipulate the body in the way that you want to. So based on your training and experience, these ligatures that were around her ankles and approximately in her knee or thigh type area were done after she had already passed away. Correct. Right. <clears throat> um, All right, what are we looking at here? These are some blunt force trauma injuries to the extremities. So images A, B, and C are of the left arm and hand, and images D and E are of the right arm and hand. And you can see in image A, we are near the elbow there. There is some blue discoloration just to the inside of the elbow. In image B, we've got some bruising and some abrasions present on the forearm there. And on image C, on the back of the hand, there's just some very minor um, discoloration over the knuckles, a little bit of pinkening, so a little bit of contusion there. 
In image D, we're looking at the right elbow and upper arm. So between the star and her elbow, there's some bruising in that area. And on image E, on the back of the right hand, you can see there are abrasions across the four knuckles. There are some abrasions on the middle and index finger and also some abrasions back on the wrist and a bruise on the middle of the back of the hand. In regards to um, some of the injuries, does it appear that she may have been dragged? In these images, it doesn't necessarily appear that she's being dragged. She does have some um, a large area of abrasion on her upper back, which is more consistent with being pressed against the floor rather than showing drag marks. I'm not seeing elongated drag marks on the body. On the extremities? on the back and even on the extremities I can't say anything here necessarily is dragged it's just that there's there's been some some minor scraping or impact on that those extremities okay. all right so <clears throat> you've completed your your autopsy You've done your examination. We've kind of gone through the slides here. Then did you ultimately uh, render opinion uh, based on all your findings during the autopsy? Yes. So the opinion you're seeing in front of you is really kind of a summary of what I found and how I'm communicating with the coroner in Wayne County as to the significance of the findings because she's the one that's going to say what the cause and manner of death are, are going to be for this case. So we mentioned here that we've got the tightly secured ligature around her neck with deep muscular neck hemorrhages, florid facial and scalp petechiae, multiple blows to the head, and evidence of electrical restraint. And then I urge her to correlate that with the investigative information that she has. We're not given the investigative information in much detail when we handle the case. We're just given some basic information. All right. And... Um... One of the things I did forget to mention, ask you about was, um, what was Ashley's height and weight? <clears throat> she was 67 inches long and 164 pounds. So 67 would be five foot seven? Correct. And how many pounds? 164. Okay. <clears throat> so you talked about <clears throat> the ligature um, and the physical injuries we see to the muscles and the neck and things of that nature. But as far as <clears throat> the um, ligatures effect on Ashley's life, what physical effect did it have? With the ligature around her neck tightened up like that, it's going to primarily block the blood vessels going to and coming from her head, and that's going to result in an asphyxial death. It doesn't have to block off the airway in order to cause death. It just needs to block those main blood vessels deep in the neck. And so when we talk about being strangled, you can be strangled by being cut off, oxygen cut off, correct? Yes, you can suffocate by having the oxygen cut off, or you can have just pressure against the blood vessels so the blood does not flow to and from your brain, and then that would also have the same effect. And that's because your brain runs your body, and without the blood, it can't do that. Correct. So in this case, do you can you tell us whether she died from the lack of blood flow to her brain or from the lack of oxygen? Or was it a combination? It's, it's, it's a combination of all of that. So you've stopped the blood flow, which carries good oxygen to the brain, and you're also stopping the blood from draining from the head. So it's not that you've necessarily blocked the airway. I don't believe the airway was blocked in this situation. I think it's the, the blood flow that's being blocked. So she didn't suffocate to death. She was, it was the constriction of the blood from her brain. Yes. Or the flow from blood and out of the brain. Okay. <clears throat> And obviously that's inconsistent with life. Correct. All right. 
As far as all the other injuries you described for us, all the abra abrasions, bruising, and things of that like nature, were those um, life-threatening injuries? No, none of those individually would be life-threatening, but taken as a whole, she was evidence of having been beaten as well as strangled. All right. <clears throat> and ultimately, did you give your recommendation to um, the uh, um, coroner of Wayne County about the cause and manner of death? I don't provide that. I just provide the findings and that opinion, and then she makes the determination as to how to word the cause and manner of death. And, and ultimately, were you aware of what she made, what determination she made? No. And Your Honor, I believe we do have a stipulation in regards to that, which we can provide later. Okay. You mean as to cause of death? Cause of manner of death. Um, Dr. Kohler, all the opinions and, uh, uh, well, all the opinions you've given here today and all the information you've provided to this jury today, was that all within a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes. If I could have a moment, Judge. Of course. Nothing further. Thank you. Anything from the defense? Go ahead, counsel. Trying to get off the screen. That's okay. You don't need this, right? Good afternoon, Dr. Kohler. We've met before, right? Yes, we have. Okay. Um, I'm Jeff Laborn. Just going to ask you literally a few questions. Um, <clears throat> you said that the, um, the zip tie, as we're calling it, um, the ligature around her neck was, was pulled quite tight. Is that yes, correct? Yes, correct. Um, so in order to pull that quite tight, that would require quite a bit of force to be able to do so. Is that fair to say? Yes, I would believe so. Okay. Um, in your report, and I know that some of, some of these examples of blunt force trauma to the head could have, could have been from one single strike, let's call it. But I counted 21 examples of blunt force trauma to the head. Is that, is that approximately correct? I did not make an assessment of the number. Mm -hmm. um, on page four of seven, under blunt force trauma to the head, we have items A through P. So that. So we've got 15 there, and then we've got three, yes. three lacerations and three abrasions, correct? correct? Okay. Yes. And then on the um, extremities and torso, it looks like um, you've got nine on the extremities and, and torso, and then five additional ones upon reflecting the skin. What's that mean, reflecting the skin? That we um, turned, looked at the underside of the skin. So we basically reflected the skin, we're turning it inside out so we can see the undersurface. Okay. Um, taking, uh, calling your attention to the, um, the abrasions, I think you referred to them on her hands. Um, would you would you characterize those abrasions as defensive wounds? Given the area that they're occurring on the body, those would be classified as defensive. So a defensive wound is when something is coming towards you, whether it's a blow or a bullet or a, a knife, and you put your hands up to try and ward it off, then that puts the backs of your hands and your forearms, and sometimes that'll be the palm of your hand, in the line of danger and that you will get injuries on the hands as you're trying to protect yourself. Okay. And then calling your attention to, um, just for example, like the abrasion on the forehead, you felt because there was an abrasion that that would more than likely not be a result of a, of a punch with a fist. Is that correct? Correct. If um, if covering the the knuckles of, of a fist were some metal or hard plastic, 
Could that then cause an abrasion like that? Yes, it could. Okay. Um, and then just one more question. On, on uh, Miss Big's back, um, there were the two, um, two, barb, two barbs that you had ovals around, correct? Yes. Um, and Mr. Laprinzi went into uh, some detail about you can't tell how much electricity is flowing through. You, you, you don't have the ability to determine that, correct? Correct. But there were two barbs, correct, that, that, that punctured the skin. I have a photograph of one barb, but the with the location, there appears that two barbs made contact. Okay. I have nothing further. Thank you, Dr. Cole. Anything else from the state? Just briefly. Do you know whether both those barbs made contact at the same time? No. So in theory, you can't tell us, number one, whether electricity was conducted between those two barbs. Is that fair? Correct. And number two, if they hit you know, they didn't hit simultaneously. One could have fallen out before the other one hit. That's a possibility. I just right. don't know. We just don't know. They might have both hit, made a connection, and completely capacitated. True. On the other hand, it may not have been capacitated at all. That's true. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Kohler, thank you very much for your testimony. You may step down. Have a good afternoon. Uh, did this witness agree to be filmed? Yes. Okay, just making sure it's not. Hi, could you raise your right hand, please? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. <laughs> Sir, uh, good afternoon. If you would please uh, tell the jury your full name and then spell your last name for the record. Martin Lewis, L-E-W-I-S. And sir, how are you employed? I am employed by the Ohio Attorney General's Office, Bureau of Criminal Investigation, which is more commonly referred to as BCI. How long have you been with BCI? 22 years. And <clears throat> what would be, um, what is your title again? Uh, my title is Forensic Scientist. And what qualifications, background, and training do you have in order to hold your job? I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry from Grove City College, which is in Grove City, Pennsylvania. Following graduation, I was employed by the Pennsylvania State Police as a forensic scientist in their drug chemistry section. I had on-the-job training plus some outside classes and workshops. I transferred um, from the Pennsylvania State Police directly to BCI. Um, I've been there now 22 years. I have had on-the-job training, going through their training programs, as well as I attended numerous classes and workshops throughout my time. And your current position with BCI is, is what? I am currently assigned to the drug chemistry section. And what, what would be your primary tasks in the drug chemistry section? Uh, my primary task is to analyze items of evidence for the presence or absence of controlled substances. All right. So uh, it's a lot of drug work, right? Correct. Um, do you also do um, gunshot residue uh, Testing also. I do. All right, and that's part of your your job. Yes. Now, would those be the main two functions you're doing cur currently? Currently. Now, <clears throat> let's take you back to 2012. You would have still been working with BCI. Did you have a different um, job function at that time? Yes, I was assigned to the trace evidence section. And what is trace evidence? Um, trace evidence um, analyzes a multitude of uh, types of evidence, comparing them, uh, such things as hairs, fibers, paint, shoe prints, tire tracks, glass. All right. And uh, how long did you do that? Twelve years. <clears throat> Twelve years. Um, and directing your, well, and I'm assuming you had some training in, in regards to trace evidence. Yes. 
And would that, how is that training done? Is it on the job training through BCI? Mostly, it's on the job training through lectures, reading, practical exercises, tests. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, when you're doing trace evidence, um, are you just given an item and said, hey, look at this and take a look, or do you have some background information prior to doing any kind of analysis? Typically, there is background information such as a case synopsis, so I have an idea of what I'm trying to establish or what I'm comparing. All right. As opposed to with your current position where you have drugs, they hand you a big pile of stuff and you test it and tell them what it is or what it isn't, correct? Yes. You don't need background in that, is that correct? Typically, no. All right. But in trace, it's a little different because you need to know circumstances and information regarding the items. That's correct. And in, let's direct our attention specifically to this case, State of Ohio versus uh, Erica Stefanko. And at the time, it would have been Chad Cobb. But you were given a task regarding this particular case. Is that fair? Yes. What was that task? I was asked to compare several pieces of question duct tape that were collected from crime scenes uh, to compare those to a known roll of duct tape. All right. And in order to do that, did you have any kind of information? Yes. What types of information did you have? I had a case synopsis and information as to where the pieces of duct tape were collected, as well as um, crime scene photographs. OK. <clears throat> Um, let's see here. Did I switch that over right? I think I hit DC, right? All right, I'm going to show you, um, and actually, let me do this first. I'm going to show you a series of photographs. I'm going to show you a series of photographs numbered states number 94, 48, 117, 119, 120. 62, 118, 97, 116, and 96, okay? If you will take a look at those and tell me if you recognize them. Yes, I do. Uh, and um, were those, how do you recognize them? Uh, they're a combination of photographs that were crime scene photographs that were uploaded um, for this file. Um, other photographs are ones that were taken of the evidence at the laboratory, and they have a unique BCI case number on them. Um, it's 12 36121, and that'll appear on all of the items of evidence. Okay. And then um, before I go back, just to kind of do everything while I'm up here, I'm going to show you, <clears throat> well, first of all, after you do your analysis, do you memorialize any findings that you have, uh, uh, any findings you have in any way? Yes, um, they're memorialized in a written report. All right, I'm showing you what's been marked with state's exhibit number 121. Do you recognize that? Yes. And what is that? State's Exhibit 121 is a copy of a written report uh, that I issued with regards to my findings of the comparison of the duct tape. <clears throat> All right, so now showing you State's Exhibit number 94. Do you recognize that? You, you already told us you recognize it. Tell us what we're looking at here. 
Um, this is a crime scene photograph of a, back a backpack and the contents of that backpack, which include a roll of duct tape and a piece of duct tape. All right, and so, um, Judge, if we could have the annotation. Uh, yep. So, <clears throat> Mr. Lewis, if you wanna just, you can use your finger and draw on there and show us, I think the duct tape roll is obvious, but tell us where the duct tape, piece of duct tape is. There's a piece of duct tape that's not connected to the roll. Um, it's uh, right there. All right. And so it looks like it's flipped half in half. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. And did you then um, have that piece of duct tape in your possession? Yes, I did. All right. And in, in regards to, oh, let me see here. <clears throat> In regards to um, your reporting, do you then number these items in a way that you can track them from the picture to your report? Yes. How is that done? Every item in the case is just given a sequential number, so they will all have the case number, but then it'll just be an item number. And then if something is that item is swabbed or something is removed from that, that'll be get a sub item. For instance, if um, the roll was item one and if I took a piece off, that could be item 1.1 and there could be multiple samples taken. All right. And so in this situation, that piece of the duct tape, how is that signified in your report? Is that, how is it numbered in your report? The do whole you copy of your report. I do. The whole contents of the backpack was submitted and it became item 14. Uh, the roll itself was then sub-itemed as item 14.13 and the piece of tape by itself was 14.14. .14. All right. Now I'm going to show you state's exhibit number 48. If you could tell us what that is. And state's exhibit 48 is a crime scene photograph um, showing the inside of a vehicle and specifically in this there is a camouflage jacket on the floor that was submitted to the laboratory all right and <clears throat> showing you now state's exhibit number 117 and you can also hit clear and that'll take that arrow off there okay so what are we looking at here 117 that is the same um, camouflage jacket that was on the floor of the vehicle all right and that camouflage jacket what's the significance of this jacket here there were two strips of duct tape on the front of that jacket. You can see um, one of those right there. Um, there's also one on the other side over here, but you can't see it with the way the photograph is. Okay, and so I'm gonna show you state's exhibit number 119, and what is that? <clears throat> that is a photograph of the same jacket. Um, it became BCI item four. That photograph was taken in the laboratory, and you can clearly see both pieces of duct tape on the front of the jacket. All right, now in this photograph, you place the jacket so it appears like it's um, the two front pieces are together. It looks like it could be that that tape is one solid piece, but that's it's broken. Is that fair? Correct. It's two separate pieces, one on each side. Right. <clears throat> and did you then have those two pieces of tape labeled uh, for purposes of your report? Yes. And what were they numbered? The tape was removed from the jacket and became sub-item 4.10. All right. And that's because the jacket was number four, right? Correct. Okay. <clears throat> Showing you state's exhibit number 120, if you would tell me what... Oh, first of all, this photograph here, 119, that was taken at the lab. Is that fair? Yes. And 120, do you recognize this? Yes. And what is that? Um, that is another photograph taken at the lab. That is a zip tie with a small piece of duct tape attached to the end of it at the bottom right here. All right. And um, this photograph was also taken at the lab. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. And there's some labeling on here. And it has that same uh, case number, I believe, on there, 12-36121. Yes. 
and then this was labeled as item number 11. Correct. Correct. Now we also see 11.2 and 11.1. What are those things labeled for? Those are areas um, labeled by another analyst, um, the person who took the photograph, her initials are right here. Um, her name is Christine Hammett. Um, those are where she either took samples or swabs. All right, and that was for purposes of determining blood or possible DNA, is that fair? Correct. Do you know what TMB positive means? TMB is a presumptive test for the presence of blood, so oh. that would indicate that that test was positive. For blood? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna show you state's exam number 62. You recognize this? Yes. And what is that? That is a crime scene photograph of Ashley Biggs. And what was the significance in this photograph with what you were tasked to do? Uh, this photograph shows where um, the tape was removed that was submitted to the laboratory. Um, there was an item of tape submitted as coming from Ashley Biggs' neck, and that is um, this duct tape right there. Okay. And how was that labeled in regards to your um, report? That is BCI item three. Okay. And showing you state's exhibit number 118, do you recognize that? Yes. And what is that? That is BCI item three, the same piece of duct tape that was in the previous photograph. And this tape was, in this photograph was taken at the lab? Yes. All right. And of course we see some more labeling on here, 3.1, 3.3, 3.2. That was also done by somebody other than you. Correct. And I think it's the same initials, uh, C-A-H, Christina Hammett? Yes. All right. And again, we have that TMB positive. Correct. All right. Now you wouldn't have anything to do with those portions of it. Your only task was to deal with the tape. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. All right. So now you have these, you have this piece of tape that was on her neck. You had a piece of tape that was on the zip tie. You had a piece, two pieces of tape on the jacket and you had the roll of tape. Um, I believe, did we cover all the different pieces you had at this point? Yes. All right. What did you do once you had all those different pieces and also background information on where they were located? I was to compare those pieces from the neck, from the zip tie, from the front of the jacket, compare them to the known roll of duct tape to see if I could determine whether or not they came from that roll. All right. And you were aware also that these pieces of tape were also found in separate crime scene locations, correct? Uh, the, the roll was in a separate location than the other pieces. I'm oh. not sure where everything else was. So the, the roll in the backpack, and there was a piece with that roll. Yes. And then that was separately located from the pieces that were found with Ashley on her body, on the jacket, all those things. Correct. Okay. So you were trying to determine whether the ones found in one location with the backpack and the other ones all matched up. Correct. All right. And were you able to do that? Yes. What was the process you went through to do that? The first step is to just visually examine the evidence to see if it looks consistent. Obviously, if one's gray tape and one's black tape, then it didn't come from that. Um, the next after that would be to look at the ends of the tape and to see if I could physically fit those back together, um, similar to fitting a puzzle together if something breaks, putting those pieces back together. So I would have to unroll or unravel the, the ends of the tape because it's sticky, which is why they're placed onto, a, there's a plastic transparency sheet. I could then compare those ends and see if they fit back together. All right, so it looks like you can see here in the lower corner of here, is that like an acetate type? Um, yes, clear, it's, clear, it's a clear transparency sheet that's made out of a plastic called acetate. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna show you state's exhibit number 97. If you take a look at this, tell me if you recognize this. Yes. All right. Now, again, we have the same BCI number 12-36121. Um, tell us about this. What do you, you recognize this? Yes. What is it? This is a photograph that I took at the laboratory um, showing the various ends of the tape, how they fit together. All right. And you have them labeled by those item numbers on your report. Is that fair? Yes. So item number three, what we can see over on the left side of this picture 
and you labeled it from neck. That would be Ashley's neck? Yes. All right. And then item in the middle, 11.5, that was the piece you got from the zip tie. Correct. And then on the right is item 4.10 from the jacket. Yes, that'd be one of the pieces from the jacket. One of the pieces. Now, the, the, obviously the center piece, that's a small piece. We see the entire piece of that tape, correct? Yes. But the two on the end, we don't see the other ends of those. That's just a portion of the tape. Correct. correct. It's a close-up photograph to be able to see the, the detail of how the ends fit together. All right. Showing you state's exhibit number 116. Do you recognize this? Yes. And what is this? Uh, similar, that's three separate photographs on, on one, printed on one page. All right, so let's kind of try and zoom in. Uh, zoom in on the uh, first one here, and what does that indicate? The piece on the left is one of the pieces from the jacket, and then the piece on the right is the end that is still attached to the known roll of tape. All right. <clears throat> um, and and then on the top, there looks like some blue writing that's upside down to us right now. Does that say outer edge? Is that? It appears so. Yes. All right. What is? What is, did you write that? No. Okay. So you don't know what that, what that the purpose of that is, or do you? I, the, it was previously analyzed um, by other sections, specifically our latent print section, and I would assume she's just labeling to help her know where that area is. All right, so, so the portion on the right, 14.13, is the known roll. That's the roll we saw in the backpack, the actual roll of tape, and this is the end of that roll that's still attached. Yes. And then, so now you've taken the part from the jacket and you've compared those. And based on that comparison, were you able to make an opinion or render opinion as to whether that, those two pieces, the, the item 4.10 was ripped from item 14.13? Yes. And what was that opinion? <clears throat> that the end from the known roll of tape um, physically fit together with the and from the jacket, and that means that those were originally one piece. All right, and so this roll here was at the one location, and the part on the jacket was at the separate location with Ashley, is that right? Yes. <clears throat> okay, let's look at um, the next portion here. This is the second picture in that, on that same exhibit 116. What are we looking at here? Um, this is the same photograph that we um, viewed on the previous slide. It shows the piece that was recovered from Ashley's neck as well as the zip tie and then one of the pieces from the jacket showing how those all three fit together. All right, and that was your opinion based on, on your training and experience that all three of these pieces fit together? Yes. <clears throat> and then the third picture from State's Exhibit 116. What are we looking at here? This photograph shows the two pieces that were on the front of the camouflage jacket, showing that both of those pieces fit together, indicating they were originally one piece. All right. And the MWL, is that your initials up top there? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> And then ultimately, were you able to take all those pieces together, all those pieces that you had collected and put them all together in a string to, to do a comparison? Yes. All right, I'm going to show you uh, State's Exhibit number 96. If you would tell us if you recognize this. Let me zoom out real quick here. Okay. Yes, um, I recognize that. All right, and what is this? So the previous pictures were all close-ups of where those tears were and how they fit together. This is an overall photograph showing how all the pieces fit together. So starting from the left, we have the piece that was recovered from Ashley's neck, 
connects to the smaller piece that was from the zip tie, which connects to one of the pieces from the camouflage jacket, which connects to the other piece from the cam camouflage jacket. And then all the way on the right, we have the known roll of tape. Um, that is a roll, it's kind of hard to tell from that angle, but that's a roll standing up on end, um, showing that the final piece connects back to that roll of tape, indicating that all of those pieces were originally part of that roll. All right, and that's kind of hard to see this, the tape, it's on end, is that fair, the roll? Yes, it's standing up. Right. And, and could you just circle that part just so, you, oh, I see, you, you actually say known roll. From right, the, where that arrow is right yep, here, this got is it. standing up and this is the end that's All still right. attached. In regards to these pieces of tape, we've seen previous evidence, including the photograph that we've shown here, which I believe is Stakes Exhibit 119. Um, obviously, you have removed these items so that if the jury were to have that jacket, that tape's been removed and is now part of your other exhibit. Is that fair? Correct. As I explained before, the jacket's item four. So those pieces of tape were removed, stuck to that plastic sheet, and became item 4.10. All right. Now, you indicated that you had <clears throat> prepared a report, States Exhibit 121, and you have gone over your process. Um, as far as your findings, did you put those on the report also? Yes. And what were your findings that you officially put into your report? Uh, written on the report, it says, comparisons performed between the question pieces of duct tape and the known roll of duct tape revealed a total of four matching individual tear configurations. And then based on these findings, the question pieces of tape, uh, the question pieces of duct tape originated from the known roll of tape. All right. <clears throat> and your um, opinions regarding um, the duct tape and the, the process you did, is that all based on a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Yes, it is. Your Honor, I have nothing further. Okay, thank you. Anything for the defense? Judge, we have no cross-examination. Okay. Uh, Mr. Lewis, thank you so much for your time today. You may go ahead and step down. Thank you. Thank you. Does the state have another witness? Should we take a quick break before? How many more witnesses do you have today? Yeah, why don't we um, take a quick comfort break? I'll have Adam come in and get the jury. We'll start back up at 320. Dan DeRose with 19 News coming to you as uh, we take a break in day four of the trial against that woman there. Uh, that is Erica Stefanko facing her second trial for this case. Let's remember the first trial was thrown out after it was determined uh, her husband, then husband, Chad Cobb, should not have been allowed to testify via video from prison. He is serving life in prison without the chance of parole for his role in this murder back in June of 2012, the murder of Ashley Biggs. Uh, we just watched um, some very painstaking uh, testimony in regards to, and we've got video of where that duct tape came from. Uh, we had testifying yesterday members of BCI. These are pictures of Chad and Erica's house the day after the murder. And they had uh, Chad testified after the murder they pulled in. He stripped his clothes off, which included uh, his boots, a t-shirt, uh, the backpack that was at the murder scene, and they put it on this sort of makeshift workbench. And on that workbench were basically all of the items that were used. And inside the backpack was a roll of duct tape. It was very interesting to watch forensically how they match up the ends of the piece of tape uh, to show uh, the roll that it came from. Uh, Chad, uh, on the jacket he was wearing, uh, had pieces of duct tape attached to it. 
Uh, generally, uh, in scenes like this, we've seen this before, uh, if you're going to bound somebody with duct tape, you go ahead and rip off pieces of duct tape and you attach it to your jacket that you're wearing. Uh, that way, when you need it, you just rip it off your jacket and it's right there. You're not messing around with a roll of tape. Uh, you already have the pieces ripped off. Now, all of those pieces match the evidence that was found at the home of Chad and Erica. Now, the reason you didn't see any uh, defense uh, ask any questions is I don't know that anybody is debating if there was duct tape used. The question is, did Erica use the duct tape? And I guess my one question would have been if there were any fingerprints taken from that duct tape, did the fingerprints come back to Chad or did they come back to Erica and Chad? It would sort of show a pattern, but we didn't get that question. Uh, again, we're on a short break here. Uh, again, the evidence in this part of the case has just been a little bit painstaking. Uh, we get it. Uh, you measured this. You can rip it off. You can see where the tears match. You can uh, determine and, and trace it backwards uh, as far as people uh, and committing their crimes and using these types of materials. Uh, we heard that they uh, do now have another witness uh, the question will be how many more witnesses the state has. Uh, the one person I can uh, check off my list now is the medical examiner. We heard some uh, gruesome testimony that the zip ties that we saw being uh, similar zip ties uh, to the ones found, and I assume we'll get another forensic expert, much like we saw that matched up the tape that was used was the same duct tape that was found on that table. I'm assuming there will be a forensic expert that measured and analyzed those gray zip ties that you see there, the really long ones. Uh, you can see the ends of them right there. Uh, that uh, somebody will analyze the one that was around uh, the neck of Ashley and analyze the ones that were taken off that table. But again, it, there's not much of a debate here of what, uh, what the materials were used and, and if they matched to the materials that were found at the Cobb home. Uh, the question is, in the case of uh, the woman on trial, Erica, uh, the question is, did she use those devices or were they solely used by Chad Cobb. Remember, Chad testified uh, that he didn't kill Ashley Biggs, and the reason he can say he didn't kill Ashley Biggs, although he got into a fight with her that night and used his stun gun on her that night, uh, he claims it was Erica that put the zip tie around Ashley Biggs' neck, and there really wasn't much explanation. You didn't get a lot of questions. Okay, Chad, walk us through that happen, uh, how that happened. When did, a when did Erica come back to the parking lot? When did she get back out of of the SUV that she left you uh, in the back of that parking lot. Uh, how did she get the zip tie? Where did the zip tie come from? We didn't get any of those questions. Uh, and whether that's for fear of double jeopardy, uh, whether it's uh, Chad still looking to, uh, to get his appeal thrown out, uh, which hasn't happened as of yet, uh, is just goes to show the painstaking process. So not only do I think we'll get a forensic expert around the zip tie, uh, but we also still have to hear from the detectives. The uh, detective on the case from, I believe it'll be New Franklin, will be the detective on the case. And perhaps an overall, uh, if there was somebody from BCI who was uh, maybe did an overall investigation, we might see that. Um, but the big news of today were th was this recorded conversation between Erica and Chad Cobb's mother, Cindy, uh, some very condemning conversation. It was a very condemning conversation. It was three hours long. They played snip, snippets of it all morning uh, in which uh, Erica uh, really sort of incriminates herself uh, in talking about how that she and Chad had talked about this plan. And remember, this was because of a custody dispute. Uh, and Erica saying, you know, that this was the only way to get rid of the problem. She's telling Chad's mom this and didn't know that Chad's mom was recording that entire uh, conversation. In fact, I want to play that portion of uh, the testimony where they talk about um, Chad's mom says to her, well, it took both of you to commit this crime, and you'll hear Erica admit to her role in this. Take a listen. It took both of you to, to get where you guys are today and where he is, and it's not unreasonable to be like, well, okay, you get, you get to go scot-free. Why does he have to not bear this burden? Right. I don't, it's not that I don't understand that. It's that it was not a place. It was not knowing that that had to be your perspective was not a place I wanted to be. And, I mean, I think if you were... Hey, no way in hell we're doing this. I, I don't think you would have. No, if, I, 
shouldn't have, or we could have gotten in trouble. I, there was always something that I would say to him, which I said to him repeatedly, whether he remembers or not, with the Ashley situation. You know what you can do and what you can. If this is something that you think you can do, then I'm okay with it and I agree with it. If you can't do it, then obviously you shouldn't do it. And I always threw the ball back in his court. I don't think those are the exact words that I used that night yeah. because we already have been over that so many times. Like, I, you know, we would, we would fight about it. Like, I'm like, this, this is the only way the situation is going to go away. And, I and there it was. This is the only way the situation is going to go away. She said they battled about it. She said she may not have put it in those words that night. Uh, but she said, you can only do what you can do. Uh, and she said, we've been over it so many times. This is the only way for this problem to go away. Uh, that's pretty incriminating. That sounds like they had talked about this, uh, that the only way to make this problem go away. And let's be honest, the problem was Ashley Biggs because Ashley was trying to get sole custody of the daughter between Ashley and Chad. Uh, we're talking about Grace here. Uh, so we're going to play another uh, portion of this that talks about the phone call, uh, the phone call that was made that night to lure Ashley out to that building with the fake pizza delivery. That's the whole reason Chad's mom recorded this conversation, because she, she has testified that previously standing face to face with Erica, Erica had admit, admitted to making that phone call, but Chad's mom said she couldn't do anything with that. It was just her word versus my word. And if I had gone to police, they're not going to believe me. I'm Chad's mom. They think I'm after Erica. So here comes Erica over to their house, uh, to Cindy's house, and she has the idea of getting out a digital recorder, setting it on the bar. They admit to each having one drink over this course of three hours. And here's Erica spilling her guts. And so the mom has to ask her yet again about the phone call. And she, you'll see her here in the beginning of this. This is Chad's mom saying uh, there was a point in time where you told me to my face that you made the phone call and listen to Erica's very specific response. I believe it was. And that's not a lie. Take a listen. There's no lie in that is what she said. She said uh, Chad had a, a part in it. This was what Chad said we were going to do. I played my role. It's not like Chad had a gun to my head is exactly what she said. And I want to listen to that uh, that portion again. It is kind of tough to hear, uh, but if you listen to it pretty close, uh, she talks about and there's no lie in that. Again, the first part of this conversation you're going to hear is Chad's mom saying there was one time face to face. You told me you made the call, meaning the call to the pizza place. Is that a fair and accurate representation of the recording on March 2014? Yes, ma'am. Okay, during that portion of the recording, you stated at one time you told me face to face that you made the phone call and that you set up the meeting, the meeting. Um, I mean, and that you had told me, um, and Ms. Lyons said the defendant, there's no lie in that. Um, what were you talking about at that point in time? What was your conversation about? What phone call and what meeting? The phone call to order the pizza and have it delivered. And there it is, a very damning piece of evidence. 
Uh, again, the defense played, replayed a couple of the clips uh, of that conversation. Uh, I had said uh, when the defense started cross-examination and then they took a little bit of a recess, I said, if the defense has any shot here of dismissing this conversation, of getting it you know, so that the jury can poke holes in it, they better be playing clips throughout that conversation where there were other times that Erica said, oh, but by the way, I'm completely innocent. I didn't do anything, and you know that, right? And uh, there were no none of those clips. There, there was clearly nothing in there uh, from this conversation in 2014 uh, that uh, she was claiming her innocence. So you might be asking if this was a recording in 2014, how did it take until 2019 to get Erica charged and her trial in 2020 in the trial which she's found guilty and sentenced to life and thrown out. There's a huge time gap there. And it turns out that Cindy, Chad's mom, after she made that recording, she apparently put that device, a digital device in their family gun safe. She didn't think about it ever again until 2018 when the family apparently got a new safe and the old one had to be cleaned out. She claims that's when she got it out again and she listened to it and that's when she decided that maybe the authorities needed to hear this device. And so when she went to the authorities, they made it a point to put it on the record in court that she went to not only the detective, but also the prosecutor sat down with her before they even took the device. And they told her, look, you understand that by giving us this device does not mean Chad is going to get out of prison, to get out of his life sentence without parole. And she said she understood that, she had been made no promises, and that she still could have made the decision to take that device away and leave with it, but she gave it to the authorities. That's ultimately what led to Chad's, or I'm sorry, to Erica's arrest uh, in all of this and now on trial. As is the case again, we are late coming back from break. Uh, that is just how this court rolls. Some courts are disciplined, this one is not. Uh, another delay uh, getting everybody in. But again, uh, when we look at uh, the evidence that was found, uh, I think what we'll have to see is more of this evidence tying this scene where they came home and Chad stripped off his t-shirt, uh, his boots that were muddy from the cornfield where he left the body, uh, the zip ties, uh, there was even uh, uh, army makeup compacts inside, camouflage makeup compacts, uh, one of them looked used. Uh, you saw that uh, if you've been following this trial, if you watched uh, from some of the testimony and evidence pictures that were brought out today, thought the defense did a very good job of laying out all of the pieces of camouflage uh, from the hat to the mask to the jacket to the pants, laid it all out on a table. It was very intimidating. Even the gloves were in position as if it was on a body. Uh, did a very good job of showing how intimidating that would have been. And of course, there's, there's no debate as to who was wearing all that camouflage and carried out that portion of the attack. Uh, it has also been a disturbing afternoon in court uh, with the autopsy and the doctor, the medical examiner, uh, make sure I get her name correct, Dr. Lisa Kohler, uh, giving her findings. And it wasn't that so much uh, that uh, Ashley Biggs suffocated because of that zip tie that was around her neck. It was more that the blood supply had been cut off to her neck. Uh, that zip tie had been placed so tight uh, that it cut off the blood supply and they, that ultimately is what led to her death. You did hear the defense try and do a pretty good part and didn't get into it a lot, but asked the medical examiner to put a zip tie that tight on someone it would take quite a bit of force and the medical examiner agreed. Medical examiner also said there were scrape marks uh, by the neck of uh, what they call the ligature or the zip tie. Uh, that shows uh, generally, she said she couldn't say for sure whether it was a scratch mark from the struggle of the fight or of the attacker or if they were the scratch marks of Ashley trying to get that zip tie off her neck. Uh, but what that does do is it shows that when the zip tie was put around her neck, 
Uh, more than likely, she was alive and conscious uh, when that happened. But again, she can't say for sure that those were Ashley's uh, scratch marks, but they were consistent with someone trying to get uh, that zip tie uh, off their neck. Still waiting to come back from court, uh, to come back from recess. Uh, was supposed to be over uh, just about uh, now coming up on 10 minutes ago. Uh, so we'll see maybe if there's a delay, perhaps there were attorney, one of the attorneys, uh, whether it's the state uh, had to go into the judge, make a request, or if they're looking for their next witness, there's a whole host of things uh, that could delay. And we've seen just about every single one of those delays in this case, uh, as it has not been the smoothest process. But a lot of that, some of it has to go back to the fact that this is a retrial and you need to keep the jury in the dark. Uh, that there has been a trial before uh, and that she has been convicted, that uh, Erica Stefanko has already been convicted, but that conviction thrown out uh, because of a technicality, because Chad Cobb testified from prison with a mask on. Uh, we've spoken with our defense analyst, uh, Jared Klebenow, who said, while that seems like a technicality to you or I, you have to remember if Chad Cobb had been in the courtroom the first time, the jury would be able to read the body language, the face of Chad Cobb. Uh, as it were, during COVID, he was testifying via Zoom with a mask on. Uh, and that doesn't give the jury the opportunity to read body language, uh, to see facial expressions of Chad, uh, to trying to determine if, there, if he was lying or not. Uh, and so that's why it was thrown out and we have our retrial. Uh, we saw during the um, graphic testimony by the medical examiner, Ashley Biggs' mother had to uh, leave the courtroom. It was too much at one point. Uh, it was, they were pretty graphic pictures. Uh, I can tell you there was one set of pictures where uh, the skin had been opened up in Ashley's neck. Not only that, but some of the muscles had been picked up to show just how deep the bruising was inside the neck. Um, uh, the medical examiner said even if someone uh, has hung themselves, uh, that you don't get that type of bruising inside the muscles in the neck. Uh, and that's why that this was uh, such a violent way to go and that uh, that um, that ligature, the uh, zip tie was so tight uh, that that's what cut off the brain, uh, the blood supply uh, to her brain. Uh, still waiting to get back here um, from our recess. Something is, tells me that there might be a little bit of an issue that uh, something is being discussed. Uh, I've got another way of checking right over here on my side that I can see that the uh, we're not uh, back in court as of yet. Uh, so let's play a little bit more of the conversation between that was recorded between Chad's mom and Erica again in 2014. This would have been less than a year after Chad's already been sentenced uh, or around the time. And in fact, you have to keep in mind as Erica is talking to Chad's mom, she is already uh, dating slash pregnant with Chad's best friend's child, uh, the best friend Mike Stefanko. That's why her name is now Erica Stefanko and not Erica Cobb. Uh, let's take a listen to uh, this is a conversation uh, between uh, uh, Chad's mom and Erica talking about it took two of you to do this, uh, to get this, uh, to do this crime. And you'll hear Erica again explain uh, that she had thought it all out and that she had uh, talked to Chad and perhaps uh, when she explained to Chad the options, maybe she should have, in her words, left one of them out, meaning maybe she, she should have left out the idea of killing Ashley. Uh, take a listen. <laughs>
can do, then I'm okay with it and I agree with it. If you can't do it, then obviously you shouldn't do it. And I always threw the ball back in his court. I don't think those are the exact words that I used that night because we already have been over that so many times. Like, I, you know, we would, we would fight about it. Like, I'm like, this, this is the only way the situation is going to go away. And I feel like he really felt, I didn't know that at the time, but he really felt pressured by me to do something about it. He really felt pressured by me to do something about it. Uh, if that doesn't show um, that someone has talked it out, has planned it out, has, give you, has given you the suggestion of taking the life of the problem uh, as she was referred, uh, then uh, that's, uh, I, I don't know what uh, could uh, be more damning to a case. Uh, our Brittany Weir has been covering this for us on the television side of things. Uh, she just filed her three o'clock report uh, live on Cleveland 19. So let's take a look at uh, uh, Brittany's story that ran just minutes ago. Take a look. Do I think it took two of you to get to where it is today? Yeah. Well, that I'm not disagreeing with that, but it took two of us. It wasn't, he's trying to put it all on me, and that's not right. And the problem, reason that I Erica Stefanko back in court Thursday for the fourth day of this trial. The jury having to decide whether Stefanko played a key role in the death of Ashley Biggs. Cindy Cobb, Erica's ex-mother-in-law, recording a three-hour conversation they had about the night of the murder. And do I feel bad about what happened to her? Not really. Do I, have, do I feel bad about what happened to everybody else? Absolutely. Could I take it back if I could? Yes, I would. In the recording, you can hear Erica expressing to Cindy how she is worried that Chad is going to expose everything. I just, I can't have him calling me and telling me, giving me ultimatums, this is what's going to happen or else. I, like, I can't, I can't function that way and I can't respond to that in a normal kind of a way. Again, uh, some great work by our Brittany Weir there uh, transcribing. Uh, what is sometimes hard to hear uh, conversations, but uh, really gets to the heart of this. Uh, and, and in all actuality, as somebody who's now listened uh, to the testimony and the, uh, the, the important portions of that conversation, it's very clear. Uh, Erica starts off that conversation very early on. First of all, uh, Chad's mom off offers her something to drink, offers her a Pepsi, and she says, do you have anything stronger? And she says, as in, and she says, vodka. And so immediately makes her a, some sort of drink or a mixer with a vodka, and they start this conversation. And it's pretty clear that Erica's main concern is this ultimatum, is that she's been speaking with Chad in prison, whether it's by phone uh, or text messages, uh, and Chad keeps giving her these ultimatums about uh, letting his family see the kids, or I'm gonna tell the police everything. And if they find out uh, the role we both played, we'll both be in prison. And so in, from what I have heard of this conversation, this is Erica trying to get Chad's mom to calm Chad down. Uh, basically saying, hey, I can't live like this. And, and almost like we need to work together. I need you to talk to Chad. Uh, she's like, because every time I hear sirens, I think they're coming to get me to put me in prison. And in fact, at one point, uh, she does say, and I want to make sure I get this right, in this conversation, she says, if it really is his intention, I need to make plans, as, as in if this is really his intention of, of telling police everything, if it really is his intention, I need to know to make plans before I go to prison, I need someone to take care of my kids. So right there, that statement alone, if you're innocent in all of this, you're not worried about making plans for your kids. Uh, because you're going to prison. If you're innocent, you're saying, if this is really his intention, uh, I need to go get an attorney because I didn't do anything. I, I have nothing to do with this. I didn't, I didn't plan any of this. All the stuff he's saying to you and to me is untrue. You don't make a statement like, oh, I need to make plans because clearly I'm going to prison. Uh, again, I think it is such a damning piece of evidence uh, that's going to be in the hands of the jury, but put yourself in the jury's, juror's shoes and they're going to have this same conversation that I'm having right now with each other when they get this case. Now, let's be honest, this is still in the state's hands. The states, these are the state witnesses. This is the prosecution of Erica. 
her defense, her team, her team of attorneys is going to get their chance to be able to call their witnesses, uh, to be able to maybe refute some of the stuff. They've already had their chance to refute what was in that recorded conversation, and uh, they were unable to do so. Uh, clearly, um, nothing was said in Cross uh, that was this big revelation that was like, oh, that's why she was saying it. You know, they didn't, didn't come out with anything like that. I'm not even sure who you call as a defense team. Uh, we've seen uh, in other cases, high profile cases, it'll come time to, uh, to the defense. And if, if they think they haven't, uh, that the state hasn't proven anything, they won't call a single witness. I, I don't think that's the case here. I think the state uh, has proven a lot uh, in this and she is in a precarious situation. Keep in mind, she's already been found guilty once. And I think, think if you're objective about this, you can see why a jury has already found her guilty once. We'll see if perhaps uh, her attorneys this time around were able to come up with a better strategy. Uh, I, I have been sitting here watching this and trying to think, wow, you know, what, what kind of strategies could you have uh, rolled out there that maybe you roll out the strategy that Chad was super abusive and he forced her into this. Well, that phone call negates that. She even says he didn't have a gun to my head. Uh, it wasn't like he forced me to do this. So, it, I mean, I re it really is tough to understand what uh, the defense will be uh, for Erica Stefanko. Again, these are the, uh, uh, the people in play here. Ashley Biggs murdered in 2012. Uh, it was Chad Cobb who started the attack and on the stand he claims he just beat, he beat up Ashley, that he did not kill her. He was asked several times, did you kill uh, Ashley Biggs? And he said, no, I did not kill her. Uh, and they said, well, zip tie around her neck killed her. So who did that? And he said, Erica put it around her neck. Uh, so uh, not a lot even done to refute that. Um, still in a recess, uh, we are now more than uh, 15 minutes behind schedule. Uh, a 30 minute recess tells me uh, there is an issue. Something has been brought up. Perhaps a witness is not ready, is not uh, there. Uh, I would hope that, uh, and in fact, if this was a situation where they were going to end for the day, I would assume the judge would have to bring the jury back in at least to simply say, you're gonna go home for the day, give the instructions of not to talk about it, not to look this up, uh, not to watch any news coverage. Uh, of this case and not to talk to family. Uh, but while we wait to see what the delay is, let's listen to one more clip of this recorded conversation. Uh, we've got that. We and in fact, uh, let's go to the cross-examination of Cindy Cross or Cindy Cobb. Uh, you've got to poke a hole as to why she had this recording. Why did she hang on to it for four years? Uh, and was this an attempt uh, to perhaps get her son out of prison? Uh, and so this is the cross-examination. This is uh, Erica Stefanko's attorney trying to poke holes. That's what you do as a defense. Uh, that way, when the jury goes in for deliberations, uh, perhaps there's one or two or more. You only need one uh, person in that jury deliberation room that says, uh, I, I don't know, and I, I have some doubt here, and that's, that's kind of all you need. So let's watch this cross-examination. This was, again, earlier today, the cross-examination of, of Cindy Cobb. Given how you've described this tape and the alleged admissions on there, you... you you turned that tape over on March 5th, 2014, right? Yes. You turned it over the next day? No, I'm sorry. I thought you said 18. Oh, I thought because of the importance of it, as, as you're saying it is, that you'd want to get it to law enforcement right away, right? I didn't realize what was all on there. I had a lot going on when I made the recording. Okay. Um, is... Is part of the reason that you, you didn't know what was on there is because you guys were drinking a lot? No, sir. So if you weren't drinking a lot, how do you not know what's on there? It was just a lengthy conversation, dealing with the barn, just getting off from vacation. When I relocated it and played it and realized what was on there, then I turned it over. How long, tell the jury how long you had exclusive dominion and control 
over this alleged tape? I think it was about four years. Four years? I believe so. So in four years, you never once called Detective Hitchens? No. In four years, you never once called the Wayne County Sheriff's Department where you no. lived? Did you tell anybody about it? No. This was your little secret, right? I didn't realize it was a secret till I replayed it. So you have to ask the question, do you believe Cindy Cobb? Uh, here is the mom, uh, has this recording. As you can see, we are back in court. Uh, do you believe that she didn't know what was on that tape and she didn't turn it just over? Just let me make sure it catches up for a second to turn off the courtroom cameras. Hey, Adam, can you tell Tristan the courtroom camera is still on? There we go. And now the witness. And please tell him that the witness... Okay, now all the cameras are on. <laughs> okay, we're almost there. We just have to remove the courtroom camera. Okay, I think we are, hold on one second. Okay, now it is. Okay, we're good now, thank you. Good afternoon. Could you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, Thank you. Go ahead and have a seat, ma'am. The chair doesn't move, but it spins. Okay? So have a seat, and then you spin around. Say hello. Hello. Okay, and just for the record, um, this witness did not want to be photographed, recorded, or filmed. That is correct, Your Honor. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, good afternoon. Hello. Will you please state your first name and last name, spelling your last name for the record? Mary Brinkman, B-R-I-N-K-M-A-N. All right. Um, did you have any trouble finding the courthouse today? No. All right. Um, and you did not come from Summit County or the surrounding area to get here, did you? Uh, actually, yes, I live in Summit County. Do you live in Summit County? Where do you live? Norton. Oh, okay. And. 2012, did you live in Norton? Uh, 2012, I lived in Barberton. Oh, okay. All right. You um, live in Norton. Who do you live with? Uh, my husband and my boys. Okay. How many children do you have? I have seven. Okay. How many boys? How many girls? Six boys, one girl. How does your girl do in that household with all those brothers? Um, she doesn't live at home anymore. So oh, okay. She's... Did she hold her own when she was growing oh, up? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Is she the oldest? Yes. Okay. All right. Is she off um, at college? Uh, no, she works full time. Okay. How long have you been married? Um, it will be 16 years this June. And we've heard testimony about a Ben Brinkman. Is that your husband? Yes. All right. All right. Let's talk about um, why you're here today, State of Ohio versus Erica Stefanko, and mm -hmm. there are some different individuals that are involved in this case. So I'm gonna say some names, and will you please let the jury know how do you know or not know that individual, okay? Okay. So if I say the name Chad Cobb, do you know Chad Cobb? Yes, I do. How do you know Chad Cobb? Uh, Chad and my husband, Ben, were friends in school. You learned that from your husband, Ben? Yes. Did they maintain a relationship after you met Ben and was married to Ben? Yes. 
How about Erica, Erica now Erica Stefanko, maybe Erica Lyon or Erica Cobb? Yes. You know that individual? Yes. How do you know that individual? Um, her and I met her through Chad. Her and Chad were a couple. Okay. Um, okay. Did you all do anything together as couples, you and um, Ben and Chad and Erica? Uh, we did have a couple of, um, there was a couple get-togethers. Um, I think we went out to dinner once or twice. Okay. Did you ever go over each other's house and uh, socialize or anything like that? A few times. Okay. And how would you consider your, or how would you classify your relationship with Chad and Erica as a couple? Um, I would say we were friendly, but we weren't like super close. How would you classify your relationship with Chad as an individual? Um, friends. Um, yeah, I would, I would say friends. Okay. And up until 2012, was Chad and Ben, uh, did they hang out? Yeah, they, um, they would get together and hang out some. They would call each other, that kind of thing. Okay, how often do you think would they hang out? Going back to 2012, um, not like all the time or often. Um, you know, they were busy carrying on their own lives, work, family, but. Um, they would see. make it happen sometimes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You said work and family. Um, is Ben employed? Yes. And where does Ben work? He works at a factory in Doylestown. Okay. And how about you? Are you employed? Yes. And what kind of work do you do? I work in customer service. Okay. And how long have you been in customer service? Um, with this employer, three years, but in total, quite a long time. Okay. Are you familiar if Chad had employment? Yes. Where did Chad work? Uh, he was um, a cable installer. Are you aware if he had his own company? Yes. Okay. Does Cobb Cable Company sound familiar? Yes, it does. All right. How about Erica? Um, all right, well, first of all, I'm going to talk about Erica Stefanko throughout this trial, um, mm -hmm. Erica Cobb or Erica Lyon. Do you see that individual in court today? Yes. Will you please point to that individual for the, uh, will you please point and describe what that individual is wearing? Um, white shirt, black pants. Your Honor, will you please let the record reflect the witness has identified the defendant? Yes, so noted. And whenever we talk about what, whatever last name we use, Cobb, Lyon, or Stefanko, the Erica we are referring to is the one sitting in court today. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. Are, are you aware if the defendant was employed? Um, I don't remember her being employed, to be honest. Okay, that's fine. I'm going to talk about two other names, okay? Mm -hmm. Ashley Biggs. Are you familiar with an individual by the name of Ashley Biggs? I know of her, yes. How do you know of Ashley? Um, just from hearing Ben and Chad talk about her. Okay. And from what you know of her, who do you believe Ashley Biggs was in reference to Chad? Um, I know that she was the mother of his daughter. Okay. So you're aware that Chad has a daughter? Yes. Okay. Um, how many children does Chad have? Chad has three. Okay. Are you familiar with all three children? Yes. It's Grace, if I say FC and KC. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know who I'm talking about, FC yeah. and KC. Okay. Hmm. All right. Do you know who the mother of FC and KC is? Yes. And who is that? Erica. Have you had an opportunity throughout the years, of course, prior to 2012, did you ever interact with Ashley and Chad? I only met Ashley one time. Okay. Um, ben and I had went to lunch or dinner or something of that nature, and she was our server. Oh, okay. Oh, so you, you didn't meet her through an interaction where she was with Chad. You met her in her official capacity at work? Yes. Did you know you were going to where she worked? No. 
It was just by happenstance you showed up where she was working. Yeah. Did you know who she was at the time? I had no idea until Ben told me who she was. Oh, okay. Ben alerted you to who she was. Did mm -hmm. your husband know Ashley? I believe so, yes. Okay. And that would have been through Chad or his friendship with Chad? Yes. Okay. Has Ashley ever been over your house? No, never. Okay. Are you familiar with an individual by the name of Brittany Dunson? I've heard her name, but I don't know her. Okay. Never seen her? Never talked to her? No. How about your husband? Do you think your husband ever seen her or talked to her? No, not to my knowledge, no. Okay. And the name Brittany Dunson, uh, what significance, uh, when you said you've heard of her, what significance does her name, uh, what did you hear about Brittany? I just know that she was in a relationship with Ashley. Okay. All right. Now, we talked a little bit about uh, Chad's children, and one of the first children you mentioned was Grace. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever seen Chad interact with Grace? Yes. Has Grace ever been to your house? Yes. Has Grace ever played with your children? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go down the line. How about FC and KC? Have they ever been to your house? Yes. And interacted with your and played with your children? Yes. Okay. How uh, is Chad, from what you have observed, how was Chad with Grace and FC and KC? Um, Chad was, I mean, there was always rules. He was like a, you know, um, I don't want to say a strict parent, but a strict parent. But, I mean, he was always great with them. He would play with them, and okay. he was like a big kid, got down to their level. Okay. How long would you say um, you have known the defendant? Approximately when in their relationship did you meet the defendant? I think I met her um, maybe a year to year and a half before Ben and I were married. Okay, and when were you and Ben married? 2008. Okay, so you met her a year before that. Okay. Sorry. All right. I talked about um, multiple individuals. There's two more individuals. Um, are you familiar with an individual by the name of Cindy Cobb? Yes. How do you know Cindy Cobb? Uh, Cindy is Chad's mom, and we're friends with her. Okay. Are you friends with Cindy through Chad, or did you know Cindy prior to Chad? Through Chad. Oh, through Chad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, how did you get to know Cindy through Chad? Um, we had uh, been invited. I think the first time was they had um, like a luau kind of party at their house. And we went to that and we kind of just, you know, became friends with her through that. Okay. And you met her husband, Jay, when you yes. were there? Okay. So apart from knowing and being friends with Chad, um, did you keep in contact with Cindy and Jay separately? Uh, yeah, through the years, yes, we have. Okay, so whether or not you talk to Chad, you would still keep in contact with Cindy and Jay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You made that friendship at that luau, and it just continued? Yeah. All right. Let me see. All right. Well, let's turn our attention to why you're here today. State of Ohio versus Erica Stefanko. Um, now, with Grace, were you, State of Ohio versus Erica Stefanko, leading up to that, did you know anything about any type of court process or custody battles that was going on? Um, not so much. Um, no, not until... She was taken away. Grace was taken away. Oh, okay. So prior to Grace being taken away, um, you did not know any court stuff was going on? No. 
no court stuff, stuff may not may have been going on at all. Um, and if it was, you did not know anything about it. If it was, I don't recall it. No. And when you saw Ashley, approximately how old was Grace? Um, meaning when in her life did you see or know Ashley was around? Um, when I was aware of Ashley, Grace might have been, um, maybe three or four, maybe, okay. when she was little. And after that, did you ever see or did Chad reference Ashley? Do you know if she was around? No, I just knew that Chad was a single dad. Okay. Now, you said not until, um, when did you find out that there was a custody battle? Um, I really became aware when um, Grace, Grace was taken from school. Okay. That, that yes. October 5th, 2011. Does that sound about right? Yes. How did you become aware of that? Um, Chad had called Ben and told him that Grace was taken. Did Chad confide in um, Ben quite often? Not all the time, no. Um, you know, he would kind of uh, keep Ben apprised of, you know, things, but to say confide, I really don't think so. But they were good enough friends where if something was on his mind or troubling him, he make call Ben for an ear just to, to talk? Maybe, yeah. Okay. Now... What happened, if you know? What were you apprised of that happened after um, as you took it, she came and took Grace that day, October 5th? Do you know of any court process or, or hearings that were taking place? Um, just bits and pieces. Um, they would go to, I would be aware that they were in court um, and that they wouldn't give Grace back to Chad. Um, but I really didn't know details or anything of that nature. And what you learned, was that mainly from your husband when Chad and Ben were talking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, um, you know, Chad, uh, Ben would talk to me about it and sometimes I was around Chad when he was talking about it. How about the defendant? Were you ever around her or would she ever just call and talk to you? Um, we weren't really talk on the phone kind of friends. Um, but yeah, we would talk about it whenever we were around each other. Okay. Okay. Maybe not talk on the phone with friends, but comfortable enough to discuss personal lives with each other. Yes. Okay. Alrighty. So I'm going to move up forward a little bit. Um, were you aware or told, are you aware of what happened on June the um, 20th to June 21st, 2012? Yes. Okay. What do you know about what happened on June 20th and 20th, 2012 to June 21st, 2012? I am aware that that is when Ashley passed away. Okay. Are you aware that Chad Cobb was charged out of that incident? Yes. Okay. Now, after that happened and Chad Cobb was charged out of that incident, did you have any contact with his mother? Yes. I mean, as friends, did you call and um, console or... No, I'm, I'm not the calling type person, to be okay. completely honest. Um, but, um, yes, I had talked to her a few times afterwards in person. Okay. Oh, in person. Mm -hmm. And that's going over one person's house or another person's house or a social event? Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you know what happened to the children? 
Um, yes, um, the children, um, FC and KC, were taken away into children's services. Do you know what happened to Grace? Grace was, I, I want to say she went into children's services for a little while, and then she went, um, she was placed with Jay and Cindy. Okay. Now, at some point in time, you said they were FC and Casey were taken away. Did you have any dealings with FC after June 20th? Were they ever in your care? Yes. Um, they went to children's services first and placed with their grandmother, but we took them and cared for them as well. Okay, two things. Um, they were put in children's services first, and then they were placed with their grandmother. Was that Cindy or a different grandmother? I bl it was Erica's mother. Okay, Erica's mother. Mm -hmm. Tell the jury how the children came to be with you. Um, they were, um, we had offered, and I know that Chad had wanted us to be guardians of the children. Um, and we had told him we were okay with being guardians of the children as well. Um, and her mother would, um, bring them over to our house. We would care for them if she needed like a break or you know, something like that. They were in our care a lot, actually. Okay. And when you say a lot, did they stay overnight, multiple nights? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. How long did that go on? Uh, a few months. Okay. And what? how did it stop? What ended it? Um, children's services came and took the kids out of our care. Do you know why, if you know? I don't know how they were alerted that we had them. Um, it came to find out later on that we were never supposed to be caring for them. Um, and somehow or another, they found out and they just, they came and took the kids. Okay. Um, and you said had them. Is this caring for them? You said overnight, couple months. Was this continuous overnight for months? Not for months on end. They would go back to Erica's mother and then we would you know, take them back again. I mean, we would have them in our care for um, days at a time, weeks. Okay. How did, were you still talking to the defendant at this time as well? Off and on. Okay. Did that affect your relationship with the defendant? I believe so, yes. Why do you believe so? Um, because at one point I had said something about um, things just didn't kind of seem right. Like I didn't feel like having the kids was the right thing. And I wanted to kind of call and talk to like a caseworker to see what my rights were. You know, what do I need to do? And she kind of stopped talking to us as much. And then when the kids were taken, I never heard from her again. Okay. And when you say taken, taken from you. Taken from me. Do you know yes. where they, when the uh, child services came and took them from you, do you know where they took them? Not physically, but was it back in foster care? Was it to another relative? Um, it was foster care. Okay. Oh, so you had them. You wanted to see what was going on, called children's services, child services. But that prompted them to come to your house. Is that a fair statement? I never even made a call to Children's Services. I don't know how they found out. Oh, okay. Somehow they found out, came to your house, and the children were removed. Yes. And returned to foster care. Yes. After that, you had no further conversations with the defendant? No. Okay. And then you said you, Chad uh, was okay or wanted you to be their guardian? Mm -hmm. Is Is there, um, how did you know that? Um, he had told us. Okay. Are you godparents or were you present at a baptism for one of their children? Yes, we are godparents to faith. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked as States Exhibit 8.
Yes. <laughs> what are what are we looking at in this picture? Uh, that is the baptismal record. And that is for um, Faith Cobb? Yes. That would have been on November 4th, 2010? Yes. Approximately how old was Faith at that time? Faith was... Is this person under 18? Is this oh, FC? oh, see, yes. Yeah. Okay, if we could I just apologize. refer. That's yes. okay, not your fault, not your fault. Thank no. you. Thank um, you. I'm sorry. It's okay. FC was... Maybe a year old, I think. How did this come about? How did you end up becoming her godmother? Um, there was a period of time where um, Chad was looking into becoming a member of our faith, and he had wanted his kids baptized, and um, he asked Ben and I to be his god, uh, her godparents. Okay. At that time... Um, do you know if Chad and Erica were married at that time? I have no idea. Okay. Was Erica around or was she okay with this as well? Yes, to my okay. knowledge, yes. Okay. She was aware and knew all of this was happening. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. And this is State's Exhibit Number 8. Is this a fair and accurate uh, representation of the Certificate of Baptism for FC? Yes. Okay. Now, at some point in time after, oh, give me one second. After June twentieth uh, to twenty first, uh, Chad Cobb was charged um, with the murder of Ashley Biggs. Are you aware of that? Yes. Okay. And he was sentenced to prison. Yes. Okay. Are you aware of what his sentence is? I believe it is life with no parole. I think. That is correct. Since Chad has been sentenced, have you talked to him? Yes. Okay. Um, and he, have you visited him? Yes, we have. Okay. And we, that's you and your husband? Yes. Okay. How often, and this is in the beginning, I think mm -hmm. he was sentenced in 2013. How mm -hmm. often did you used to visit Chad? Um, we have only visited Chad... Mm, handful of times. Okay. Um, we mainly had written back and forth. Okay. So letters, you write letters? We used to, yes. Okay. And used to, when did that stop approximately? When you think that stopped? Um, when I learned how to use the email system for prisoners. Do you still do that? Is it the tablet? Um, it's um, JPEG. Oh, okay. And do you still do that today? Sometimes it's been a while. Not today, but in present times. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about Ben? Uh, Ben's not much of a writer or doesn't utilize electronics that much. And when you say we went down, are you talking about you and your husband or did you and Cindy or maybe some of his family go together? Um, the f I want to say the first time we went and seen him was, it was just me and Ben. And then there was one time we did go with Cindy. And then we went another time, um, my husband and my daughter and I. Okay. Okay. Now, I want to talk about after, um, a little after uh, Ashley Biggs um, had been murdered sometime mm -hmm. in July. Um, and that would have been July 2012. Mm -hmm. Did you and Erica have dinner together? Yes. I would like you to tell the jury about that. I want to talk about that. How did that dinner come about? Um, we had invited her over for dinner um, maybe a couple weeks after everything happened. Okay. Um, and she accepted and okay. came over to our house. Was there any purpose of you inviting her over to dinner? Um, we wanted to, number one, show our support. Um, we were kind of like, we didn't really know really anything that was going on. We were like, you know, we wanted to show our support um, and be friendly. Okay. 
Did she accept your dinner invitation? Yes. All right, let's talk about that dinner. Approximately, uh, what time did she come over? Was this an early dinner, late dinner? Doesn't have to be the exact <laughs> time. Um, yeah, that's, that's a long time ago to remember. Um, I remember it was um, maybe, I don't know, early evening -ish. Okay. Who did she come over to your house with? It was just her. Okay. She drove? Yes. Okay. And how was she when she came in? She was seemed like her old normal self. Okay. Nothing unusual about the way she was acting, walking, talking? No, not when she came in, no. Okay. Who all was at dinner from you? Did you have any extra any people from your family at dinner? Just our kids and my husband and I. Okay, well, tell us about that dinner. Was um, well, we had dinner. We were redoing our kitchen at the time, so we had dinner in the basement. We had our table set up in the basement. Um, I remember that we had a like a baked penne kind of thing. Um, I mean, for us, it, it's just a pretty normal dinner, enjoying each other's company, you know, as much as you can with a bunch of kids hanging around. Were they all at the, was it a big table, everybody sitting at the table? Yes. Or was it a kid's table and an adult table? Mm -hmm. No, everybody, we were all at one table. Okay. Was there small conversation, lively talk at dinner? Mm -hmm. Yeah, during dinner, yeah. We had normal conversation. Okay, approximately how long do you think dinner lasted? Maybe 20 minutes. 20 minutes and the kids were done, they were ready to be done with the whole sitting at the table thing. Okay. Well, what happened after dinner? Um, Where kids, did your kids go? The kids went upstairs. Okay. Um, kids went upstairs to play, but we hang out in the basement chatting with the adults. Oh, okay. All, all of you, you, Ben, and the defendant? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So what happened while you were there? Did you all stay at home? Did you make run any errands? Um, I remember that uh, me and Erica had went to um, Acme downtown, um, grabbed some drinks for dinner, and, you know, had those after dinner. Okay, so I'm sorry, I skipped over that. You went downtown to Acme prior to dinner? Yes. What prompted that? Honestly, I cannot recall what prompted that. Um, Probably just felt like having a drink. That's right. Did um, who all went to Acme? Just me and Erica. Oh, okay. Did you drive or did Erica drive? I believe I drove. Okay. I think, yeah. Do you remember what you purchased? What type of alcohol? I had, uh, I think it was Mike's Hard Lemonade, like the cherry flavor, I think, um, and she had screwdrivers. Okay. Did you all have anything to drink at dinner? Uh, me and her did not. I do believe um, my husband may have had a beer with dinner. Okay. So after dinner, um, you all are talking. You said you stayed in the basement? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. When did you and or Erica start drinking? It would have been after dinner, after the kids went upstairs. Okay. Did you, um, and I'm not familiar with those drinks. Is that, are those drinks you can drink out the bottle or do you need a glass? No, those are just um, the, like the six pack bottles that you get. Um, I just, we just had one at dinner, after dinner. Oh, okay. And this is not something you buy. Can we do a quick sidebar? Andrew Rose with 19 News here. Uh, the judge uh, apparently doing exactly what I'm thinking. Where are we going with this? Uh, this is some of the most drawn out testimony I've ever heard uh, for something that at this point seems benign. Now, uh, unless she tells us that with these drinks, although she just said they each had one, uh, that all of a sudden Erica starts spilling her guts as to what she knew. I'm not exactly sure where we're going with this testimony. And, 
They are family friends. They are, um, they are the godparents of FC, one of the uh, Cobb children. But again, where are we going with this? And let's get to it. This has been a long trial and we're not even halfway through. All right. Um, you said that uh, you, you both only had one drink. As I recall, yes. Okay. Did you all have conversation that night? Yes. Who all was down in the basement when you had conversation? Uh, just us adults, me, Ben and Erica. Okay. Will you tell the jurors what that conversation was about? Um, we had, um, there was the discussion of, um, you know, Chad being in jail, um, that uh, the investigators had come to the house and there was um, evidence that was missed that they didn't get. Who said that? Erica. And what was her demeanor when she said that? Kind of like when you know you, you pull a prank on somebody and you're waiting for them to, you know, pick up on it and you're kind of like, you know, gleeful, happy that you pulled a prank on somebody. Okay. So she said there was evidence that the detectives missed um, and she was gleeful about it. Uh, did she make any statements about what happened on June 20th or 21st of 2012? She had indicated that um, she had dropped Chad off at um, where everything happened and that she had waited for him somewhere else. Um, she alluded to that she knew who made the phone call, but she didn't say who did or anything like that. Um, Did she talk about a cornfield that night? Yes. Um, she said something about um, leaving the car there, and if it had been at a different time of year, they wouldn't have noticed anything because the corn would have grown up and hit the car. Okay. Did she talk about going to Chad's grandmother's house that night? Yes. And tell the jury what she said about that. Um, they had went over there to hide out. Okay. Whose word is hideout? Is that your word or the defendant's word at the time? I don't think that's exact words, but that's what it was, why they went had, had went over there. Okay. Did she talk about Ashley at all that night? Um, to my recollection... Yes, there was some um, that she knew that Ashley was going to be at the um, where she dropped Chad off. Um, Did she talk she, about any? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I'm. Nope, you're fine. Um, did she talk about um, Ashley's grave? Anything about where Ashley? Objection. Objection. It's leading and leading, and this is. Okay. Do you have a question for her? Well, I, yes. The question was, did she make any statements about Ashley? Did she okay. make any statements she, about her? Okay. And did she make any statements about her grave, where she was buried? That was the question. Objection, please. Sustained. Okay. Um, at some point in time, were you contacted by uh, Detective Hitchings? No, I was never contacted by Detective Hitchings. Did you make a written statement? Yes, I did. Okay. I reached out to him, actually. You said, I'm sorry? I reached out to him. Oh, you he reached out, reach out to him. him. Okay. I'm pretty sure I reached out to him, yes. And why did you reach out to Detective Hitchings? Because I wanted to tell the truth. Okay. Uh, what, tell the truth about what? About what I knew. Okay. And do you, do you remember when you reached out to Detective Hitchings? What year? I don't need that. I think it was, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of the time. I think it was 2019, I think October of 2019. Okay. And what truth did you want to tell Detective Hitchings? I wanted to tell him what I knew, what she had told me before. Um, I do know 
that um, what I what I had told him was that um, speaking to the grave, um, she had said that she had defecated on Ashley's grave because of all the shit that she put her through. Was that um, something you wrote in your statement as yes. well? Oh. Yes, it is in my statement. Um, and the whole conversation with dinner, I wanted him to know about that, um, that she had stated that they had missed evidence on the computer. Uh, there was a laptop and um, some other stuff around the house. She didn't really specify what it was, but she said they missed evidence. Okay. And this was several years later. You said you wanted to tell the truth. Um, why did you wait several years later? Well, I didn't really trust the justice system after everything that happened with Grace. And, I mean, anything that I say would, you know, are you really going to build a case on that anyway? Okay, so you just took it upon yourself to not trust the justice system or give it a try at that time with that information you had? Exactly, yeah. Oh. Just kind of backed off. <clears throat> Did it Do you remember the defendant making any statements about um, gaining access to Ashley's email? Objection. Well, she, does she remember or not? I can refresh her memory. Let's, yes. Wait, wait. We're going to, let's have a sidebar. Another sidebar here uh, for this case that's already one of the most convoluted cases I've ever seen. Uh, part of it is the, the questioning by this prosecutor has just been really sort of haphazard, uh, kind of all over the place. Uh, this is a fairly interesting line of questioning. This is a, a family friend uh, who claims to have had Erica over for dinner while her husband was sitting in jail, recently arrested for this murder, and claims that uh, she had told her things during that dinner. First of all, that investigators had missed some evidence at their home. She uh, was sort of like, uh, as the uh, witness testified, she was sort of like they pulled a fast one over on the investigators when they were at their home uh, that they didn't check the laptop that would have had uh, information on there that, that uh, would have helped in their case. Uh, and then this really strange admission uh, that she went to authorities in 2019 because she wanted to tell them what she knew and the two facts that she knew were that investigators had missed that evidence and also the fact that according to this witness, Erica defecated on the grave of Ashley for all the blank she had put her through. If that gives you an insight as a juror member into the mindset of Erica. Erica making any statements about gaining access to Ashley's emails. Yes, I do. Um, I don't think it was at that dinner that we had in my basement, but I do remember her saying that she had gotten into her social media accounts and her emails hacked in. Was the purpose of bringing at, um, Erica over to the house to talk about that situation? No, that wasn't the main reason. We wanted to show our support, um, but I do know that, you know, um, Ben and I did have questions, but if she didn't want to talk about it, she didn't have to. Okay. And when was the alcohol consumed? Uh, before, after, during this conversation? I would say during. Okay, and that was that one drink? Yeah, one drink. My kids were still in the home. Okay. And why did you reference your kids still being in the home? Because I didn't make a point of drinking a lot oh. when my kids were young. I mean, they were babies. Okay. okay. And after the uh, dinner, did the defendant get back in her car and drive home? Yes. 
well, drive away, and you mm -hmm. were fine with her getting back in her car and driving away? Yeah. Okay. She didn't appear to be under the influence of that one drink? No. During your conversations, any of them with the defendant, did the defendant ever express her feelings towards Ashley? Objection. Did the defendant ever, my question is, tell you, the defendant's statements tell you how she felt about Ashley? Objection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna sustain that. Don't answer that, ma'am. May we have a sidebar? Sure. You can't, uh... <laughs> You can't ask a, a witness about how someone felt about someone else. Uh, you can ask <laughs> the defendant how she felt about Ashley, but you can't ask the defendant how Erica felt about Ashley unless exact statements. You can word this a different way. <clears throat> you could say, did Erica ever make statements in front of you about her opinion of Ashley? You can't just ask how she felt about, <coughs> excuse me, about Ashley. <coughs> uh, just yet another sidebar, another delay in this case that is already convoluted because it is a retrial, uh, a retrial because of a little bit of a technicality uh, that um, in the first trial, Chad Cobb, her ex-husband, testified from prison when the appellate judge said he should have been there in court. So here we are in another delay. Dan DeRoss with 19 News. As you can see, this sidebar continues. The prosecutor and the defense attorney is basically laughing at the prosecutor and the way she's asking questions uh, shows you his frustration level. Okay, attorney, so you can re-ask the question. Thank you. Uh -huh. Did the defendant ever tell you how she felt about Ashley? There you go. Yes. And what did she state? She had said before that she hated her. And that was... Any further questions? Okay, we'll hear from the defense if they want to cross. Hi, Ms. Brinkman. How are you? Okay, how are you? Pretty good. My name is Angie Kelly. I represent Erica. I'm going to try to go through some questions here with you a little bit less painstakingly. Um, I just want to make sure I am clear on a few time frames to start. You said that with, with regard to the children, were the children coming to your home before or after this dinner that we just heard about? After. After. Okay. So we were a little bit out of sequence there with the way that yeah. the questioning went. All right. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't have that mixed up. Okay. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit. 
And if I'm understanding correctly, your husband has been friends with Chad Cobb since he was in school, correct? Correct. They actually worked together at one point in time, correct? For a little while, yes, I think okay. so. And you and your husband are still friends with his parents, yes. correct? Correct. Okay. And you mentioned that you'd been to the prison a handful of times, correct? Correct. Um, but you haven't had a lot of communication lately. Is that fair? That is fair. You mentioned the term J-Pay. Is that the last time you've had communication with Chad Cobb? Yes. So you're aware that J-Pay isn't utilized by the prison system anymore? I am not aware okay. of that, no. That gives me a better time frame. Thank you. <clears throat> Over the years, although you haven't been in as much contact with Chad, um, you talked to Cindy about this situation at all? A few times here and there, but... A few times here not, and there? Yeah, there's a few times. We don't talk about it all the time. Um, didn't ask all the time. I asked if you talked about it with her. Yes, have. Okay. How recently? About this? Honestly, I'm not even sure. Last time I saw her um, and hung out with her was at Grace's graduation party, and we didn't really talk much. I honestly cannot answer that question completely. Okay. It's been more than once over the last 12 years. Is that fair? Oh, that's a fair. Okay. And when you gave, you said that you gave your statement to the detective in 2018. We're talking about five years later or 19? Did you say 18 or 19? 19. 19? Okay. And Erica was at your home for this dinner a couple weeks after Ashley was murdered, correct? Correct. So that would be 2012. And you said that after almost seven years that you just decided that you needed to speak to the detective. I knew that, um, yes, evidence had came up and yes, I felt. You knew that evidence had came up. What did you know came up? I knew that um, a recording was given to the detective. Mm. And how did you know that? Um, Cindy had told me. Okay, so Cindy Cobb told you that she was turning over a secret recording to the police. So you decided to join in on that? I felt comfortable with giving my statement at that point, yes. Okay, and if Cindy Cobb hadn't initiated that, would you have ever gone to Detective Hitchings to give a statement about this case? I honestly don't know. I'm curious about your use of um, a certain word. You mentioned that you became aware there was a custody battle, as the state put it, once Grace was taken. What do you mean by the word taken? Because when um, Chad had told Ben about the situation, that is what was said, that she was taken. Okay. And you're aware there was a court process involved, correct? Um, I'm aware afterwards, but before that, I'm really not. Okay, but much. sitting here today, you chose to use the word taken, ma'am. Is that correct? Correct. Do you feel she was taken inappropriately? Yes, I do. You do? Mm -hmm. You're aware that there was a court order for the child to be with her mother. Is that correct? Before that, I was not aware, no. Okay, but you said you still feel the same way today, that she was taken wrongfully from her father. Yeah, I mean, yes. Okay. You also mentioned that you don't have much faith in the justice system after what happened to Grace, correct? That is correct. Does your lack of faith in the justice system also have anything to do with Chad? No. Do you feel like his sentence is appropriate for what he did? Yes. 
Have you ever given statements in the past where you've indicated that you felt like he should be released from prison someday? Yes, I have said that. Okay. Do you still feel that way? I would like to see it, but if it doesn't happen, it is just. Okay. Now, going back to the dinner conversation that you were telling us about with Erica. Um, adults only in your basement, correct? Yes. And we're within a couple of weeks of Ashley's murder, correct? Yes. Okay. And she's discussing some of the potential facts and circumstances of what happened, correct? Correct. Okay. So Erica at this time is married to Chad Cobb, correct? I believe so, yes. All right. And she finds herself in a situation one day where her husband has been arrested, correct? Correct. Not just arrested, but for murder, correct? Correct. He's facing the death penalty. Correct. It's possible that she's going to lose all four of her children, correct? Correct. Okay. Explain, you said you're a mother, right? Mm -hmm. And you have seven children? Yes. And a husband. Mm -hmm. So if you woke up one morning to find that your husband was in jail, potentially never coming home, and you might lose all of your children, what would your state of mind be? Um, probably fear, probably panic. Okay. Do you think you'd be behaving the way that you did prior to that taking place? Maybe, yeah. You think sometimes when people are under an extremely stressful situation that they have the tendency to act a little different than normal? Possibly. Maybe they ramble a little bit about things that are irrelevant? I don't know about things that would be irrelevant. Do people but... ever try to maybe... Uh, I'm trying to think of the right word that I want to use. Find an explanation for what they're dealing with, for the, the actions of a loved one, a rationalization. Maybe that's how some people would deal with it. So, I mean, would it, can you sit here and tell me today, ma'am, what do you think is the proper way for somebody to behave under those circumstances? I think everybody's different, and I think that, um, the proper way to behave is being truthful and yourself. And maybe whatever you're feeling at the time? Maybe. The one thing specific that you did state in your statement and on direct examination is that... Um, Erica never told you that she made that phone call, correct? She never admitted that she made the phone call. She did not say that she made that phone call? No. from the state. Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh, bless you. One minute. Take your time. You were asked on cross-examination that Erica did not admit she made that phone call. Is that a fair statement? She did not make the statement that she herself made it, no. Okay. Um, did she allude to who made it? Objection. She said she alluded to it. 
on back. Well, hold on, stop, stop. don't answer. There's been an objection. Right. Um, I don't know the basis. I can't answer. Basis. Asking for. She's asking for information of whether an illusion was made. No. I think the question. She you, testified on direct that she alluded to it, and I just wanted her to clarify what alluded to it meant. Not an illusion. You can clarify. That's allowed. Okay. What well, what did the defendant state around that <clears throat> portion of the conversation regarding the phone call? <clears throat> she had um <clears throat> She would not admit to actually making the phone call, but she acted like she knew who did it. And but she wouldn't tell us really any details because she didn't want to kind of drag us into things. That was how she had said it. So she knew about the phone call. Yes. OK. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Okay. Anything else for this witness from either side? No? No, Your Honor. Okay. Ms. Brinkman, thank you very much for your time. You may step down. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Christy, I have the form for court exhibit. Thank you. Those are the witnesses that did not want to be filmed. Um, at this time, is there anything from either side before I adjourn for the evening? Not from the defense, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. Okay. Um, so at this time, um, as part of our nightly routine, I will admonish you. First of all, thank you very much for your attention and, um, you know, just for being a fabulous jury, being here every day. You're truly the heart of the justice system, and we appreciate your time so much. Um, lunch is on your own tomorrow, but it's Friday, so we do donuts on Friday, so we will have donuts and coffee. Um, we are going to have a little bit later start tomorrow morning. We're going to start at 9 a.m. Okay, have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much. All right. Dan DeRose with 19 News. As you hear, a little bit of a later start uh, for court tomorrow by a half an hour. And of course, uh, according to the judge, it's donut day on Fridays uh, in the middle of a murder trial. Uh, a very interesting last witness here, this Mary Brinkman. I think you got the uh, clear indication from uh, the defense attorney you see standing there with Erica uh, that this woman was a pretty big busybody and that she wanted to insert herself uh, that here is a woman whose husband has been in jail for two weeks for murder and you invite her over to have dinner. But first you go out and you get some drinks to have after dinner. Um, the testimony was interesting in that uh, the statement that uh, she claims Erica said and alluded to that she knew who made the call to the pizza place. Uh, I don't think we needed this witness to tell us that. I think we had Erica tell us herself in the recording uh, with Chad's mother. Uh, and then uh, this other notion that just paints Erica in yet another bad light as if abusing a child, making her eat dog feces isn't bad enough. Uh, we find out that apparently, according to this witness, Erica told her she went and defecated on Ashley's grave because of the blank she had put her through. Um, just sort of an interesting yet another paintbrush that does not look good at all for this woman, but we've had several of those paintbrushes uh, at this point. Um, and then this admission that she told apparently this Mary Brinkman that uh, she was almost um, as if they had pulled a prank that investigators missed some evidence on their laptop that when their uh, property was searched, uh, that they would have been able to find something on uh, that laptop. There go the handcuffs back on to Erica Stefanko. Yes, she is still in police custody. Uh, looks like that's actually a jacket that they're using to cover up. Uh, this is just in case there was maybe a juror that was not in the right place. Uh, if a juror member were to see Erica with handcuffs on, uh, that would uh, impose a, um, 
a bit of a negative attitude that uh, would you would imply that Erica is guilty and therefore could be seen as a problem. So uh, wraps up a rather interesting day of uh, of this trial day four of this murder trial uh, of the retrial and again a little bit later tomorrow at nine o'clock until then i'm dan DeRose with 19 news now have a good afternoon 19 news is everywhere download our ctv apps and follow us on social media at cleveland 19 news